One. Commander Wedge Antilles would have preferred the ceremony to be private. Rogue Squadron had come to mourn the passing of one of its own on the week anniversary of his death. Wedge wanted the gathering to be small and intimate, with Cornhorn's friends all being able to share remembrances of him, but that was not possible. Corn's death had come during the liberation of Coruscant. That made him a hero from a company of heroes, and while a small memorial might have been what Corn himself would have wanted, it was not heroic enough for a figure of his posthumous stature. Even though Wedge had known things would not go quite the way he wanted, he had not anticipated how out of control they would get when he requested permission to hold the ceremony. He had expected a number of dignitaries would come to the pseudo-granite barrow that marked where Korn had died when a building collapsed on top of him. He even anticipated people lining the balconies and walkways of nearby towers. At the very worst, he imagined people might gawk from the beds of hover trucks. His imagination paled beside that exercised by the bureaucrats who organized the memorial service. They took a ceremony based on heartfelt grief and made it into the focal point of mourning for the entire New Republic. Corin Horn was a hero. This, they proclaimed loudly, but he was also a victim. As such, he represented all the victims of the Empire. It didn't matter to them that Corn would have rejected being labeled a victim. He had been transformed into a symbol, a symbol the New Republic needed badly. Rogue Squadron likewise underwent iconization. The unit's pilots had always worn orange flight suits in the past, or, as supplies became harder and harder to find, whatever had been handy. Corn's flight suit had been green, black, and gray, since he'd brought it with him from the Corellian security force. In homage to him, that color scheme was used to create new uniforms for the squadron. Evergreen overall, with dark green flank panels, black sleeves, leg stripes, and trim. On the left sleeve and breast rode the rogue squadron crest. It had also appeared on the evergreen hawk-billed caps, designed by a Kuwati, but Wedge had vetoed their addition to the uniform. The makeup of the squadron had also been adjusted. Asir Salar, a Bothan pilot, and Eniri Forge, the sister of a dead squadron member, had both been added to the squadron. Wedge would have gladly welcomed them, and they had been crucial to the success of the mission to liberate Coruscant but they had been pressed upon him for political reasons. Likewise, Portha, a Trandoshan, had been made a member of the squadron despite his inability to fly. He was attached to the unit as part of a previously non-existent security detail. Each of them was appointed by bureaucrats as a reward to various constituencies in the New Republic, and Wedge hated their objectification. The ceremony grew out of all proportion until special grandstands had to be grafted to the nearby buildings and color-coded for the various levels of access people were to be accorded. Holocams had been stationed at various positions so the ceremony could be recorded and replayed on countless worlds. Despite the very real fears about contracting the highly contagious Krytos virus, the stands were packed to overflowing. He looked up from his position on the reviewing stand and out at Rogue Squadron. His people were bearing up well, despite the bright sunlight and unseasonably warm weather. The recent rains had raised the general level of humidity until clothing clung, and the very air lay like a smothering blanket over everyone. The thick air seemed to deaden sounds and suppress emotions, and Wedge was tempted to allow himself to imagine that Coruscant somehow also mourned Corin's passing. In addition to the members of Rogue Squadron, 
Corin's other friends stood on the platform nearest the barrow. Ayella was Siri, a slender, brown-haired woman who had been Corin's Corsac partner, stood next to Mirax Tarek. Despite being the daughter of a notorious Corellian smuggler, Mirax had managed to become friends with Corin. Mirax, who had known Wedge since they had both been kids, had tearfully confided in him that she and Corn had planned to celebrate the liberation of Coruscant together. He could see she'd fallen hard for Corin, and the lifeless expression on her face made his heart ache. The only one who is missing is Tycho. Wedge frowned. Captain Tycho Selchu was a long-standing member of Rogue Squadron, who had served as the squadron's executive officer. He'd surreptitiously joined the mission to Coruscant at Wedge's request, and had been instrumental in bringing the planet's defenses down. His action was the latest in a string of heroic missions Tycho had carried off during his rebel career. Unfortunately, Alliance Intelligence had developed evidence that indicated Tycho was working for the Empire. They blamed him directly, not only for Korn's death, but for the death of Bror Jace, another rogue squadron pilot who had died early on in the Coruscant campaign. Wedge had not been fully apprised of what the evidence was that they had against Tycho, but he did not doubt the man's innocence for a second. Still, his innocence might mean nothing in the long run. In spite of the liberation, Coruscant was not a pleasant or stable world. A hideous epidemic, the Krytos virus, was ravaging the non-human population of the planet. It had struck at the non-humans in the rebellion and was hard enough on some species that even coming down to the planet was an act of extreme bravery. Bacta, as usual, could cure the virus, but the Rebellion's entire store of Bacta was insufficient to cure everyone. This resulted in panic and resentment against humans for their apparent immunity to the disease. The memorial service had become an important event because Coruscant's population needed something to unite them and to get their minds off their suffering, even if only for a moment. The fact that Rogue Squadron had humans and non-humans working together in it showed the strength of unity that had allowed the rebellion to prevail. Non-humans coming together along with dignitaries from various other worlds to mourn a dead human acknowledged the debt the rebels owed humans. Speakers devoted themselves to exhorting their fellows to labor together in building a future that would justify the sacrifices made by Corin and others. Their words raised things to a philosophical or metaphysical level, meant to soothe away the anxieties and worries of the citizens. Those were noble messages, to be certain, but Wedge felt they were not the right messages for Corin. He tugged on the sleeves of his uniform jacket as a Bothan Protocol subaltern waved him forward. Wedge stepped up to the podium and wanted to lean heavily upon it. Years of fighting and saying goodbye to friends and comrades weighed him down, but he refused to give in to fatigue. He let his pride in the squadron and his friendship with Corin keep him upright. He looked around at the crowd, then focused on the mound of pseudo-granite rubble before him. Corin Horn does not rest easy in that grave. Wedge paused for a moment, and then another, letting the silence remind everyone of the true purpose of the ceremony. Corin Horn was never at ease, except when he was fighting. He does not rest easy now, because there is much fighting yet to be done. We have taken Coruscant, but anyone who assumes that means the Empire is dead 
is as mistaken as Grand Moff Tarkin was in his belief that Alderaan's destruction would somehow cripple the rebellion. Wedge brought his head up. Corrin Horn was not a man who gave up, no matter what the odds. More than once, he took upon himself the responsibility of dealing with the threat to the squadron and to the rebellion. Heedless of his own safety, he engaged overwhelming forces, and by sheer dint of will and spirit and courage, he won through. Even here on Coruscant, he flew alone into the heart of a storm that was ravaging a planet and risked his life, so this world would be free. He did not fail, because he would not let himself fail. Each of us who knew him has, in our hearts, dozens and dozens of examples of his bravery or his concern for others, or his ability to see where he was wrong and correct himself. He was not a perfect man, but he was a man who sought to be the best he could be. And while he took pride in being very good, he didn't waste energy in displays of rampant egotism. He just picked out new goals and drove himself forward toward them. Wedge slowly nodded toward the rubble pile. Corn is now gone. The burdens he bore have been laid down. The responsibilities he shouldered have been abandoned. The example he set is no more. His loss is tragic. But the greater tragedy would be letting him be remembered as a faceless hero moldering in this cairn. He was a fighter, as all of us should be. The things he took upon himself might be enough to crush down any one person, but we all can accept a portion of that responsibility and bear it together. Others have talked about building a future that would honor Corrin and the others who have died fighting the Empire, but the fact is that there's fighting yet to be done before the building can begin. We have to fight the impatience with the pace of change that makes us look nostalgically on the days of the Empire. Yes, there might have been a bit more food available. Yes, the power outages might have been fewer. Yes, you might have been insulated from the misery of others. But at what cost? The security you thought you had froze into an icy lump of fear in your gut whenever you saw stormtroopers walking in your direction. With the liberation of Coruscant, that fear can melt. But if you forget it once existed and decide things were not so bad under the Emperor, you'll be well on your way to inviting it back. He opened his hands to take in all those assembled at the monument. You must do what Corrin did. Fight anything and everything that would give the Empire comfort or security or a chance to reassert itself. If you trade vigilance for complacency, freedom for security, a future without fear for comfort, you will be responsible for shaping the galaxy once again into a place that demands people like Corrin fight, always fight, and eventually fall victim to evil. The choice, ultimately, devolves to you. Corrin Horn will not rest easy in his grave until there is no more fighting to be done. He has done everything he could to fight the Empire. Now it is up to you to continue his fight. If he is ever to know peace, it will only be when we all know peace. And that is a goal every one of us knows is well worth fighting for. Wedge stepped back from the podium and steeled himself against the polite applause. 
Deep down, he would have hoped his words had been inspiring. But those gathered around the memorial were dignitaries and officials from worlds throughout the New Republic. They were politicians whose goal was to help shape the future others of their number spoke about. They wanted stability and order as a foundation for their constructions. His words, reminding everyone that fights were yet to be waged, undercut their efforts. They had to applaud because of the situation and who he was. But Wedge had no doubt most of them thought him a politically naive warrior, best suited to being a hero who was feted and used in holograph opportunities to support this program or that. He could only hope that others listening to what he had to say would take his message to heart. The politicians required stability, and the way they acquired stability was to ignore instability or patch it over with some quick fix. The citizens of the New Republic would find their politicians as distant as the imperial politicians before them. With their new one freedom, the people would be able to let their leaders know what they thought, and might be tempted to protest if things did not move swiftly enough in the direction the people wanted. A rebellion against the rebellion would result in anarchy or a return of the empire. Either would be a disaster. Fighting for progress and against reactionary forces was the only way to guarantee the new republic would get a chance to flourish. Wedge dearly wanted that to happen and hoped the politicians would look past their efforts to gather power to themselves long enough to take steps to provide real stability and a real future. Over at the gravesite, an honor guard raised the squadron flag, then backed away and saluted. That signaled an end to the ceremony, and the visitors began to drift away. A cream-furred bothan with violet eyes crossed to where Wedge stood and nodded almost graciously. You were quite eloquent, Commander Antilles. Borsk Thalia waved a hand toward the departing masses. I have no doubt quite a few hearts were stirred by your words. Wedge raised an eyebrow. But not yours, Counselor Thalia? The bothan snorted a clipped laugh. If I were so easily swayed, I could be convinced to back all sorts of nonsense. Like the trial of Tycho Selchu? Thalia's fur rippled and rose at the back of his neck. No, I might be convinced that such a trial was not necessary. He smoothed the fur back down with his right hand. Admiral Akbar has not convinced you to abandon your petition to the Provisional Council about this matter? No. Wedge folded his arms across his chest. I would have thought by now... You would have engineered a vote to deny me the chance to address the council. Summarily dismiss a petition by the man who liberated Coruscant? The Bothan's violet eyes narrowed. You're moving into a realm of warfare at which I am a master, Commander. I would have thought you were wise enough to see that. Your petition will fail. It must fail, so it shall. Captain Selchu will be tried for murder and treason, even though he is innocent. Is he? He is. A fact to be determined by a military court, surely. Thalia gave Wedge a cold smile. A suggestion, Commander. Yes? Don't waste your eloquence on the Provisional Council. Save it. Hoard it. The Bothan's teeth flashed in a feral grin. Use it on the tribunal that tries Captain Selchu. You'll not gain his freedom, of course. No one is that eloquent. But perhaps you will win him some modicum of mercy when it comes time for sentence to be passed. 2. High up in the tower suite, 
up above the surface of Imperial Center. Curtin Lure allowed himself a smile. At the tower's pinnacle, the only companions were hawk bats, safe in their shadowed roosts, and special intelligence operatives who were menacing despite their lack of stormtrooper armor or bulk. He felt alone and aloof. But those sensations came naturally with his sense of superiority. At the top of the world, he had been given all he could see to command and dominate. And destroy. Isan Isard had given him the job of creating and leading a Palpatine counterinsurgency front. He knew she did not expect grand success from him. He had been given ample resources to make himself a nuisance. He could disrupt the functioning of the New Republic. He could slow their takeover of Coruscant and hamper their ability to master the mechanisms of galactic administration. A bother, minor but vexatious, is what Isan Isard had intended he become. Curtin Lure knew he had to become more. Years before, when he started working as an Imperial Liaison Officer with the Corellian Security Force on Corellia, he never would have dreamed of finding himself rising so far and playing so deadly a game. Even so, he had always been ambitious and supremely confident in himself and his abilities. His chief asset was his memory, which allowed him to recall a plethora of facts, no matter how obscure. Once he had seen or read or heard something, he could draw it from his memory and this ability gave him a gross advantage over the criminals and bureaucrats with whom he dealt. His reliance on his memory had also hobbled him. His prodigious feats of recall so overawed his enemies that they would naturally assume he had processed the information he possessed and had drawn the logical conclusions from it. Since they assumed he already knew what only they knew, they would tell him what he had not bothered to figure out for himself. They made it unnecessary for him to truly think, and that skill had begun to atrophy in him. Isan Isard, when she summoned him to Imperial Center, had made it abundantly clear that learning to think and not to assume was the key to his continued existence. Her supervision made up in severity what it lacked in duration, putting him through a grueling regimen that rehabilitated his cognitive abilities. By the time she fled Imperial Center, Isard had clearly been confident in his ability to annoy and confound the rebels. More importantly, Curtin Lure had become certain that he could do all she wanted, and yet more. From his vantage point, he looked down on the distant blob of dignitaries and mourners gathered at the memorial for Corin Horn. While he despised them all for their politics, he joined them in mourning Horn's loss. Corin Horn had been Lure's nemesis. They had hated each other on Corellia, and Lure had spent a year and a half trying to hunt Corin down after he fled from Corellia. The hunt had ended when Isan Isard brought Lure to Imperial Center, but he had anticipated a renewal of his private little war with Horn when given the assignment to remain on Coruscant. Of course, Corrin's demise hardly made a dent in the legion of enemies Lure had on Imperial Center. Foremost among them was General Aaron Kraken, the Director of Alliance Intelligence. Kraken's network of spies and operatives had ultimately made the conquest of the Imperial capital possible, and his security precautions had given Imperial counterintelligence agents fits for years. Kraken, or 
Kraken, as some of Lure's people had taken to calling the rebel, would be a difficult foe with whom to grapple. Lure knew he had some other enemies who would pursue him as part of a personal vendetta. The whole of Rogue Squadron, from Antilles to the new recruits, would gladly hunt him down and kill him, including the spy in their midst. Since Lure presented a security risk for the spy, even if they could not connect him with Corrin's death directly, the mere fact that Corrin hated him would be a burden they'd gladly accept and a debt they would attempt to discharge. Ayala Wasiri was the last of the Corsac personnel Lure had hunted, and her presence on Imperial Center gave him pause. She had never been as relentless as Corrin Horn in her pursuit of criminals, but that had always seemed to Lure to be because she was more thorough than Horn. Whereas Corrin might muscle his way through an investigation, Ayala picked up on the small clues and accomplished with Elan what Corrin did with brute strength. In the shadow game in which Lure was engaged, this meant she was a foe he might not see coming, and that made her the most dangerous of all. Lure backed away from the window and looked at the holographic representation of the figures below as they strode across his holo table. The ceremony had been broadcast planet-wide and would be rebroadcast at various worlds throughout the galaxy. He watched Borsk Failure and Wedge Antilles as they met in close conversation, then split apart and wandered away. Everyone appeared more like toys to him than they did real people. He found it easy to imagine himself a titanic, no, imperial presence who had deigned to be distracted by the actions of bugs. He picked up the remote device from the table and flicked it on. A couple of small lights flashed on the black rectangle in his left palm, then a red button in the center of it glowed almost benignly. His thumb hovered over it for a second. He smiled, but killed the impulse to stab his thumb down and gently returned the device to the table. A year before, he would have punched that button, detonating the explosives his people had secreted around the memorial. With one casual caress, he could have unleashed fire and pain, wiping out a cadre of traitorous planetary officials and eliminating Rogue Squadron. He knew, given a chance, any of the SI operatives under his command would have triggered the Nergon 14 charges, as would the majority of the military command staff still serving the Empire. Lure did not. Isard had pointed out on numerous occasions that before the Empire could be reestablished, the rebellion had to die. She had pointed out that the Emperor's obsession with destroying the Jedi Knights had caused him to regard the rest of the rebellion as a lesser threat, yet it had outlived the Jedi and the Emperor. Only by destroying the rebellion would it be possible to reassert the Empire's authority over the galaxy. Destroying the rebellion required methods more subtle than exploding grandstands and planets, accomplishing with a vibroblade what could not be done with a Death Star. Rogue Squadron could not be allowed to die because they were required for the public spectacle of Tycho Selchu's trial. General Kraken had uncovered ample evidence that pointed toward Selchu's guilt, and Lure had delighted in clearing the way for Kraken's investigators to find yet more of it. The evidence would be condemning, yet so obviously questionable that the members of Rogue Squadron, all of whom had indicated a belief in Tycho's innocence at one level or another, would decry it as false. 
they would increase the tension between the conquerors of Imperial Center and the politicians who slunk in after the pilots had risked their lives to secure the world. If the heroes of the rebellion could doubt and resent the government of the new republic, how would the citizenry build confidence in their leaders? The Krytos virus further complicated things. Created by an imperial scientist under Lure's supervision, it killed non-humans in a most hideous manner. Roughly three weeks after infection, the victims entered the final, lethal stage of the disease. Over the course of a week, the virus multiplied very rapidly, exploding cell after cell in their bodies. Their flesh weakened, sagged, and split open, while the victims bled from every pore and orifice. The resulting liquid was highly infectious, and though Bacta could hold the disease at bay or, in sufficient quantities, cure it, the rebellion did not have access to enough Bacta to treat all the cases on Coruscant. The price of Bacta had shot up and supplies dwindled. People hoarded Bacta, and rumors about the disease having spread to the human population caused waves of panic. Already a number of worlds had ordered ships from Imperial Center quarantined so the disease would not spread, further disrupting the New Republic's weak economy and eroding its authority. It did no good for human bureaucrats to try to explain the precautions they had taken for dealing with the disease since they were immune, and that immunity built up resentment between the human and non-human populations within the New Republic. Lure allowed himself a small laugh. He had taken the precaution of putting away a supply of Bacta which he was selling off in small lots. As a result of this action, anxious rebels were supplying the financing for an organization bent on the destruction of the New Republic. The irony of it all was sufficient to dull the omnipresent fear of discovery and capture. There was no question in his mind that to be captured was to be killed, yet he did not let that prospect daunt him. Being able to turn the rebels' tactics back on them struck him as justice. He would be returning to them the fear and frustration Imperials everywhere had known during the rebellion. He would strike from hiding, hitting at targets chosen randomly. His vengeance would be loosely focused, because that meant no one could feel safe from his touch. He knew his efforts would be denounced as crude terrorism, but he intended there to be nothing crude about his efforts. Today he would destroy the grandstands around the memorial. They would be nearly empty, and all those who had left the stands would breathe a sigh of relief that they had not been blown up minutes or hours earlier. But everyone would have to consider congregating in a public place to be dangerous in the future. And if he hit a back to treatment and distribution center tomorrow, people would also have to weigh obtaining protection from the virus against the possibility of being blown to bits. By choosing targets of minimal military value, he could stir up the populace to demand the military do something. If the public's ire focused on one official or another, he could target that person, giving the public some power. He would let their displeasure choose his victims, just as his choices would give direction to their fear. Theirs would be a virulent and symbiotic relationship. He would be nightmare and benefactor. They would be victims and supporters. He would become a faceless evil they sought to direct while fearing any attention they drew to themselves. Having once been on the side attempting to stop an anti-government force, he could well appreciate the difficulties the New Republic would have in dealing with him. 
The fact that the rebellion had never resorted to outright terrorism did not concern him. Their goal had been to build a new government. His was merely to destroy what they had created. He wanted things to degenerate into an anarchy that would prompt an outcry for leadership and authority. When that call went out, his mission would be accomplished and the empire would return. He again took up the remote control and returned to the window. Down at the memorial, he could see small pinpricks of color that marked passers-by on their way to and from other places. He glanced at the holograms striding across his holo table and saw that none of the people were of consequence. He followed the course of one woman, allowing her to clear the blast radius, then pressed the button. A staccato series of explosions went off sequentially around the memorial. To the south, the grandstands teetered forward and started to somersault their way into the depths of Imperial Center. A half dozen people who had been seated on them fell like colorful confetti. One actually grabbed the edge of the platform next to the barrow and hauled himself up to safety, but a subsequent blast tossed him back into the pit from which he had narrowly escaped. Other explosions twisted metal and shattered transparisteel windows in the surrounding buildings. Grandstands clung to the sides of buildings like mutilated metal insects with bleeding, moaning people clutched in their limbs. Dust and smoke cleared to show the central ferrocrete ring around the memorial had been nibbled away, with a huge chunk of it dangling perilously by a reinforcement bar or two. Lur finally felt the blast's shockwave send a tremor through his tower. The hawk bats flapped black wings to steady themselves, then dropped away from their perches. Wings snapped open, sending the creatures soaring into a slow spiral that would take them down to the blast site. Lur knew enough of them to know the hawk bats would first look to see if the holes in the buildings revealed previously hidden granite slugs. But when deprived of their favorite prey, they would settle for the gobbets of flesh left behind by the victims. Good hunting, he wished them. Eat your fill. Before I am done, there will be more, much more for you to consume. I shall let you feast on my enemies, and together, here on a world they call their own, we shall both thrive. 3. It seemed to Wedge that the mood of the Provisional Council was as dark as the room in which they met, and as sour as the scent of Bacta in the air. The dimly lit chamber had once been part of the senatorial apartments Mon Mothma had called home before the rebellion and her role in it forced her to go underground. It had been redecorated in garish reds and purples by Imperial agents, with green and gold trim on everything. But the paucity of light quelled the riot of color. A desire to hide signs of Imperial occupation of the apartments was not the reason for keeping the room dim. Sian Tev, the Sulistan member of the Provisional Council, had been exposed to the Krytos virus. While there was no evidence he had contracted the disease, he had undergone preventative Bacta therapy and had some residual sensitivity to bright light. The Council made a concession to him by lowering the light, and another to the non-human members of the Council by circulating a light Bacta mist through the air to prevent possible contagion. This increased humidity seemed to please no one, say perhaps Admiral Akbar, but he looked grim for his own reasons. Primarily because I'm actually here. Wedge knew his petition was doomed to fail. Borsk Failia had said as much at the memorial ceremony, and various other counselors had repeated the warning in the two days since then including Admiral Akbar and Princess Leia Organa. In fact, Wedge knew 
The only reason he was being given a chance to address the council was because of his status as liberator of Coruscant. The council had arranged three long tables in a half-hexagonal formation, with Mon Mothma in the middle, flanked by Princess Leia and Corellia's Doman Barris. Akbar and Felia anchored the far ends of the two angled tables. This left Wedge to stand in the open area before the council, as if he were on trial. This is exactly what Tycho will face if I do not succeed here today. Therefore, I must succeed. Mon Mothma inclined her head toward him. I need not introduce to you a man who has appeared before this council previously, and who has been so instrumental in the New Republic's success. Because Commander Antilles may end up discussing highly sensitive material, this will be an executive session of the Provisional Council. Everything said here is confidential, and reporting of it will result in possible criminal charges. Doman Barris smiled. Ah, to have cases before we have a judiciary. Now that is civilization. Even Mon Mothma smiled at the remark then set her face again into a mask of solemnity. Please, Commander, speak your mind. Wedge took a deep breath, then began. I have come here today to ask you to prevent a gross injustice from being enacted. Captain Tycho Selchu has been arrested and will be tried on murder and treason charges. The evidence against him, what little of it I know about, is circumstantial and weaker than the defenses Isan Isard left behind here. Tycho is a hero of the rebellion. If not for his efforts, we would not be here right now, and I would be dead. The man he's accused of killing is someone whose life Tycho saved on numerous occasions. Corrin would have long since been dead if Tycho wanted him dead. Tycho is innocent. And to put him through this trial after all he has endured would be cruelty on a truly imperial scale. Mon Mothma nodded slowly. I appreciate your frankness, Commander, and have no doubt you believe everything you've told us. Before we can make any sort of decision, it would be useful for us to have a better grasp of the facts surrounding the situation. She pointed to a green-eyed man, whose hair had shifted from its original red to mostly white. If you would, General Kraken, please bring the Council up to date with what you have learned concerning Captain Selchu. Kraken walked over to stand next to Wedge. I hope Commander Antilles will forgive my contradicting him on a couple of points. Some of this information has been developed recently, and because the circumstances surrounding the investigation are tricky, I have not had a chance to brief him on them. Wedge dropped his voice to a whisper. Nice ambush. That's the last thing I want to do, Commander. Kraken cleared his throat. Tycho Selchu is a native of Alderaan, who graduated from the Imperial Naval Academy and was made a TIE fighter pilot. Subsequent to the destruction of his homeworld, which he had the misfortune of witnessing via Holonet communications with his family, he defected from Imperial service and joined the Rebellion. He joined us just after the evacuation of Yavin 4, served with distinction at Hoth, and accompanied Commander Antilles on the assault on the Death Star at Endor. He is one of a handful of pilots who entered and escaped the Death Star. Slightly less than two years ago, Selchu volunteered for a covert scouting mission to Coruscant. On the way back out, he was captured and sent to Isan Isard's Lusankia facility. Little is known about this prison, except that people who have come from it have routinely been brainwashed into becoming Imperial agents who commit acts of murder and mayhem when bidden to do so by Isard. Tycho is unique among those who have been to Lusankia in that he retains some memories of having been there. Prior to his appearance, former inmates revealed their connection to this place only after they had been activated, 
done their damage, and were captured by our forces. Wedge shook his head. I'm sure General Kraken will not mind my pointing out that Tycho did not escape from Lusankia. Isar transferred him to the penal colony at Akratar, and he escaped from there to return to us. Thank you, Commander. I was just getting to that. Kraken's expression betrayed neither amusement nor irritation, which somehow made Wedge think things were not going to go well for Tycho. Upon his return, Captain Selchu was debriefed, and his debriefing, in fact, indicated he recalled almost nothing of his time at Lusankia. We could find no indication he had been brainwashed by Isard. However, we had never detected brainwashing in any of her other little bioweapons. We were left in the unenviable position of having to assume the worst about Captain Selchu. Commander Antilles, believing then, as he does now, in his friend's innocence, struck a bargain with his superiors to get Selchu assigned as his executive officer. Security was maintained, for the most part, and the incidents where it was not betrayed no imperial leanings on the part of Captain Selchu. Kraken frowned. Unfortunately, we have developed evidence that suggests Selchu has betrayed Rogue Squadron and the New Republic. In the case of Corrin Horn, Tycho Selchu had access to the command code for the headhunter Horn was flying at the time of his death, and Selchu had gone over the fighter without supervision just prior to Horn's flight. Horn confronted Selchu before they headed out. Horn threatened to uncover his treason, so Selchu had him killed. He waited until after the shields had been brought down, but we have pretty well determined Isard wanted us to take the planet and inherit the virus, so killing Horn after her goal was accomplished only makes sense. The Horn case is not the only death to which we can link Captain Selchu. Wedge's jaw dropped in surprise. What? You can't mean Broar Jace. Indeed I do. Nonsense. The Empire killed him. Kraken nodded. Agreed. But the way they got him was unusual. Previously we believed he happened to have been trapped by an interdictor cruiser out looking for smugglers. However, we have been forced to amend that view following the defection of the Imperial Interdictor Cruiser, Black Asp. Captain Ilor indicated in her debriefing that the Black Asp was directed to go to specific coordinates to intercept Broar Jace as he headed back to Thyfera. He was a bit late in arriving, but showed up exactly where he was expected to. They tried to capture him, but his ship exploded during the fight. The arrangements for Jace's journey home, including the plotting of his course, were made by Captain Tycho Selchu. By my order? Yes, Commander. By your order. Which does not mean Isard could not have warped Selchu enough to make him betray your people. But again, that's circumstantial. We have more. The Alliance Intelligence Chief shrugged. Horn told you, Commander, that he'd seen Selchu here on Coruscant talking with a known Imperial operative, Curtin Lure. Horn had worked with Lure for years on Corellia, so the chance of a mistake in his identification are minimal. In backtracking Selchu's time here on Coruscant, granting that you ordered him to come here, Commander, we have periods of time for which we cannot account. Moreover, we have uncovered a number of banking accounts in which large numbers of credits have been accumulated. These accounts add up to approximately 15 million credits, which means Selchu was being paid by the Empire. What? Wedge couldn't believe what he was hearing. There was no way, just no way, Tycho was an agent in the pay of the Empire. If he was one of Isard's sleeper agents, why would she be paying him? Commander, for years I've been trying to fathom her mind, and I have been unable to do so. If I had to guess, however, I would say that creating those accounts 
was a precaution to let us uncover Tycho at some point, or, as it stands now, a means to guarantee he will be tried for his crimes. But she has no interest in seeing justice done, which underscores how ludicrous all these charges against Tycho are. Wedge brought his head up. If Isard wants a trial, you know conducting it will be to her benefit, which is yet one more reason not to go ahead with it. Borsk Failure tapped a talon against the tabletop. Or is she providing more evidence than we need to convict, so we will be convinced Selchu is being framed? If we are convinced he is innocent, we could exonerate him, raise him into a position of trust, and find ourselves again fodder for her schemes. Wedge winced. He hated Failure's wheels-within-wheels reasoning because it came down to a core problem with Tycho's case. Either he was innocent and being made to look guilty, or he was guilty and being made to look innocent through a clumsy frame. The evidence served both explanations well, and sorting good data from bad was a task that could easily defy completion. Everyone could agree something was not right in the whole situation, but assigning blame and assessing truth was not going to be easy. And no matter what happened, Tycho would end up being stigmatized, reviled, and ostracized. He would be destroyed by it all, and that was something he did not deserve. For Wedge, it was simple to separate fact from fiction, but he knew that was because he was starting from a deep belief in Tycho's innocence. Wedge didn't have a Jedi's insight through the Force. He just knew Tycho. They'd fought side by side through some of the most harrowing battles the galaxy had ever seen. They'd shared hardships that others could not have even imagined. And they shared good times that others could only envy. Wedge knew Tycho could no more betray the rebellion than he himself could. But looking around at the council, he realized that even his conduct might not be seen as above reproach. I still do not believe the evidence General Kraken's people have gathered is anything more than circumstantial. Wedge studied the members of the council. For any trial to go forward, especially as quickly as this trial is being pushed, is reckless and negligent. I know we all want swift justice if Tycho is guilty, but trying him on these charges right now can only hurt him and, ultimately, the New Republic. Doman Barris, her light eyes glinting coldly in the dimness, opened her hands. Your opinion, Commander Antilles, is respected, but not universally held. The evidence is sufficient in any jurisdiction of the galaxy to call for a trial. Wedge's eyes narrowed as he sensed a transparasteel barrier descending between his argument and the Council's willingness to act. He knew he had to do something to get them to open their eyes, so he decided to take a chance. This evidence may demand a trial, but at least delay it until there is time to scrape things down another layer or two and find out what's really going on. I think it is the minimum courtesy you owe someone like Tycho Selchu, and that's an opinion I do not need to keep private. Borsk Failure's head came up, and his fur rippled like a storm-racked ocean. Are you threatening to use your status as hero to oppose us? Akbar answered for Wedge. He was doing nothing of the kind, because Captain Selchu is facing a court-martial. The trial and everything surrounding it is a military matter, and Commander Antilles knows unauthorized discussions of same violate regulations and oaths he took when he became an officer. Begging the Admiral's pardon, Wedge growled, I was threatening to go public with my feelings about the trial. I still am. And if expressing my opinion about an injustice is not allowed in the Alliance military, I can always resign my commission. That bombshell certainly had an effect, but not entirely the one he expected. 
while Akbar looked disappointed, Borsk Thalia smiled victoriously. The other counselors reacted with horror or a grim acknowledgement of his bold stroke. If they had thought his speaking out against Tycho's treatment would attract attention, his resignation because of it would undoubtedly be an action with a much higher profile. Leia leaned forward. Chief Counselor, I suggest we recess for an hour. I would like a chance to speak with Commander Antilles, if I might. Please. Mon Mothma stood and gave Wedge a look that combined pride with frustration, anger with sympathy. Wedge felt not exactly pitied, but as if there was more going on than he had access to. He knew that was true, of course. He was just the leader of a fighter squadron, and these were the leaders of a new nation. But he hated to think their perspective could somehow justify what they were going to do to Tycho. General Kraken left the room last and closed the doors behind himself, leaving Wedge alone with Princess Leia. In all the time he'd known her, she'd never looked so saddened. If you want to convince me to save my career, I appreciate the effort, but I'll stand by what I said just now. You can't talk me out of it. She remained seated and slowly shook her head. I know that, so I'm not going to try. It's important to me that you know I think Tycho is innocent, too. I've known Winter for as long as I can remember, and she's terribly fond of Tycho. If she can remember nothing that's the least bit ambiguous about him, then I can't imagine there's anything sinister to uncover. You and I both know that the trial will be rough on Tycho, and unfair. Then help me convince them to stop it or delay it. I would if I could, but I can't. A deep frown creased her brow as she plucked at the fabric of her pale green gown. The reason I asked for the recess is so I can tell you what's going to happen after someone here decides that we have been suitably courteous in listening to you and that we need to move on to new business. Leia chewed on her lower lip for a second. Mon Mothma will thank you for coming to us but she will point out that Tycho is being tried in a military court. The Provisional Council has no authority to interfere with the way the military deals with violations of the Code of Military Justice. Until there is a conviction and punishment is decided upon, there is nothing the Council can do. And even at that point, it is an open question whether or not we can interfere. But there has to be a chance to appeal a conviction. Wedge hesitated, then nodded. Counselor Barris's comment about a lack of a judiciary? That was meant to forestall this argument, yes? Leia nodded. In simple terms, yes. But we haven't yet had time to make decisions concerning the structure of such a body, much less its jurisdiction and duties. For example, would an appeal go to the New Republic courts first, or would it be sent to the courts of the defendant's homeworld, or the victim's homeworld? Putting together a government is not easy, and the process is not pretty or without pain. There are casualties all over the place, and Tycho will be one of them. Unfortunately, yes, he may be. Leia's shoulders slumped with fatigue. You may not realize how fragile the New Republic is right now. With her Krytos virus, Isan Isard has succeeded in driving a wedge between the human and non-human members of the New Republic. There have been accusations that some of us knew the virus was here and encouraged people to return to their native worlds specifically to spread the disease and kill off whole planetary populations. There are others who accuse us of not doing enough to get back to, to those who need it. If we do try to get as much as possible here to save as many people as possible, we drain the military of their supply. If Isard hits back, or Warlord Zinj decides to strike at us, we can be devastated. Trying to buy up supplies of Bacta has driven the price higher than ever before, and to make matters worse, 
the Ashern rebels on Thyfera have managed to damage production, limiting the supply at a time when the demand couldn't be higher. She looked up at him. It's a good thing we don't have a treasury ministry in place, because they'd tell us we're bankrupt. When Wedge realized his mouth was hanging open, he clicked it shut. I had no idea. Of course not. Nor does anyone else outside the council. Things are so dire that I'll be heading off to try to open relations with hapes and ask them for help. And that's something that's so secret I'll deny even knowing you if it gets out. Wedge nodded. Already forgotten. Leia mustered a weak smile. Frankly speaking, there is a remote possibility that we can secure enough Bacta to save many of the people who are afflicted by Krytos, but not all. Even if we cure 95% of the cases, those we don't cure will amount to millions of fatalities, non-human fatalities. The resentment against the government will rise until the alliance falls apart. When that happens, someone like Warlord Zinge or Isan Isard or who knows who else is lurking out there can come in and sweep up the pieces. She shrugged her shoulders. That shouldn't have anything to do with Tycho, but it does because Tycho is a human, accused of a heinous crime against a fellow rebel and a man who is now a hero. If we do not bring him to trial quickly and let the trial take its course, we will be accused of favoring a human. People will suggest that were Tycho a Gotal or Quarren, we'd have tried, convicted, and executed him inside of a day. That charge is baseless, but it's critical we avoid any appearance of favoritism. So Tycho gets offered up as a sacrifice to keep the Alliance together? I would have preferred being able to put Isan Isard on trial for having the Krytos virus created and spread, but she got away. How, I don't know, but she did. We probably could scoop up a double handful of Imperial bureaucrats and put them on trial for past activities, but then the entire Imperial bureaucracy would go into hiding and any chance we had of trying to govern the galaxy would go away. That comment brought Wedge up short. The notion of using the enemy to administer the territories of the new government struck him as wrong. But then he realized the Alliance military had always welcomed defectors from the other side into its ranks. Experience was enough to forgive past sins, especially when things were so critical. You're right, creating a government isn't easy or pretty. But it's what we have to do. The logic of her argument was inescapable. But Wedge bristled at it and didn't want to back down. Perhaps resigning is something I have to do. Leia shook her head. No, no, it's not. You're not going to resign, Wedge. Why not? The war's over. There have to be a half dozen fueling depots I could buy and operate here on Coruscant or back on Corellia. He knew he was letting himself be a bit petulant, but to acquiesce seemed like abandoning Tycho. I won't do that without sufficient reason. You won't resign, dear heart, because of the same sense of responsibility that makes you threaten to resign. Leia smiled at him. Kraken's people have been doing more than looking into Tycho's activities. Turns out that warlord Zinge hit a Thyferan back to convoy and stole a fairly big shipment. An Ashern rebel was on the convoy and got word out to us about the location of the space platform where Zinge has the convoy docked. The Bacta will save a lot of people, but getting our operatives in and back out means someone very good is going to have to be flying cover for our strike. Rogue Squadron will be leading the way. Wedge nodded. Resign and doom millions, or stay and watch a friend be destroyed. Not much of a choice. Not so, my friend. It is indeed quite a choice. Not an easy one. Oh, the choice is easy, Leia, but living with the result will not be. Wedge swallowed past the lump choking him. You'll let the council know I've reconsidered my resignation. I'll tell them 
that you meant the suggestion as a way to underscore your concern for Captain Selchu. Leia nodded solemnly. According to Kraken, you'll be briefed inside a week and then head out. May the Force be with you. I'll save the Force for Tycho. Wedge's eyes became slits. No matter what sort of reception Zinge has for us, what Tycho's going to face will be a million times worse. 4. The prison uniform Tycho Selchu had been given looked enough like a flight suit that Wedge Antilles could almost imagine his friend being free again. The black jumpsuit had red sleeves and leggings that started at elbow and knee, respectively. They also ended well shy of wrist and ankle, so the fabric would not interfere with the operation of the binders Tycho wore. Wedge shuddered with anger and embarrassment. I will see you free again, my friend. Tycho looked up and smiled. A bit taller than Wedge, but with the same lithe build, Tycho was a handsome man whose blue eyes appeared brighter than Wedge would have thought possible. Tycho held his hands up in greeting to Wedge and Nawara Ven, and almost made it seem as if the binders were not hampering him. He waited patiently as a guard in a control room opened the transparasteel barrier separating him from the visitation center, then shuffled in past his escort. Wedge rose and started across the sparsely furnished white room, but Tycho's guard brandished a Stokely spray stick. Keep away from the prisoner, Commander. Wedge felt a hand on his left elbow and turned back to face the Twi'lek, who had accompanied him to the detention center. Commander, we're not allowed physical contact with Tycho. No one is allowed to touch prisoners. It's security. Wedge frowned. Right. Nawara then skewered the guard with a pink-eyed stare. You've done your duty here. Now I require you to leave us alone with my client and my droid here. The heavyset guard's eyes narrowed. Then he tapped the Stokely spray stick against the palm of his other hand. I'm going to be right out there. Anything funny happens, and you'll be spending a lot of time with this traitor. He turned and headed back out to the far side of the transparent steel barrier. Wedge dropped into one of the four chairs around the table in the middle of the room. How are you doing? Is that guard causing you trouble? Because if he is, I'll do something about it. Tycho sat across from him and shrugged. Vole isn't so bad. He just doesn't like things to get odd on his watch. Other guards are worse. And if I weren't in solitary confinement, I think the general population would have already tried and executed me. What? Tycho's comment caught Wedge by surprise. What do you mean by that? I thought it was rather self-explanatory. Tycho shook his head, then smiled up at his friends. You have to remember, I've been charged with murder and treason. There are guards here who are just waiting for an excuse to show the New Republic how deep their patriotism runs. Some of the prisoners think they could win a pardon by saving the Republic the cost of a trial. I shouldn't think that would come as a surprise to you, Wedge. No, I guess it doesn't. But your reaction to it does. If I were in your boots, I'd be angry and outraged. That's because you've never been a guest in the Empire's correctional system. Tycho sighed and Wedge read weariness in the way his shoulders sagged. All the anger and outrage I can muster won't get me out of here any faster, and it could get me in trouble. But aren't you angry about being imprisoned for something you didn't do? Yes. Wedge opened his hands. Then why don't you show it? You can't keep it bottled up inside. It'll tear you apart. Tycho took in a deep breath, then let it out slowly. Wedge, You've always been my friend, and you've supported me with no questions asked. But what I'm enduring now is really no different than what I endured while being under house arrest. Sure, I can't go flying. Can't head out to Borlaeus with Mirax to save Corin's tail. And I'm not free to walk the streets of Coruscant as your whole card. 
but nothing has really changed. Since my capture by the Empire right here on Coruscant, I've been their prisoner. I've never really escaped the Empire because they managed to make others suspicious of me. I was outraged then, and have been since, but protesting wouldn't do me any good. The only way I can be free, truly free, is for the Empire to be destroyed. I know, as it falls apart, someone, somewhere, will have the information that will set me free. And if they don't? Tycho cracked a smile. You figured out a plan to take Coruscant away from the Empire. Springing a friend from prison shouldn't be that hard for you to manage. Nuara then cleared his throat. Let's not be adding conspiracy to the charges against you. Tycho nodded. As you wish, Counselor. How's my defense going? Good and bad. Nuara then sat at the end of the table and a little green and white R2 unit rolled up beside him. The best thing we have going for us right now is that Whistler here has joined our defense team. But I'm accused of killing Corrin Horn. He and Corrin were partners. Why would he want to help defend me? The droid keened a reply. Wedge smiled. Ah, he did know Corrin well. The Twi'lek nodded. Well enough to decide Horn was wrong about you, Captain Selchu. If Horn was wrong about your being a traitor, that means someone else killed him. Since you've been framed for the murder, if Whistler does nothing to help you, he's ensuring that his friend's murderer is getting away. Having Whistler on the team is unbelievably useful because of the specialized circuitry and programming he has. It allows him to wade through a lot of law enforcement data, including Imperial files. Tycho shifted around in his chair, making his binders click against the edge of the table. I hope the bad news doesn't obliterate the good. Nawara's brain tails twitched lethargically. Corrin had reported to Commander Antilles that he saw you in the headquarters talking to Curtin Lure. You said you were speaking with... Nawara glanced at his data pad. A Duros captain, Lai Nutka. Tycho nodded. Right. He flew a freighter called Star's Delight. I was negotiating with him for spare parts for the Z-95 headhunters I'd bought. Well... No one can seem to find him or his ship. The prosecution can introduce ample evidence that Curtin Lure was here on Coruscant, that Corn would have recognized him, and that, knowing you were exposed, you had to take steps to cover yourself. Wedge frowned. If the only way out of that trap is to find Nutka, we'll find him. Whistler tutored a dour message. Rogue Squadron's commander rubbed his eyes for a moment to ease their burning. Fine, fine. There are 247 unidentified bodies of Duros here on Coruscant, and the possibility exists that the imps caught him, killed him, and dumped him so we'll never find him. We can still try to find the ship. The log might have an entry in it about the meeting. Tycho gave Wedge a smile. You're more nervous than I am, Wedge. That's because I don't think you understand what's at stake here, Tycho. Wedge got up and began to pace. Your trial is going to go forward and go forward quickly. It's going to be used to show that the New Republic can be just as hard on humans as the Empire was on non-humans. I have to tell you, if Nawara here weren't already a lawyer, I'd be looking for the best non-human counsel I could find for you. The judges here are going to feel pressure to convict to seem fair. I want the fact that your defender is non-human to make them worry about how your being found guilty will look. Captain, you might want to look into more competent counsel than me. Tycho shook his head. No, Nawara. I want you. I've read your file and I know you. 
This is going to be hard enough without having a lawyer who wants the case for notoriety. Tycho's right. We need you. The squadron is behind Tycho, and having you represent him means the rest of us don't feel entirely impotent. Wedge's dark eyes narrowed. Do you see a problem with defending him? The Twi'lek hesitated for a moment, then answered. I've defended a lot of people in criminal cases, but the stakes have not been this high before, nor the opposition so tough. Emtray knows all the regulations, so having him in court with me means I'll have a good grasp on the differences between military law and civil law. But it would be better for you to have someone who doesn't have to rely on a droid for that stuff. The fact that I was down with the first stages of Tritos during the alleged murder means I can't be called as a witness of fact in the case. At least, I'd not call me but the prosecution might have other ideas. He tapped a button on his data pad. The prosecutor is Commander Hala Eddick. She's 34 years old and from Alderaan. She had gained quite a reputation as a prosecutor there and happened to be off Alderaan to depose a witness in a case when Alderaan was destroyed. She joined the rebellion and was part of General Kraken's counterintelligence staff. She may not have prosecuted any cases over the last seven years, but that's not going to dull her skills. Captain, you don't happen to know her or have a family vendetta with her family or anything that could let me suggest she has a conflict of interest, do you? Nothing, sorry. What about the tribunal? Wedge stopped pacing, crossed his arms, and looked down at the Twi'lek. The subpoena I was served with yesterday indicated General Salm, Admiral Akbar, and General Crix Madine were going to serve as judges. Salm has never liked Tycho. Can you get him removed? Trying to get him replaced is tricky. If he does not recuse himself, he clearly thinks he has no conflict of interest. If we suggest he does, and we fail to remove him, we've poisoned him. The other thing to keep in mind is that Psalm was present at the First Battle of Borlaeus and saw Tycho flying an unarmed shuttle and rescuing pilots, including me. He's got to weigh what he remembers against the evidence he hears, and we'll be sure to remind him of Borlaeus. Tycho nodded. I'm willing to take my chances with Psalm. What do you think of the other two? The Twi'lek shrugged. Agbar agreed to have you serve as Rogue Squadron's executive officer and has remained neutral regarding this prosecution. Crix Madine came over from the Imperial side around the same time you did, Captain. Given his work planning covert missions for the Empire, I would have to guess he has met Iceheart and is aware of the work she has done. He knows of your reputation and... Being a Corellian like Commander Antilles has an appreciation of bravery and audacity. You're forgetting, Counselor Venn, that Corn Horn was Corellian too. No, Commander, I've not forgotten that fact. I'm counting on it to motivate General Madine to seek the people truly responsible for Corn's death. Wedge nodded. So that's the line of defense. Tycho's been framed. The truth always is the best defense. Their evidence is all circumstantial. So we can slip someone or several someones in to raise doubt about who actually committed the crime. Nawara then pressed his hands flat on the table. This trial will be played as much to public opinion as to the judges. It's going to do no good if the people think Captain Selchu is guilty while the court lets him off. Everyone knows how twisted and full of plots the Empire was. The mention of Curtin Lure and Lusankia allows us to bring up Isan Isard. I can show that Captain Selchu's pattern of activity is all wrong by showing what Isard does do with her people. I can even point to the bombing as likely residue of her evil. If we have public opinion looking at Captain Selchu as the last victim of imperial intrigue, a rebellion hero being destroyed by a bitter and vengeful empire, 
we have a lot of maneuvering room in the aftermath of the trial. Noir Aven's explanation made sense to Wedge, but he didn't like all it entailed. Fighting enemies who were shooting back was one thing. Winning a court case was quite another, one akin to politics, and Wedge knew he'd utterly failed in that arena at the council meeting. Waging a public relations war to win the hearts and minds of a planet for a man who was already being entered into the pantheon of evil with Darth Vader, Prince Shizor, Isan Isard, and the Emperor himself? Well, that was a battle no one could consider easy. Wedge nodded toward the lawyer. What happens if Tycho is found guilty? Hard to say. There's no clear appeals system set up. Unless the judges reverse their decision, he'll be stuck. Tycho raised an eyebrow. What do you mean by stuck? This is treason, Captain, and murder. Noir Aven shook his head as Whistler moaned. Given the mood of the people and the nature of your crime, if we lose, the New Republic will put you to death. As Wedge entered the darkened briefing room, the pilots of Rogue Squadron broke from their knot surrounding Noir Aven and took their places. Some of their expressions were difficult to read. Riv Sheel, the Shistavanan Wolfman, wore his perpetual impenetrable frown. Gavin Darklighter, the youngest of the pilots in Rogue Squadron, seemed fairly cheerful but the hardness of the flesh gathered at the corners of his eyes betrayed the pressure most of the rest of the unit felt. Wedge stepped behind and past Errol Numb, then paused with the holo projection table in front of him. I appreciate your getting here so quickly. I had hoped we'd get at least a week's liberty after the conquest of Coruscant. The fiery-haired lieutenant in the front row, Pash Kraken, shrugged. We've not had that much to celebrate, sir. I know. Corrin's death, then Tycho's arrest, had undercut the rogues when they should have been enjoying their greatest triumph. While everyone else on Coruscant was jubilant about the world's liberation, the rogues felt still enslaved by Tycho's plight. The contrast between the congratulations they got from others and the way they felt inside remained sharp enough to slice them up emotionally. To save themselves, the squadron members had rallied around Tycho and were determined to prove his innocence. That provided them a sanctuary and sense of control, though it did nothing to endear them to others who thought Tycho's guilt was indisputable. The one thing we do know, people, is that the source of our problems lies on the imp side of things. We should also realize that what we're suffering is nothing compared to what hundreds of thousands of people out there are suffering. Wedge pointed a finger toward Nawara and Riv Shiel, then glanced back at Errol Nunb. Three of our own came down with this Krytos virus, but they got quick treatment with enough Bacta to knock it out. Bacta is in high demand right now, but supplies are very short. Erisi Dlerit, the dark-haired pilot from Thyfera, pressed a hand to her own sternum. I know the cartels are producing as much as they can. At least the Zakfra group is. I have personally sent messages to my grandfather to let him know of the need for Bacta here. Thanks, Erisi. Every bit of help we can get is vital. Wedge folded his arms across his chest. Warlord Zinge hit a back to convoy heading out from Thyfera. I believe it was from the Zaltan group, Arissi, not your family's corporation. Zinge took the Bacta to a storage facility, but a member of the Ashern rebel group, terrorists, Arissi spat, happened to be crewing aboard the Zaltan ships. He managed to get a message out concerning the location of the space station Zinj is using. Wedge nodded toward Errol, and the Solistan punched up a holographic image of the station on the holo projector. 
The station consisted of a central disk with thick expanses of living quarters above and below the horizon. Slender towers rose from the middle of the disk, suggesting the station had been impaled on spears. Three wedge-shaped launch and recovery causeways stabbed out into space from the central disk like spokes meant to connect up with a non-existent rim. This is an Empress-class space station located in the YAG dual system. Basic armament is 10 turbo laser batteries and six laser cannons. It also has the capability of housing up to three squadrons of TIEs, though the usual complement is only two dozen fighters. The Bacta is being held here, and we're going to get it away from them. As Wedge continued his briefing, little glowing icons appeared to hover around the station. Each represented a ship and entered the display as its part in the operation was explained. We will be leading two squadrons from General Salm's Defender Wing to pull a quick strafing run on the station and get them to scramble their fighters. The squadrons we'll have with us are Warden and Champion. You remember them. They saved us at Borlaeus. The Gand toward the back raised a three-fingered hand. As Oral remembers it, Commander Antilles, Defender Wing flies Y-Wing fighters. Provoking TIE fighters to come out and attack Y-Wings would seem to Oral as potentially dangerous for Defender's pilots. Your concern is noted, Oral, and has been taken into account. Guardian Squadron, the third of Defender Wing's component parts, has been refitted with B-Wings. This adds considerable firepower to the wing. We'll pull the ties out and away from the station, and the B-Wings will drop on them and help us kill them. The Y-Wings will continue in toward the space station and start working on its defenses with their ion cannons. Following us in will be a half dozen assault shuttles and then enough bulk cruisers to haul the Bacta away. This is a hit, hold, then run operation. Gavin smiled. Sounds like a do-run. Maybe, Pash Kraken leaned forward in his chair. Where's the Iron Fist supposed to be? Wedge shook his head. I've been given no data concerning the Iron Fist. Warlord Zinj's flagship was one of the super-class Star Destroyers created by the Kuat Drive Yard's shipworks before the Empire collapsed. The ships were, for all intents and purposes, fleets unto themselves. They carried 144 fighters, had a crew of over a quarter of a million people, and bristled with over a thousand missile launchers, ion cannons, and turbo laser batteries. Though the rebel fleet had managed to destroy the Executor at Endor, everyone knew that ship had died because of luck, not skill. If the Iron Fist showed up at Yagdul, the operation was doomed. Wedge knew it, as did all of the pilots in the room. While I am as concerned about the appearance of Iron Fist as any of you, I know the Bacta is too valuable to risk on an operation that could be so easily jeopardized. I have to assume that intelligence has the Iron Fist located and that it won't interfere with the mission. If it does show up, all we can do is pull out and hope no one gets left behind. Risati Enir, the blonde woman sitting next to Nawara Ven, raised her hand. Do we just fly cover when the assault shuttles go in? Or are we going to land and go in Station 2? Right now, we're just flying cover. If things change, you'll be the first to know. Wedge sighed. We're heading out in 12 hours, so you're now all under security quarantine. Report to your quarters, get your gear, and go to the hangar. Once there, you'll get a more specific briefing and run through a basic simulation of the exercise before we leave. Any other questions? Gavin looked around nervously, then nodded. Sir, won't Nawara's heading out on a mission compromise Captain Selchu's defense? I mean, shouldn't Nawara be here setting things up? A question I asked myself. Your concerns, Gavin, are valid, but not terribly important in the face of what we're doing here. We're already one pilot light because of Korn's death, 
so we need everyone we can get. The fact is that obtaining the Bacta is far more important to the future of the New Republic than Tycho's trial. So that is our priority. Besides, I have Whistler and M-Trade doing a lot of computer fact-finding for me right now. Nuara sat forward and slapped Gavin on the shoulder. The lawyering part of all this comes later. It occurs to me that if we do get the Bacta and things begin to calm down, someone might start listening to reason instead of political pressure, and this case will be dumped in some black hole where it deserves to be. May the Force be with you in that regard. Wedge smiled openly. If that's it, get going. Everyone should be in the hangar in an hour at the very latest. As the pilots started to leave the room, Wedge caught the eye of a black and white furred both in female. Sailor, if I could have a moment of your time. Yes, Commander. He watched Asir as she waited for the others to leave, then walked toward him. There was no overt challenge in her stride, though the fire in her violet eyes did reveal a strong streak of both and pride running in her. Splotches of white fur covered her from throat to belly, gloved her, and slashed down from her forehead over her left eye to her cheek. They almost succeeded in diluting the predatory power in her petite frame. She stopped before him and snapped to attention. At ease, Salar. Thank you, sir. You might want to reserve your thanks until you've heard what I have to say. Wedge looked down on her and saw her fur ripple with irritation. Two things I want to discuss. The first is Gavin. Asir blinked with surprise that flowed out into her fur. I was under the impression that pairing among members of the squadron was not prohibited. Nawara and Risadi and Arisi and Korin... I'm not under the impression anything was going on between Arissi and Korn. But her reaction to his death, they were close, but not in that way, as I understand it. Wedge frowned for a moment. Mirax Tarek had been crushed by Korn's death and had confided in Wedge that she and Korn had chosen to begin dating once the conquest of Coruscant had been accomplished. Though Korn had never revealed his feelings about Arissi or Mirax to Wedge, Korn's attraction to Mirax had been fairly easy to spot, which led Wedge to believe Arissi was out of the picture. Regardless of what was or was not happening between Arissi and Korn, or what is or is not happening between Risadi and Nawara, the big difference between those situations and your situation with Gavin is that Gavin's barely 17 years old. He's very young and hasn't had the experiences that your education at the Bothan Marshall Academy has afforded you. He's not a stupid young man. He's actually fairly intelligent, but his upbringing on Tatooine has left him a bit idealistic. Asser's violet eyes sank into crescents. Are you ordering me to stop seeing him? Wedge laughed. No, not at all. You've only been out twice. Have you had someone watching us? No, and that's just the point. Wedge opened his hands. Gavin is so taken with you that his enthusiasm isn't always kept under control. While he remains very circumspect about private moments you have shared... He is very happy to let others know how much fun you're having together doing all the things you have done. It's all very innocent and natural, but it's also a sign of his falling in love with you. He may not quite be there yet, but he'll be hurt badly if you pull away from him abruptly after too much longer. I don't want to see him hurt, so if you don't really care for him, let him down easy, and now, please. Asser's chin came up, and defiance blazed in her eyes. What makes you think I might be toying with him? The second thing I want to discuss with you does, Salar. I wonder if you don't have another agenda that you're working on. Wedge met her hot stare unflinchingly. You graduated near the top of your class from the Bothan Marshall Academy, 
but never formally entered the military. Your records are decidedly sketchy, but I would imagine, given your age, that you were recruited into the Martial Intelligence Division of the Bothan military in an effort to replenish the supply of spies who died, securing the plans to the second Death Star. The fact that you were already here on Coruscant when our operation arrived suggests the Bothan government had its own goals here on Coruscant. But you forget, sir, that I did help organize and participate in the operations that cleared the way for the Rebel Alliance to take the planet. I never accused you of being stupid, Salar. Quite the contrary. I think you were very intelligent. You saw an opportunity that had to succeed, and you did your best to make it succeed. Wedge let a smile tug at the corners of his mouth. That self-same intelligence is why I want you in the squadron. The fact is, Salar, who and what you are makes you very valuable and desirable. I want you here in Rogue Squadron. I think you are an incredible asset to the Rebellion. Flip a bit, though, and it's easy to see that your Bothan Masters also find you quite useful. That means, sooner or later, you're going to have some decisions to make. Asir glanced down. Decisions about Gavin. And about your loyalties to your planet and your nation. Or my squadron. Exactly. Wedge nodded slowly. The pressure is not on you right now, but it will come. Borsk Failure likes having a Bothan in Rogue Squadron, but at some point he'll want to exert control over you. Her head came back up. Do you want me to make those decisions right now? I want you to make them when you feel they need to be made. I trust you, and I want to continue to trust you. If you find you can't be part of the squadron, you can walk away, and I'll have been proud to have you as one of us. Asir arched an eyebrow. No threat of retribution if I betray you? Wedge shook his head. If you decide to betray us, I can't imagine we'll survive long enough to avenge ourselves on you. On the other hand, rogues tend to take a lot of killing. So you can't be sure how things will turn out. I'll keep that in mind. Asser smiled and Wedge took it for a good sign. And, Commander, concerning Gavin, there is no hidden agenda. His wide-eyed way of looking at everything is refreshing and perhaps even energizing. I've lived a long time in the shadows, so moving into the light feels very good. I'll do nothing to hurt him. Good. Wedge waved her toward the door. Go get your stuff and get to the briefing. I'm trusting you'll see the holes in this plan and help us plug them before Zinj accomplishes what the Empire could only dream about, the destruction of Rogue Squadron. 6. Corrin Horn let his joy at again being in the cockpit of a starfighter consume him. It did not matter to him that he did not know how he'd gotten into the ship. He did not let the fact that he was flying a TIE interceptor concern him. He thrust aside anxiety born of his ignorance of his location. None of those things were germane to his present situation. The only relevant facts in his life were these. He was flying, and, he knew, if he flew well enough, he would be allowed to fly again. He had no idea how he knew his performance would be rewarded with more flight time. The facts seemed as fundamental to him as his need for air and food and sleep. His desire to continue flying blazed hot in his gut and burned from him the annoyance at the squint's inefficient controls and sluggish reaction time. Nemesis One, report. It took Horn a moment to realize the comm unit call had been directed at him. He glanced at his scanner windows. One is clear. 
One, we have two eyeballs vectoring in on a heading of 239 degrees at a range of 10 kilometers. They are hostiles. You are free to engage and terminate them. I copy. Nemesis 1 outbound. Korn hit the left rudder pedal and swung the ship around onto the proper heading. The starfield whirled around him, then froze in place again. He could recognize none of the constellations, but that did not concern him. His mission was to destroy the enemy, and that he would gladly do no matter where he found himself. His breathing reverberated loudly in the full helmet he wore. The sound came rhythmically. It betrayed no nervousness. It was not the quickened breathing of prey, but the strong, steady respiration of a predator on the hunt. He had already killed more Thai starfighters than he cared to remember. These would just be two more. And yet, in the back of his mind, he knew he could not actually remember his previous kills, and this amnesia began to nibble away at his emotional well-being. With a thumb, he flicked the interceptor's quad lasers over to dual-fire mode, then pulled back on the steering yoke and brought the ship up in a slight climb. A quick starboard snap roll onto his head turned the climb into a dive, and suddenly he was upon the eyeballs. His index finger tightened on the trigger and a stream of verdant laser bolts sliced through the lead eyeball. Because of his angle of attack, the bolts scored black furrows in one wing, then pierced the ball cockpit from the top. On the other side, they freed the wing, but the ship's explosion shattered the hexagonal panel. It blasted debris into the flight path of the second tie, causing it to roll to starboard and dive. The maneuver succeeded in saving the second ship from a collision with its dying wingman, but dropped it straight into Corin's sights. Corin cut the throttle back by a quarter, matching speed with his prey. The pilot he hunted juked right and left, but made none of the hard breaks and sharp turns needed to shuck Corin from his tail. Without remorse, but full of contempt, Corin flicked the squint's lasers over to quad fire, then impaled the TIE fighter on his crosshairs and hit the trigger with a delicate twitch of his finger. The four green laser bolts converged and merged into one a nanosecond before they burned the top from the cockpit, shearing it off just above the engine assembly. Korn imagined he could see the pilot's blackened body in silhouette for a second. Then the eyeball exploded and seared that image into his brain. Exultation at having been victorious swept through Korn, though in its wake came the feeling that those two pilots had been so inexperienced that he had not really fought them, but had just slaughtered them. Nemesis 1, we have two uglies at five kilometers, heading 132 degrees. They are hostile. Engage and terminate. As ordered. Corin brought the squint up and around, then punched the throttle to full power. He wanted to close quickly, so he would be able to get a look at the ships he faced. Uglies were hideous, hybrid space fighters cobbled together from various salvage parts. Smugglers and pirates used them fairly often. He couldn't pinpoint how he knew that, but he did know he'd fought uglies before. Given that he was alive, he assumed they had not proved too much of a problem for him. Something about that assumption niggled in the back of his mind. He knew it was not incorrect. He was a good pilot, and he knew it, but his assuming superiority seemed wrong. He hadn't made the assumption on the basis of the fact that uglies seldom had the performance characteristics of the fighters from which they were created. He realized he'd assumed anyone flying uglies would be pirates or smugglers, and had instantly assumed they were his inferiors. While he could find no facts to dispute his assumption about his foes, he knew there was something wrong with his having made it. A warning klaxon blared in the cockpit, 
alerting him that one of the uglies had gotten a torpedo lock on him and had launched a proton torpedo. Corrin banished thoughts about his enemy's combat worthiness, rolled the ship up onto its port wing, then dove. His abrupt maneuver hurled his ship onto a course at right angles to the one he'd been traveling previously. The proton torpedo, which was traveling roughly twice as fast as he was, shot past his starboard wing and started on a long loop to head back at him. A proton torpedo has 30 seconds of flight time. I can't outrun it, but I can outmaneuver it. Corin smiled. Or deal with it more directly. He reversed the squint's thrust and hit the port rudder pedal. This threw the interceptor into a flat spin that brought the nose around to face back along his flight path. Where the proton torpedo had been coming straight at his back before, now it was coming straight in at his cockpit. He killed the thrust and glanced at his scanner monitor. 750 meters and closing fast. At 400 meters, he flicked the lasers over to dual fire and tightened his finger down on the trigger. Pairs of laser bolts burned green through space, seeking the torpedo. One bolt hit the torpedo at 250 meters out. It failed to destroy it, but did melt its way into the body and ignite a fuel cell. The subsequent explosion pitched the torpedo off course. When the onboard computer calculated the torpedo would not hit its target, it detonated the warhead but the interceptor remained a hundred meters outside the blast radius. Switching thrust forward again, Corin throttled up to full and punched up profiles of the uglies. One was an X-Tie. It had the body of an X-Wing fighter with the hexagonal wings from a TIE starfighter. Corin found the ship hideous to look at and would have dismissed it immediately except it had launched the proton torpedo. The other ship looked fairly ridiculous. It mated a TIE's ball cockpit with the engine pods from a Y-wing. This particular hybrid was rare because it combined the TIE's lack of shields with the Y-wing's lumbering, slothful handling. Corin knew this type of ugly was often referred to as a TIE-wing, though DIE-wing was a common nickname for it as well. Corin cut his interceptor on a course that shot him past the X-Tie, then broke on down into a series of maneuvers, twisting and turning, that left the tie wing far behind. The X-Tie hung with him long enough for Corin's scanners to pick out the tails. X-Wing fighters had two torpedo launching tubes in the nose and four lasers one mounted on each end of the stabilizers that supplied the ship with its name. Lacking those S-foils, the X-Tie had replaced one proton torpedo launch tube with what Corin guessed would be a laser cannon, undergunned and overmatched. Corin rolled his way down through a corkscrew dive that lengthened his lead on the X-Tie and the tie wing. The X-Tie's pilot began to pull the fighter's nose up as if he intended to return to his wingman's side and the safety of the tie wing would provide him. Corin watched him turn away, then inverted and pulled the interceptor through a tight turn and shot back up and in at the X-Tie's exposed aft. Clearly unaware of Corin's maneuver, the X-Tie's pilot inverted and headed back toward the tie wing. Corin saw the pilot's head come up as he scanned space for signs of the interceptor. Coming in from behind made spotting the squint difficult. The pilot never managed it, though Corin did see the R-5 unit's head swivel around and spot him. Corin hit the trigger and walked laser fire from stern to nose on the ugly. Two bolts blew the R-5's flower pot head off, then two more punctured the cockpit, exploding it into a cloud of transparent steel and duraplast fragments. The last bolts hit forward and touched off a proton torpedo's fuel cells, 
The fuel's detonation filled the slender craft with fire and sent the nose spinning wildly off into space. Pulling back on the yoke, Corin brought his nose up and spitted the die wing on the crosshairs. The ugly began a roll, so Corin matched him and tightened up on the trigger. Green laser bolts slashed at one of the Y-wings, but the ugly flashed on past beneath him. Corn prepared to invert and loop, but a hail of angry red laser bolts sliced across his flight path. What? Who? He kicked the squint up on its right wing, wrenched the wheel right, and tugged back on the yoke. The maneuver pulled him sharply out of line with his previous course, but he wasn't content with just doing that. He broke again to port and up, then searched his scanner monitor for whomever had shot at him. The scanners reported two ships, both of them X-Wings. What's going on here? Nemesis One, we have two hostiles, X-Wings. It was an ambush. Engage and terminate. Ambush me, will you? Corin translated his outrage into fluid maneuvering. Cutting and jumping, he bounced his interceptor through a series of jukes that shook the X-Wings from his tail and brought him around on the die wing. Without really thinking about it, he pumped laser fire into the ugly's ball cockpit, then pulled up and away as the misbegotten fighter exploded. Two on one. Same odds I've had all day. Despite that hasty assessment, he knew the odds were actually quite different in this battle. The squint's speed and maneuverability gave it an edge over the X-Wings, but they had shields. They could take more damage than he could, and the ability to survive damage had a very direct relationship with the ability to survive in combat. More importantly, the two X-Wing pilots seemed determined to operate together. They flew in tight formation and seemed familiar enough with each other that he wasn't so much fighting two foes as one meta-foe. The X-Wings came around on a vector that brought them straight at him. Corin knew head-to-head -head passes were the most deadly in dogfighting, and given the enemy's superiority of numbers, he had no intention of engaging in such a duel. He cut his throttle back and dove at a slight angle so he would pass beneath their incoming vector. They made a slight adjustment in their courses, apparently content to get a passing deflection shot. Corn then goosed his throttle forward, forcing them to sharpen their dives, yet before they could get a good shot at him, he had passed beneath them and had started up again. One X-Wing inverted and pulled up through a loop to drop on Corrin's tail, while the other broke the other way. The second X-Wings looped out and away from the interceptor, momentarily splitting the two fighters. Corrin knew the second pilot had made a mistake and instantly acted to make the most of it. Cutting his throttle back, he turned hard to starboard and then back again to port. Corrin's sine wave maneuver brought him back on course, but the X-Wing that had been following him now hung up and out in front of him. The X-Wing's pilot had continued on his course, assuming the interceptor had been trying to evade him. It wasn't until he shot past the interceptor and it dropped into his aft arc that he realized his error. Corrin throttled up and closed with the X-Wing. You're mine now all because your buddy made a mistake. He pushed the interceptor into point-blank range and started to fire. Then he saw a blue crest on the X-Wing's S-foils. It appeared to be the Rebel Crest, with a dozen X-Wings flying out away from it. Though no words accompanied the crest, Korn knew they should have. Rogue Squadron. The second he recognized the crest, his finger fell away from the trigger. He didn't know why he didn't fire. Fear crystallized in his belly at the sight of it, but he knew he wasn't afraid of the rogues. It was something else. Something was wrong, hideously wrong, 
but he could not pierce the veil of mystery surrounding that sensation. Suddenly, something exploded behind him, pitching him forward. He slammed hard into the steering yoke, crushing his life support equipment and driving the breath from his lungs. His chest burned as he tried in vain to catch his breath. He caught the fleeting scent of flowers. Then a painful brilliance filled the cockpit. He waited for the pain in his chest and the fire in his lungs to consume him, but those sensations dulled and his ability to focus on them or anything else eroded. A woman's voice spoke to him. You have failed, Nemesis One. You are weak. Her words came tinged with anger, bitten off harshly and clearly meant to hurt him. Had this been other than a simulation, your atoms would be floating through space and the rabble would be laughing at you. You are pathetic. Corin's right hand rose toward his throat and pressed itself against his chest. The shattered remains of his life support gear prevented him from touching his breastbone, but he knew something was missing, something that should have been laying against his flesh. He did not know what it was, but he knew he would draw comfort from it. In its absence, despair flooded through him. I had thought you worthy, Nemesis One. You told me you were, didn't you? Though he recalled no such declaration, he confirmed it. I did. I am. You are nothing, unless I say you are something. Now I say you are nothing, nothing but a failure. In the light he saw the silhouette of a tall, slender woman. The sight of her made him shiver more than her words. He knew he feared her, but he also wanted to please her. Pleasing her was very important to him. The only thing that was important in the world. You have failed me and yourself. Please, he croaked, but her silhouette gave no indication she had heard him. One more chance, perhaps. Yes, yes, if you fail again. Corin shook his head adamantly. I won't, I won't. No, for your next failure will be your last, Nemesis One. The silhouette folded its arms together. Disappoint me again, and what is left of your life will be spent in agonizing atonement, disgrace, and, after a long time, death. 7. The reversion to real space brought Wedge and the rogues out into a situation that just seemed like another simulator run, with one minor variation. As he expected, Wedge saw the space station slowly revolving in a star-stained void. Way off toward the right, closer to the yellow star burning at the center of the solar system, sat Yagdul. The planet's gray cloud cover made it only slightly more colorful than the given who called it home. The only variation from the opsims was the appearance of a flight of four Thai starfighters patrolling the area around the space station. Minoc, the R-5 unit in Wedge's X-Wing, immediately screeched out a warning when he noticed them off to port. Wedge glanced at his monitor, noted how the ties moved into an attack formation, and smiled. Action beats inaction every time. He keyed his comm unit. One, flight on me. Rogue 12, take the defenders in. As ordered, Errol Nunb replied. Committing only one flight of fighters against an equal number of ties, especially when he could have had two dozen Y-wings and seven more X-wings join the fight, might have seemed the height of arrogance, though Wedge knew it was quite the opposite. While Thai pilots seldom managed to amass the experience of their rebel counterparts, they were quite competent and more than capable of killing in a dogfight. Warlord Zinj's pilots had proved to be good fighters in the past, and Wedge expected them to be nothing less in this engagement. 
The reasons he had pulled one flight from his formation to deal with the ties were twofold. First and most important, their operation demanded that the threat to the station caused it to scramble its fighters. The X and Y wings were to draw the ties out and away from the station to a point in the system where the B wings would come in. The B wings were in hyperspace, already on their way, so if surprise were to be achieved, Zinj's troops had to be lured into position in a timely manner. The second reason to match forces with Zinj was because having too many fighters involved in a battle tended to wreak havoc on the efficacy of the pilots. The difference between a good pilot and a bad one, all other things being equal, came down to situational awareness. A pilot who could handle more variables and keep track of more ships in his mind would do better in combat than one who could only deal with less in the way of distractions. Wedge had seen statistical analyses that showed that kill ratios fell as the number of fighters in a dogfight increased. So by keeping the fight small, he made it easier for his people to grasp all the aspects of the fight. Three, you and four have the trailers. Two, I have lead. Target the second tie. As ordered, rogue leader, Risadi Inir led Arisi Dlerit in a dive and sweeping turn that brought them around toward the following pair of ties. Risadi's attack vector was intended to push the ties farther from the space station and the rest of the rebel force. Wedge saw the ties begin to react to her maneuver, but they seemed content to let her dictate the direction of the fight. Wedge flipped his weapon's controls over to lasers and set them for dual firing. He pumped his shields up to full and picked the lead eyeball as his target. They started to close, coming head to head with their wingmen off starboard and hanging slightly back, each formation being the mirror image of the other. He smiled. Just where I want him. Rogue Two, do you have your target? Confirmed, lead. Asir's voice came through the comm unit, cool and steady. Get ready. On my mark, I'm going to foul your target. Shoot immediately after that with a proton torpedo. As ordered. Three, two, one, mark. Wedge rolled the X-Wing up and over in a barrel roll to port. His target did the same thing, sweeping his fighter across his wingman's flight path. That momentarily blinded the second tie and caused him to shy. Wedge glanced at his monitor and saw a report of a proton torpedo launch, then touched the starboard rudder pedal a second before inverting the X-Wing and making his pass on the TIE fighter. Before Wedge applied rudder, the two ships had been heading straight at each other. The rudder drifted the X-Wing's nose about ten degrees to starboard, pulling him out of line with the tie. The inversion flopped the starfighter, bringing the nose back into line with the tie. Before Zinj's pilot could react, Wedge's fighter streaked in at him and started shooting. The first pair of red laser bolts missed low but the next two pairs swept up and across the ball cockpit. One of the TIE's lasers died in a cloud of duraplast mist. Wedge's third shot lanced through the transparasteel viewport, igniting and melting all manner of components and equipment. The TIE starfighter rolled up on the starboard solar panel, then tightened down into a screw spiral before exploding. A second later, a blue proton torpedo slammed into the port wing on the second tie. The black solar panel closed around the torpedo like cloth around a thrown stone. The torpedo itself punched through the panel and penetrated the fighter's hull before detonating. The blast ripped the back half off the cockpit pod, freeing the engines to soar further in system while the shattered husk of a fighter tumbled on through the void. Nice shot, Deuce. Thanks for the setup, lead. Wedge brought the X-Wing up and around to the original heading, 
and saw a proton torpedo from Arisi's ship finish off a tie. Farther along, he saw streams of green laser bolts spraying out from the space station. At the extremes of range, the fire did not seriously threaten the incoming fighters, but it did keep them away long enough for the station to scramble its ties. Zinja's flyers boiled up and out from the station and rose on an intercept course with the rebel fighters. Lead, I have a dozen interceptors and eight starfighters. I copy, Twelve. That should be everything they have, unless they're holding something back. Keeping ships in reserve made little or no sense to Wedge, but he'd long since learned that warfare and tactics seldom make a lot of sense to the opposition. I just hope our run away from the station looks believable. Errol Nunba led the rogues and Y-wings up and away from the station. The squints and eyeballs came on in pursuit, hot to thin the ranks of the Y-wings. The interceptors opened a lead on the TIE starfighters and started to close fast with the Y-wings. Errol brought her X-wing over and the rest of the rogues followed her through a loop that took them back toward the interceptors, while the Y-wings continued heading away from their pursuers. As the X-wing and interceptor formations began to spread out into clouds, the B-wings burst into real space and shot straight into the gap between the squints and the eyeballs from the station. Wedge marveled at how each cruciform ship flew with its wings and fuselage, whirling around to keep the cockpit stable despite a wild series of maneuvers and course corrections. Having flown a B-wing a few times, he could appreciate the ship's firepower, but the way it moved and flew made him feel less like a pilot than a driver. The B-wings slashed in at the interceptors. Half of them seemed content to attack using lasers or blasters, while the other half employed ion cannons to take the squints out of the fight without killing them. Blue ion bolts caught interceptors in full flight, sending electricity skitterjagging over the hulls. Laser and blaster fire ripped into other interceptors, burning holes through solar panels and cockpits. The B-wing ambush scattered the interceptors, but the X-wings coming in at them did not break off in pursuit. They left that to the B-wings. The rogues pushed on through the crumbling interceptor formation, shot past the B-wings and, as one flight reunited with the squadron, sailed on in at the eyeball formation. The first pass came head to head. Static hissed through the X-wing cockpit as TIE lasers stung his forward shields repeatedly. Wave after wave of green light washed over the shields, but Wedge ignored it. He concentrated instead on his monitor and shifted the X-wing a bit to starboard, trapping a TIE fighter in the center of his targeting crosshairs. He tightened down on the trigger, pulsing kilojoules of scarlet energy into an eyeball's cockpit. A roiling explosion shredded that ship, Wedge kicked the X-Wing up onto the starboard S-foil, then climbed up and away from the expanding ball of gas. Letting his roll continue over the top, he dropped the X-Wing into a dive, then rolled out to port and came around on an arc between the cloud of fighters and the station. He glanced off to starboard and saw Asir still with him, which prompted him to toss her a salute. Glad you stayed with me that's my job. From his vantage point at the periphery of the battle, he could see a number of things that impressed him. The rogues had hit the eyeballs very hard, but Zinja's people regrouped in good order instead of scattering. Without shields, the TIE starfighters were really no match for the X-wings, but remaining together made them far more dangerous than individual ships fleeing. Whoever the leader of that squadron was, he was sharp enough to keep his people together and head them out and away from the fray. Rogue flights two and three leave the flight of eyeballs alone and join the Y-wings. One flight, we're watching the eyeballs. Wedge hit two buttons on his flight console. Minoc, 
See if you can get me a frequency for the comm unit communications between the eyeballs. The droid hooted his understanding of the order. While Wedge waited for the droid to get him that information, he watched the B-Wings finish off the squints and head in toward the station. Wedge's monitor showed seven interceptors hanging dead in space. That number was impressive, even in spite of the ambush, because blowing ships up was far easier than taking their electrical systems down. While he appreciated the fact that the pilots had not been killed when their ships had been stopped, he knew the choice to use ion cannons on them had been made for practical rather than altruistic reasons. Each of those pilots will be debriefed, and what they know will be added to our store of information concerning Zinj. It is entirely possible some or all of them served on the Iron Fist, and learning about the ship's condition is of vital importance. It represents the core of Zinj's might and will let us determine how truly dangerous he is. The rebel fighters all converged on the Empress-class space station with the Y-Wings in the lead. While ungainly, the Y-Wings were still not easy targets to hit. The station's weaponry sent energy beams shooting out at the attackers, but the incoming fighters supplied three targets for each weapon system, overwhelming the crews defending the station. Added to that was the ability of fighters to approach while using part of the station to shield them from many of the lasers. Using targeting data supplied by other ships, the fighters were able to pop from cover and fire at targets that had previously been unseen. The swooping, diving, rolling, and climbing cloud of fighters boiled around the station like insects around a bright light. Direct hits on a fighter would make the craft break off and loop away until its shields were recharged, then head back in. The battle to defend the station was lost from the very start, but the fear Zinge inspired in his people clearly kept them fighting long after it made sense for them to do so. Minoc beeped, and Wedge saw a comm unit frequency come up on his monitor. He punched the number into his comm unit and keyed his microphone. Starfighter Flight. This is Commander Antilles of the New Republic Armed Forces. If you power down your weapons, we'll consider you non-combatants. The same offer goes for the people on the station. I copy, Antilles. The voice coming back to Wedge through the comm unit had the metallic echo commonly injected in speech by Imperial equipment. My flight is disarming itself. I'll pass your message on to the station chief. Valsil Tor. Obliged, Starfighter. Wedge checked his sensors for hostiles as he waited for a return message. Antilles. Tor has the message and is powering down his weapons. The station is yours. Be careful, though. He's a wily old Twi'lek. Wedge smiled. Though the communications gear had robbed the voice of any humanity, it couldn't kill the personality in it. He might have been amazed that someone who had just been shooting at him and his people would so quickly offer helpful advice, but he'd long since learned that warriors from all sides of any conflict had more in common than not. I copy the advice. I appreciate it. One thing, Antilles. Yes? If we surrender to you, will you haul us out of here? Don't want to be around when the Iron Fist gets here? Not especially. No surprise that. Unlike the starfighters the Rebellion used, the TIE fighters were not equipped with hyperdrives. TIEs traveled between battles in the bellies of ships like the Iron Fist. The flight of starfighters was trapped unless Wedge arranged transport for them out of the system. Zinj had a reputation for being short-tempered, so leaving them behind was tantamount to murdering them, and Wedge had no desire to have their murders on his conscience. Starfighter, surrendering to me means you'll lose your ship. That's a problem, Antilles. We're all mercenaries. We lose our ships and we starve. The TIE pilot fell silent for a moment, then continued. Of course, no reason to eat and live if you can't fly. I understand, Starfighter. 
Wedge thought for a moment. I have an idea. If you hire on as guards to fly cover for one of the freighters coming in, you can get out of here and be free. Freighters? Coming for the Bacta. Bacta. So that's what we were guarding. And you can continue guarding it all the way to Coruscant, where it's needed. Give me your word you won't fight against the New Republic in the future, and you've got a deal. You have it, Antilles. Right on cue, a dozen and a half bulk freighters and specialty haulers started coming out of hyperspace and cruising in toward the space station. Most were blocky, squared-off craft that had seen better days. But a few were more elegant ships whose very designs were tributes to the romanticism of space travel. One, a converted Baudo-class yacht, glided through the void like a metal simulacrum of the Corellian sea creature that gave the ship her name. Starfighter, the Baudo-class yacht there is the Pulsar Skate. I'll have the captain contact you on this frequency. Stand by. I copy. Wedge opened a channel to the skate. Skate, this is Rogue Leader. Mirax here, Wedge. We're fourth in line to head in. What can I do for you? We have a flight of four eyeballs orbiting. They've left Zinja's service and need a ride out of here. Will you? Sure. Not the first time I've hauled a ship for you. No, the first one was Corin. Thanks, Mirax. Minoc is sending you their comm unit frequency, so I'll leave the arrangements to you. It will give me something to do while I'm waiting. I copy. Wedge glanced at the chronographic display in the corner of his monitor. When we get back home, you and I will sit down and talk, yes? Weariness washed through Mirax's voice. I'll have to offload the cargo first. Then maybe I can sleep. Haven't been doing much of that lately. I will call you when I'm functional again. Promise. I promise. And keep that promise, or I talk your father into coming out of retirement by telling him you're moping over the death of his worst enemy's son. Oh, Wedge, that's cruel. Light static hissed in Wedge's ears as Mirax's voice broke. There's no reason I shouldn't mourn for Corin. Agreed but you don't have to do it alone. That's a burden we all share, got it? I copy. Resignation tinged with relief flooded her words. See you back on Coruscant. I am counting on it. Wedge looked out at the station and his squadron patrolling around it. And, miracle of miracles, it looks like everyone is going to make it back home again. 8. Corin knew that once again being in the cockpit of a fighter should have made him happy, but it did not. He could find no fault with the fighter nor with being given a patrol mission. He'd done enough of those to expect boredom, and yet even that wasn't giving him a problem. Just to be flying again was enough to override boredom. The fact was, he realized, that he was unhappy. Something was gnawing away at him inside. Something was wrong, and there was no way he could ignore it. It created an anxiety in him that was out of all proportion with what he was doing. It felt as if he weren't involved in a patrol at all, but in some other mission with a hidden agenda he knew nothing about. Nemesis 1, report. 1 is clear, Control. The voice coming through the comm unit betrayed no hint of deception or urgency, but Corrin couldn't shake the sickening feeling that he was being manipulated. He had a natural aversion to being used, and he could feel unseen hands all over him, pointing him in a certain direction for reasons he could not fathom. He was surprised to find himself less resentful of their agenda, whatever it was, than of being manipulated. I'm reasonable. I don't shy away from difficult tasks. I do what I am asked to do within reason. Didn't I do that? His thoughts dead-ended 
as he realized he couldn't summon up specific memories to back up his argument. He knew he had performed many dangerous missions, but he couldn't pinpoint them. His inability to do so wouldn't have concerned him, and in fact almost did not accept that he kept feeling like a hologram being processed by someone else's computer. Nemesis 1, we have two contacts on the heading of 270 degrees. They are 10 kilometers distant. They are hostile. You are free to engage and terminate them. As ordered. Corin punched up the data on the incoming ships and displayed it over his monitor. Two ties. The starfighters inspired no fear in him, and he would have viewed them with utter detachment, except that a random thought shot off through his brain. Two ties aren't nearly as deadly as a single Tycho. The connection seemed entirely logical to Corin. The similar sounds created a link. The fact that Tycho Sel Chu had been an Imperial pilot who flew ties reinforced it. Corin knew Tycho had betrayed Rogue Squadron, and Corin had been determined to see him pay. If I weren't here, I'd be there, taking care of Tycho. Before he could begin to wonder where there was, Control's voice came through the comm link again. We have additional information on the incoming ships. Transmitting now. The image on the monitor shifted from a TIE starfighter to an X-wing. An additional line of data beneath the fighter's image informed Corin the ship was flown by Captain T. Selchu. A jolt of adrenaline pulsed through his body then slammed into his brain. He couldn't believe his luck. The coincidence of being able to fly against Tycho and avenge Rogue Squadron was incredible. And I will make the most of it. Korn inverted the TIE interceptor he flew and dove. The X-Wings started to come after him, vectoring in on his belly, so he inverted again, then pulled through a climbing loop to starboard. He soared as the X-Wings dove, neither side wasting laser energy when the chances of hitting were so small. Corin kept tightening the loop into a spiral that emphasized the squint's greater maneuverability, then streaked away to underscore its superior speed as well. A light flicked on within the heads-up display, indicating one of the X-Wings was trying for a proton torpedo target lock but a quick climb, roll, and twisting dive broke the lock and brought Corin out on a vector toward Tycho's X-Wing. Corin sideslipped the interceptor to starboard, then rolled up on the left wing and climbed in toward Tycho. He flipped his lasers from quad to dual fire, assuming he'd have to use multiple shots in multiple passes to bring Tycho down. He led the X-Wing, anticipating Tycho's break, then hastily snapped off a shot that splashed energy over Tycho's shields as the interceptor overshot its target. No reaction. That isn't like Tycho at all. Corin rolled up on the right stabilizer, climbed into a loop, then rolled over and out to port. Another inversion took him into a dive, but his scanners showed the X-Wings hadn't stayed with him past the first maneuver, much less through the second. Corin shivered. They're handling like TIE starfighters, not like X-Wings. And the pilot flying that first one isn't Tycho. He switched his targeting computer over to the second ship and saw that X-Wing was listed as being flown by Curtin Lure. An immediate desire to vape that ship filled him, but it did not deflect him from thinking. In fact, the vehemence of his feelings about Lure swept him past the fact that Lure and Tycho had been in collusion on Coruscant. It carried him far enough that he recalled Lure didn't know how to fly any spaceships at all, much less starfighters. Lure can't be there. The chance that Tycho and Lure would show up where I could attack and kill them is unbelievable. 
Whereas before he had taken great delight in the coincidence, now it became evidence that he was being manipulated. The link between a tie and Tycho had been made in his mind before Tycho showed up as a pilot. While he knew inferring causality from that relationship was not strictly logical, his being manipulated meant it was more than possible. Tycho is an enemy. So he was placed in one fighter. Another enemy was plucked from a list of my enemies and placed in the second fighter. More anger flared through Corn and battered aside the blockages in his brain that had kept him thinking of nothing outside the cockpit. The apparent insertion of personal enemies into his situation told Corin two things. First off, I'm in a simulator. And second, someone knows enough about me to know who my enemies are. Pitting me against my enemies gives me some wish fulfillment, which is a good thing. It rewards behavior. But I have to ask myself, is flying an interceptor against X-Wings behavior for which I want to be rewarded? His stomach shrank and hardened into a rock that threatened to explode volcanically. I'm flying an imp ship against rebels. I don't want to do that. Korn immediately realized that his only enemies, the remnants of the Empire, would want him to feel good about attacking rebels. Yet few imps would take the time or make the effort to manipulate him that way. Some would imprison him, and the rest would just kill him. Except one. Isan Isard. Injecting her into the jumble of thoughts bouncing around his brain immediately started to impose order on his mind. She was known and feared for her ability to warp rebels and turn them against friends and family. She had been successful with Tycho Selchu, and he was not the only success story to come out of her Lusankia prison. Her altered agents had wrought havoc among the Emperor's enemies, and his death had done nothing to cause Iceheart to curtail her operations. The fog in Korn's brain began to evaporate. He remembered having met Isard after his capture. She'd vowed to transform him into a tool of the Emperor's vengeance. This simulator run, and the one before it, clearly was designed to get him to attack rebel symbols. Subsequent sessions would further crush his resistance, training him to greater and greater levels of efficiency while turning him against everyone he knew, loved, and respected. She would make me over into the human equivalent of the plague she unleashed on Coruscant. Corin shook his head, then raised his hands from the simulator's steering yoke and yanked his helmet off. Electrodes taped to his head pulled away rather abruptly taking some hair with them, but he ignored the pain. The electrodes fed my brainwave patterns to a computer. The patterns were compared to data gathered from interrogations, so the computer could recognize what I was thinking about and project the proper clues into the simulation. Very good. He pulled the respiration mask from his face and let it dangle against his chest. This is Nemesis 1. The game is over. I won't betray my people. The star field on the screen in front of Corin vanished. In its place, he saw Isan Isard's head and shoulders, her mismatched eyes, the left one a fiery red and the right one an ice blue, added venom to the woman's steely expression. Her sharp, slender features might have made her seem beautiful to some, but the fear her anger stabbed into his heart made her more than ugly to Corin. Her long black hair had been pulled back into a ponytail, yet she had let her white temple locks remain unbound, as if that girlish affectation would somehow soften her image. You are under the impression, Corin Horn, that this little victory is significant, 
and hampers my efforts in some way. It does not. An eyebrow arched over her arctic eye. You worked with the Corellian security force, so you can understand how powerful certain interrogation techniques can be. What you have endured so far is little more than testing. And I passed. From your perspective, that might seem true. Her eyes sharpened. From mine, it merely means you have reclassified yourself. You will require more time than others I have worked with in the past. But here at Lusankia, time is abundant. Corin shrugged. Good. Then I'll have abundant time to plan my escape. I doubt it. She sighed as if what she was about to say hurt her in some way. Were you easy to train, you would find your stay here pleasant. As you are difficult, the next step is for me to determine if you know anything I consider valuable. Unfortunately, this means sifting through a lot of things I don't want to know. I hope your life has been interesting, because my technicians have been known to resort to cruelty when they are bored. They'll learn nothing from me. Isard frowned. Please, Horn, skip the bluster. We will start with a level four narco interrogation and work our way down to level one if we must. You know you'll tell us whatever we want to know. Sheer terror froze the lump in Korn's stomach solid. With a level four interrogation session, he'd be remembering things his mother had forgotten while she was carrying him in her womb. I will have no secrets. Hundreds of images flitted through his mind as he sorted valuable memories from the casual ones. This process, while agonizing, also brought a smile to his face. Gil Bastra, the man who had created a series of identities for Corrin to use after he fled from Corellia, had made sure the identities took Corrin out into the outlier worlds. From Lure, they know everything about my days with Corsac. Thanks to Gil, there's very little valuable information I can give her. I was out of circulation until I joined Rogue Squadron, and I don't know enough about the rebellion to hurt it. I see your smile, Horn. You may feel bold enough to smile now, but things will change. Isard herself smiled, and Corrin found it a most forbidding thing. When we are finished with you, smiles will be but a memory and a painful one at that. Nine. Wedge laughed aloud, telling himself he was laughing at the irony of feeling nervous, not because of being nervous. Here he was, a celebrated hero and the sole survivor of both Death Star runs, conqueror of Coruscant and leader of the most feared fighter squadron in the galaxy. And at Ayala Wasiri's door, he felt nervous. Enough ice water ran in his veins, so the rumors went, to replenish Coruscant's polar caps. Yet he found himself clearing his voice and hesitating before he pushed the buzzer button at her door. On the way over from Squadron Headquarters, he had convinced himself he wasn't going to be asking her out on a date, really. He'd spent the previous hour being harangued by Arisi Dlerit concerning the Vratix terrorist and his whereabouts after the raid on Warlord Zinj's Bacta store. He'd done his best over and over again to explain to her that he had no reports about the Thyferan native, but promised to pass notice of her interest up to General Kraken. That really was all he could do, but Arisi took a lot of convincing on that point. The experience had been draining. There had been moments when he considered just cutting her off and ordering her out of his office. But he could tell her concern about the Vratix was based on her conviction that the insectoid creature was a terrorist and a potential hazard to anyone who came in contact with it. He thought Arisi's reaction might have been born from her frustration at not having been able to do anything to prevent Corrin's death. 
by making the terrorist her responsibility, she might prevent another tragedy, thereby atoning for her lack of action in Corrin's case. Wedge found her motive noble, but her insistence exhausting. Corrin's death and the misery of millions on Coruscant had everyone in the squadron worn thin, and being dismissive of Arissi's concerns would not help the situation. Corrin's death had likewise affected Ayala deeply. She had been Corrin's partner in the Corellian security force and had fled Corellia at the same time he had. Her flight had brought her to Coruscant, where she joined up with the rebel underground. Her reunion with Corrin had been a joyous occasion. It had been easy for Wedge to see how they complemented each other and must have worked well as a team. Those qualities that made her well-suited to working with Corrin were qualities Wedge found attractive. She was thoughtful and stable, yet possessed of a good sense of humor and a fierce loyalty to her friends and to justice. Unfortunately, her loyalty made her most zealous in helping the prosecution find evidence against Tycho Selchu. But she approached the search so openly that Wedge couldn't find fault with her in doing her duty as she saw it. He pressed the door buzzer, then tugged at the cuffs of his jacket sleeves. I'm not asking her out. I'm just here as a friend, visiting a friend. Wedge shook his head. For the past ten years, since the death of his parents and through his association with the rebellion, he'd really given little thought to romance and relationships. He'd certainly found companionship with a number of rebel women, but he'd not found a single companion, a partner, the way Han Solo or Tycho Selchu had. He couldn't explain why not, nor did he let it bother him. The nature of the rebellion and his assignments meant planning for anything long-term was silly, and avoiding relationships meant the chances of getting hurt when the unspeakable happened were much less. He'd seen Leia over the time Han Solo had been encased in carbonite. She had been driven almost to the point of recklessness in her attempts to free her beloved. He laughed. Entering Jabba's palace meant she was driven beyond recklessness. While he envied Han Solo, the passion with which he was loved, he dreaded the idea of being plagued by the pain Leia had known. The door to the apartment slid open, and Wedge's nervousness slackened when Ayala smiled. Wedge, this is a surprise. A pleasant one, I hope. He glanced down at his hands for a moment, then back up into her brown eyes. I should have called before heading over, but I was going to get something to eat, and I thought, well, I hate eating alone, and... The brown-haired woman's smile widened for a moment and carried on up into her eyes then shrank as if the corners of her mouth had slammed into walls and were rebounding. I think you'd better come in. She turned away from the door, and he followed the lithe woman down a short corridor into a modest-sized parlor. The door closed automatically behind him, cutting off the brightest source of light and sinking the room into a gray gloom. The man sitting in the corner chair looked every bit as if he were constructed from shadow threads and slivers of gray. The sharpness of his features accentuated the gauntness of his frame. His shoulders and knees poked like knobs against the gray fabric of the jumpsuit he wore. A few strands of black hair wove through the white and gray combed over his largely bald head, but did nothing to disguise the shape of the skull beneath it. In fact, were it not for the spark of life burning in the man's brown eyes, Wedge would have believed him to be a mummified worker resurrected from some tomb in the bowels of Coruscant. Ayala folded her arms across her chest. Commander Wedge Antilles, this is Derek Wasiri. He is my husband. Husband? Wedge covered his surprise by taking a step forward and extended his right hand toward Derek. My pleasure, sir. 
Derek inclined his head forward and shook Wedge's hand with a long-fingered grip that was firm and even strong, though the strength faded quickly. The honor is mine, Commander. Your exploits bring glory to your world and fellow Corellians. Glory wasn't our goal, sir. Nonetheless, the man smiled, then let his hand drop back toward his lap. Forgive me, Commander. At another point I would engage you in a lively discussion, but now I am somewhat fatigued. I understand. Ayala walked to her husband's side and gently rested a hand on his shoulder. The imps caught Derek up in a sweep about a year ago. They interrogated him, broke his identity, then imprisoned him. Six months ago or so, they set up a bio-research project and made Derek part of the slave labor force. They only used humans because the lab produced what we know to be the Krytos virus. She gave his shoulder a squeeze. General Kraken's people had Derek in quarantine, then debriefed him. I only learned he was alive when they brought him here four hours ago. I should be going, then, and leave you two alone. No. The old man raised his right hand and gently patted Ayala's hand. I have long been among Imperials and other slaves. It is good to have normal people here to ease me back. Wedge coughed lightly into his hand. I don't think you'll find my life normal at all. Ayala laughed politely. Nor mine. How fortunate. Normal can be quite boring. Derek's head came up and he fixed Wedge with a steady stare. And I want you to know, Commander, if anything has happened between you and my wife, I bear neither of you malice. I have been dead for a year. While I dreamed of being alive again, I do not bear a grudge against those who lived while I was dead. Wedge held a hand up. First, no titles. Where they kept me, we joked that titles were for when we were once again people. I use it to remind me I am again a man. And I use it out of profound respect for what you have done. Don't. I'm just Wedge. Nothing I've done is the equal of your enduring imperial captivity, so titles don't apply here. Second, Ayala is intelligent, a wonder to work with, a joy to be around, and above all else, loyal to her friends. In fact, save one thing, she's just the sort of woman I could see myself growing old with. That one thing is this. She's married to you. Her loyalty to you, her fidelity, has never been in question. You are undoubtedly one of the luckiest men on this planet. As he spoke, his mind raced on through thoughts and dreams of what he might have had with Ayala had Derek not reappeared. It seemed as if the life they would never share was flashing before his eyes even as his words killed it. The romantic in him just wanted to hold on to how wonderful it would have been. But the pragmatist knew, from just looking at Derek, that things would have fallen apart in the end. Ayala had chosen Derek because he was a sanctuary. No matter what her life held in store for her, he was someone who would always be there to share her joys and ease her disappointments. Wedge realized that he could not have given her what Derek provided. It might have taken a long time for their relationship to destroy itself, and they might have overcome the difficulties. But Wedge knew he could never have been as perfect a match for her as Derek was. Someday I'll find someone. Wedge smiled. When I'm ready to settle down. Derek mirrored Wedge's smile and let his head sink back contentedly against the chair's padding. I'm glad Ayala found friends as generous and honorable as you are, Wedge. I do feel quite fortunate. And I bet you're happy to be free. Happy? Yes, though captivity wasn't as brutal as imagined. They can only control your body, not your mind. 
Derek shrugged slowly, as if the effort were all but beyond his ability. I knew I would be free someday. That's what Tycho says. Who? Ayala looked down at her husband. The man who killed Corin. The man who is on trial for killing Corin. Wedge corrected her. Your wife is working with the prosecution team. Working to find the truth, mind you. Ayala gave Wedge a frank glare. There's ample evidence to bind him over for trial and to convict him. And blasted little uncovered so far to acquit him. Wedge held his hands up. However, discussing that case was not my purpose for coming over here. Derek's bushy brows met over the bridge of his hooked nose. You think this Tycho is innocent? I know it. Tycho Selchu is as much a victim of the Empire as you were. Ayala gave Derek's hand a gentle squeeze. Tycho was once captured by the imps. He's been working for them since his supposed escape. The Wedge would tell you he's been neatly framed. Derek looked up at her. And you know Wedge is wrong? Her immediate response died in a moment of open-mouthed hesitation. Ayala's gaze flicked up at Wedge, then back down again. We have found a lot to indicate Captain Selchu was an Imperial agent of extreme resourcefulness. But there are gaps in the evidence. Wedge smiled slowly. Everything that condemns Tycho is available. But those things that would acquit him have vanished. Given the timing, the only force that could provide with one hand and take away with the other is the Empire. Derek disengaged his hand from Ayala's and pressed it, fingertip to fingertip, against the other hand. This Tycho must be something to earn such loyalty from you. I feel about Tycho what Ayala feels about Corin, hence the impasse between us. Impasse indeed. Still, Captain Selchu sounds fascinating. Derek's voice became wistful, and Ayala straightened up. Don't even think it, Derek. Wedge raised an eyebrow. What's the matter? Anger creased Ayala's brow and put snap into her voice. He's going to meddle. The older man wheezed out a laugh and punctuated with a wet cough. Meddle, is it? You see, Wedge, my vocation in life is to seek out people who fascinate me. I study them. I try to understand them. I share what understanding I have with others. Ayala's brown eyes narrowed. On Corellia, he found a defendant in a case fascinating. He got to know her and decided she was innocent. Was she? Derek nodded solemnly. He kept after Corn and me constantly asking us little questions that forced us to look beyond the scope of our investigation. She had been framed, but we got the guys who were responsible in the end. She frowned at her husband. That was a different case. It wasn't on Coruscant, and you weren't weak as an Ewok cub at the time. You need to recover. I will, dearest. Wedge smiled as he heard all manner of meaning in those words. Ayala's sigh meant she heard at least some of them, and knew nothing short of house arrest would keep Derek from meeting Tycho. Derek will make sure Ayala doesn't let her desire to avenge Corin stop short of discovering the truth of what caused his death. Having a hobby will likely speed your recovery. A hobby? Very good. This man's hobby is going to be my nightmare, Ayala shook her head. Antilles, didn't you say something about food when you arrived here? I did indeed. Wedge jerked a thumb up toward the ceiling. There is an Ithorian tap calf about thirty levels up that is supposed to offer some fairly exotic vegetable matter. And then... He stopped as a tone sounded from the comlink clipped to the collar of his jacket. Hang on a second. He pulled the comm link free and flicked it on. Antilles, go ahead. Wedge, it's Mirax. Finally awake? Wedge nodded toward Ayala. 
It's Mirax. Ask her if she wants to join us for food. Will do. Mirax, I'm at Ayala's apartment. She wants to know. I heard. But it'll have to be another time. Mirax's tone dripped seriousness. I have a problem. It's on the skate, and I need you to get down here. Just you. Wedge frowned. Those flyers from Zinge should have been taken into custody a long time ago. How bad is it? Are your riders back and causing trouble? No, no, not that. That I could handle. Mirax sighed. Look, you know I usually haul rare items for folks, right? Right. Well, at the station I picked up something that's very rare. And as near as I can tell, if I don't get rid of it in the right way, the New Republic will shake itself apart and a scant few people will be alive to start rebuilding the future. 10. Gavin Darklighter felt his gorge rising as the miasmal stench from the darkened hovel stabbed through his nostrils and into his brain. He reeled away from the doorway and fell to his knees, puking up what felt like every last bit of food he'd eaten since his return to Coruscant. His stomach muscles clenched again and again, wringing his guts empty, but doing nothing to soothe the prickly sensation in the back of his throat that prompted him to heave once more. A piercing wail from a female Gamorian drilled through his skull and reminded him where he was and why he was there. Gavin coughed once and spat, then croaked a command to the black M3PO droid behind him. Emtre, don't let them go in there. Tell her I'll do all I can. Gavin wiped his mouth with his hand, then weakly crawled up the hovel's exterior wall. He pressed his back against the ferrocrete and slowly straightened up. He coughed again, and his body tried to make him heave yet again, but he clenched his jaw and refused to vomit. Never seen one that bad before. Though he hoped he never would again see such a case, he knew that was one hope that had no chance of becoming reality. The M3PO droid succeeded in guiding the Gamorian female and her tusky children to the other side of the walkway, then turned back toward Gavin. The droid's non-standard clamshell head, a refit from a spaceport control droid, canted slightly to the left. Is there anything I can do for you, Master Darklighter? I'll be fine in a minute, Emtray. Just keep them back. Gavin again spat, trying to rid his mouth of the sour taste. Ask her when she last heard from her husband. The protocol droid swiveled his head around and grunted the question out to the Gamorian female. She replied in subdued and broken tones, which Emtray translated for Gavin. She says she and the children had been visiting kin elsewhere. The last time she spoke to her husband, it was by Comlink. He had sniffles, but was not alarmed. I'm gathering, from the words she's using, sir, that there was some domestic discord, which is why a lapse in communication would not be surprising. Got it, Emtray. How long was she gone from here? A standard month, sir. She left well before the liberation. Gavin nodded. A month meant... The chances she'd been infected by her husband were nil. If she had been, she'd already be showing signs of the Krytos virus. Tell her to get to a back to center for evaluation. She doesn't want the kids sick. I've told her, sir. She wants to know if Tolra will recover. Gavin sighed and pushed himself away from the wall. Tell her he's very sick. The prognosis is not good, but we will do what we can. Then call Asir and tell her... We'll need a clean team here. He forced himself to smile. And Emtre, tell Tolra's wife she did the right thing. Tolra was brave and smart, and together they saved many people. The words rang hollow in his ears, but he knew they would not in hers. What he said was correct. When the Gamorian in the hovel recognized how sick he had become, he sealed his home's entrances and scrambled the lock codes, preventing anyone else from getting in and becoming infected. In that, he had indeed saved many lives. Except for his own. Gavin forced his fists to unclench. 
had the Gamorian used his comm link to summon medical help, he might have been saved. That he was lucid enough to entomb himself meant that he was not so far gone that back to therapy couldn't have helped him. He needn't have become what Gavin had seen in shadows. The pilot realized the blame lay not entirely with the Gamorian himself. The black market price for Bacta was astronomical, so far out of reach for the average citizens that they could not imagine there was any Bacta available for them. Those who did summon help, or had it summoned for them, were often so far gone that no therapy could help, so they never returned. As a result, other citizens saw the medevac units as thinly disguised extermination units that took the sick away and destroyed them. Ignorance is killing these people. Gavin forced himself to step forward and re-enter the Gamorian's hubble. The fetid stink returned to his nose and found accompaniment in the horrible sights and sounds that greeted him. The single-room hovel itself was scarcely larger than his own room in the squadron headquarters, and he found that a bit cramped for one. It had two doors, the one he'd opened using a lock descrambling unit and a back door. A heating plate and water spigot to the left of the doorway marked the extent of the dwelling's kitchen facilities. The refresher station stood farther along that wall in the corner. Spattered blood covered all of it, sprayed along the floor, up the walls, and across the ceiling. It had dried and taken on a black hue, making the room look as if a shadow had exploded. The explosion's epicenter lay in the back corner on a raised black platform that glistened in what little light made it past Gavin. A wet, gurgling sound pulsed arrhythmically from that corner. On the platform, restrained by bedding twisted about him while in the throes of agony, the mortal shell of the Gamorian named Tolra somehow clung to life. Gavin could see where the flesh had split, allowing leg and arm bones to protrude. The skin itself had thinned to a green-gray translucency and hung in ragged ribbons from ribs and fingers. The Gamorian seemed to sense Gavin's presence because he turned to look at him. With a thick sucking sound, like cold grease being slathered over machine gears, the skull turned toward him while the fleshy sack encompassing it did not. The Gamorian's horns and tusks gashed his own skin, then the thick muscles on the creature's neck snapped, leaving the massive skull to loll unnaturally in a puddle of viscous tissue. A chill settled over Gavin. Though he knew Tolra was dead, and that the disease had long since eaten away any trace of sapience, he nodded toward the Gamorian. You saved them. You did it. May the Force be with you. Shivering, he turned and walked from the room. He sat down outside and stripped the film plast covering off his boots, then tossed them back through the darkened doorway. He didn't bother to look up when a shadow fell over him. He's dead. Asir crouched down beside him. The clean team will get here shortly. Are you all right? Gavin thought a moment before he answered. I will be. And I think that scares me. No reason it should. I think there is. He jerked a thumb toward the hovel. There is a Gamorian in there who has been turned into a mass of jelly. The disease killed him, but it did so in a way that didn't let him die until he could experience every fragment of pain possible. There's nothing left to him, but he was still breathing when I went in there. He was so tough. He probably lasted longer than a week in the end stages of the disease. The Bothan stroked Gavin's cheek. He fought the disease. That's good. Sure. But the fact that we can find something noble in this seems twisted. He shook his head. I've seen more death in my time with Rogue Squadron than I have ever seen before. 
but nothing was so hideous as this. A year ago, I would have run screaming. Now I just clean my boots and wait for guys with sterilizer units to show up. I'm changing, and I'm not sure I like it. Asir smiled gently at him. It's called maturing, Gavin, and not everyone likes it. Now me, I think you're maturing very well. Gavin half coughed a laugh. Thanks, but I still have to wonder if it's right that we can see something like that and just continue on. We continue on, my dear, because we must. Asir's voice developed an edge. The Gamorian? He summoned up the strength to lock others out and protect them. That was good. You and I, though, have a different mission. This disease doesn't appear to affect our species, so we have volunteered to help out during this public health crisis, but that is not our primary purpose here. Our mission is to fly our X-Wings, to locate and to destroy the kind of monsters who would do this kind of thing to others. Doing that requires all the maturity we can muster. I know. He rubbed a hand along her spine, then looked over to where m -tray was conversing with an MDO and two men carrying portable plasma incinerator units. The droid would take samples. Then the men would burn everything in the hovel, including the first five millimeters of ferrocrete, to a white ash that would be vacuumed up and disposed of safely. Gavin let Asir help him to his feet. You're right, of course. I hope we can accomplish our mission. If we don't, I'm afraid we'll have to take Coruscant down to bedrock. And I don't think even that will erase the scourge of the Empire from the galaxy. I think... Even stormtroopers would find my men terrifyingly efficient. From the dark security of the Gravcar's interior, Curtin Lure watched as four special intelligence operatives, clad in civilian garb, approached the building's door. As huge and imposing as they were, they moved with a lethal fluidity their armor normally hid. Almost casually, one of them placed a thermite boring charge on the door lock and set it, then accepted a blaster carbine from a compatriot and flattened himself against the building's wall. A red light blinked three times on the thermite charge. Then a smoke-shrouded gout of white fire burst to hissing life. The harsh light transformed the shadowed Imperial Center Street into a chiaroscuro landscape burned clean of imperfections, but still full of menace. One of the operatives punched a hooked pry bar through the center of the fire and yanked the door open. Then his three compatriots dashed through. The blue backlight of stun fire strobed momentarily through the doorway and gaps in the window shading. Lure waited for a moment, then saw two more flashes. A human figure appeared in the doorway and nodded in his direction then retreated into the shadows of the building's interior. Lure opened the grav car's door and emerged. He gathered a cloak about himself and pulled the hood up to conceal his face from incidental observation. He strode forward purposefully, but he imagined himself a pale imitation of Darth Vader. Tall and skeletally slender, with dark hair, he had been told he resembled a young Grand Moff Tarkin. While that comparison had been one he had used to his advantage, he would have preferred to inspire Vadarian terror in those with whom he dealt. He squeezed past the two operatives at the doorway and stepped over the drooling Ithorian lying in the center of the antechamber. Beyond it, through a short corridor and past a third operative, he arrived in a room that resembled a rodent nest more than it did a human dwelling. It stank of mildew and old, musty sweat, though the occupant's new terror added piquant elements to the room's stale bouquet. Lure looked down at the small, balding man pinned to the stained mattress by the muzzle of a blaster. 
your surroundings are so miserable. I am almost moved to pity you, Nartlo. But then, pity is wasted on the dead, isn't it? What are you talking about? The man's brown eyes bulged with terror. I don't know you. What did I do? True, you do not know me. But you have brokered some cure for friends of mine. It has been selling at a high price, but they tell me that you have told them the market has crashed. At the same time, they noted that the supply of cure you returned to them had gone from 95% purity to 75% purity. Lure shook his head slowly, mournfully. My friends feel you have lied to and cheated them. No, no, I didn't do that. Nartlo tried to claw his way into a sitting position, but the operative beside the makeshift bed kept him rooted in one spot. I drew off some of the Bacta as a sample, but a deal went bad and I lost it. I didn't figure they'd believe I lost it, so I tried to cover up what I'd done. I'm sorry. And stupid if you expect me to believe a story that was ancient when the old Republic was born. Lure let anger into his voice and won a groan from his victim. Because of the surveillance he had on Nartlo, Lure did know that the story was not wholly false. Some of the Bacta had been lost when a deal went sour, but only some. The rest of the missing cure had been donated to an alien pleasure house for the employee's own use. Nartlo had spent a week basking in their considerable gratitude. Tell me we won't find a Rhodian concubine's sucker marks on your back if we strip off your shirt. Nartlo accompanied his curling up into a fetal ball with a low moan. I owed some favors. You gained some favors more than you owed. Lure took a step closer to the bed, forcing Nartlo to crane his neck back to look up at him. Now you owe me favors. Anything you want. Anything. Good. Lure turned to the right and nodded at the operative menacing the small man. The operative withdrew a step, and Nartlo coughed as the pressure eased on his ribcage. You told my friends that the market for cure had crashed. Explain. The rebels picked up a lot of cure. I don't know when or where, but it was recent and was really very quiet. Rogue Squadron was involved, though. I know that much. I've been selling some of your cure to people who do business with people who work for people in the Provisional Council, see? They've been buying to be able to keep themselves and their supporters healthy, no matter the plague doesn't seem to affect them. Lure smiled within the dark sanctum of his hood. The New Republic government had put into place programs that were designed to be fair to the victims of the Krytos virus. The scarcity of Bacta meant virtually all of the public supply went to individuals who were infected with the goal being to save their lives. By curing them, public health officials could limit the spread of the disease. Others, mostly those from uninfected populations, argued that a prophylactic use of Bacta to prevent the spread to new populations would be best. Public health officials argued that there was no proof pre-exposure back to therapy could prevent someone from becoming infected with the virus, but that did nothing to stem the desire to get back to and use it as a preventative medicine. Nartlow swiped at spittle, flecking the corners of his mouth. Seems there's going to be enough now so the provosts think they won't need their own supply. Lure frowned. Impossible. It would take a decade of Bacta cartel production to satisfy the demand here. Could be, sir, could be. But right now the word is out that the New Republic's government has things under control. It's a lie, of course, but a good one. Lure slowly sank down onto his haunches, letting his cloak pool around him. You believe this Bacta supply exists? I think some does, sir. Yes, sir. You will learn about it, all about it.
Nartlow's eyes grew large again. I don't know as I can, sir. Security is tight. You owe me, little man. Lure's growl cowed Nartlow. You will go to your contacts, and this time offer to buy Cure at a good price. What if they don't want to sell? Tell them that they will find exposure of their previous black market BACTA dealings rather painful and embarrassing. If that is insufficient, perhaps making an example of one or more of them would be persuasive. I can and will do that. Lure nodded toward the operative to his right. Blasters have more than just a stun setting on them, you know. Nutlow licked at dry lips with a dry tongue. Yes, sir, I know. Good. I want to know how much they have, how long they think their supply will last. I need to estimate when the price will climb again. I can understand that, sir. And with that information, I can begin to project how large a facility they would need to store it, and how best to destroy it. Lure began to smile. I could even just spread the rumor that they have more than enough Bacta to cure everyone, then reveal the true amount they have in their stores. The gap between what is hoped for and what is real should create a lot of unrest. That is a suitable fallback plan, and one which I can pursue while seeking out and destroying the containment facility. And, not low, you will try to find out whatever you can about their storage, transport, and distribution network. If I do go buying more Bacta as a hedge against shortage, I would prefer to go directly to the source. I would like to cut out the middlemen. No offense intended. No, sir, none taken. Good, good. I'm glad we understand each other. Lure straightened up again. I will be interested in hearing what you can find out. Nartlow nodded enthusiastically. You can count on me. I am counting on you. See to it that you do not fail me. Yes, sir. The small man shivered. But, sir, I was wondering. Yes. How do I? Lure laughed in as sinister a manner as he could manage. We will find you. Have something for me in two days. But that's not enough time. But it is all the time you have, not low. Lure turned and swept from the room. The operatives crowded behind him, and the two at the door preceded him to his grav car. Lure climbed into the back. One of them got behind the controls, and the other three disappeared into the night. Drive. Inertial forces pushed Lure back into the car's plush upholstery. He began composing the report he would send off to Isan Isard. The fact that the rebellion had gotten its hands on a new supply of Bacta would not please her. She had wanted the demand for Bacta to bankrupt the rebellion, but Rogue Squadron's capture of more Bacta meant it was not nearly as pricey for the rebels as Iceheart desired. The only way to counteract that bit of luck was to locate and destroy the Bacta store which was exactly what he intended to do. The problem is that no matter how quickly I resolve this matter, it will not be quick enough for her. It occurred to him that her messages to him suffered little reduction in their venom, despite having to be recorded and transmitted instead of being delivered in person. He would have thought that the distance between them would have insulated him from her criticisms, but it had not. She seemed to have a preternatural ability to point up to him errors he had made, no matter how slight, and that kept him constantly off balance. 
He realized that if he told her he was having some of his people train for a strike on the BACTA facility before he knew what the mission would take, she would point out that he was wasting time and resources. He decided he would put men into training for smaller missions that could serve as diversions, or that would, at the very least, provide the training framework upon which the BACTA strike mission could be built. Iceheart might maintain that he was wasting resources that could be better used to locate the BACTA facility in the first place. But trying to argue that stormtroopers could be used as spies was not the sort of blunder Isard would make. The grav car broke free of suburban roadway and shot up into the night sky. Countless towers flashed past, each lit as brilliantly as the fire of the thermite charge, but not nearly as harshly. He wondered how many of the people and aliens living in those towers were rejoicing over the secret word that their worries about the Krytos virus would soon be over? Many. Too many. Lure let his own laughter become a parody of the sound he imagined echoing through those towers. It struck him that laughter and sobbing were really not that different and decided that he would do his best to see to it that others gained first-hand knowledge of this insight. Before they die of the virus for which I will destroy the cure. 11. Admiral Akbar sat back in his council chair and tried to pull serenity from the cool mist drifting down over him. Grand Moff Tarkin, in one of his more expansive moods, had once described politics to him as soft warfare, the elegant duel of lightsabers instead of the thunder of turbo lasers. Tarkin, with that description, had given no evidence of finding political fights frustrating because of the posturing and the treacherous riptide shifts of allegiances, or the inability to come to grips with problems in a direct manner. Akbar had endured more reports on microeconomic fluctuations on planets he'd never heard of than any sapient creature could be expected to stand in one lifetime. Slowly, in working through the reports, Borsk Failure and Cientev were moving toward the matter that had been brooded about on the Provisional Council's staff level. Glancing over at the Bothan Counselor, Akbar could see a feral gleam in Failure's violet eyes. The Bothans thrive on this soft warfare. Akbar had already recognized in Failure a drive to lead, or, when he had been outmaneuvered, a desire to vault out in front to where the leaders stood, so he was placed among them. Akbar had seen similar tactics among warriors who sought promotion, but true warfare tended to deal with such ambition in a most lethal fashion. Mon Mothma nodded toward the Elam counselor. Thank you, Veronefra, for bringing us up to date on the economies of our newest worlds. Next on the agenda is the matter of Bacta. Borsk, you have a point to make? The cream-furred Bothan stood opposite Akbar. The recent mission, which has liberated a supply of Bacta and brought it here to Coruscant, is, of course, a great victory for us and a great boon to the people here. For that we owe much thanks and praise to Admiral Akbar and his staff. Their success also brings with it some burdens, not the least of which is the need to take precautions to prevent Warlord Zinj from exacting retribution from us. Akbar leaned forward. Forgive me for the interruption, Counselor Failure. But it strikes me that you are asking us to deal with the undertow before the wave has crested. Excuse me? Princess Leia smiled. I believe the Admiral is pointing out 
that the supply of Bacta brings with it far more pressing problems than a possible attack by warlord Zinge. More correctly, princess, I meant to say that because an attack by warlord Zinge has always been possible, both before and after our strike, there have long been plans in place to deal with such. I am more than willing to review those plans, but I think the core problem with Bacta needs to be addressed more quickly than the surface issue of Zinge. Trouble is a vast ocean, and for us, Bacta distribution is the issue lurking in the depths. The Bothan's fur rippled. There is indeed much to discuss on the matter of Bacta distribution. With the supply we now have, I think it should be possible to create centers for preventative therapy to stop the spread of the virus. My people tell me that an hour's missed therapy per week should be sufficient to destroy the virus before it has a chance to incubate. Creating centers that would allow that much treatment would go a long way toward quelling the fear that has gripped this world. Leia frowned. I've seen no such reports concerning missed therapy. The review of the data we captured from General Derricote's lab does not show evidence of any testing in that regard. In fact, the only data the Imperials had on the Krytos virus showed massive amounts of Bacta would be required to cure patients, having the effect of draining our supplies of Bacta. There is no reason to suppose creating the centers you advocate would do anything but waste more Bacta. Ah, Leia, I would have expected more compassion from you. Thalia glanced down at her. If it were humans who were dropping dead of this plague, you would be the first to advocate creation of these centers. Leia's dark eyes flashed coldly. And you think I do not support your plan because it would save non-humans? I would like to think better of you, but I know you have various constituencies to worry about. Like Admiral Akbar, you would like to see some of the Bacta reserved for use by our military. I understand this, for saving the lives of our valiant warriors is certainly commendable. I fear, however, your hedge against the unseen means there are countless individuals who might sicken and die and never get a chance to enter the military and fight for their freedom. Doman Barris raised a hand. I think, Counselor Failure, you do Princess Leia and every other human member of the Council a disservice by even hinting that opposition to your plan is based on an anti-alien bias. Ah, but even you are prey to it, Counselor Barris. You refer to us as alien, and the Princess called us non-human. Why are we defined by you and in comparison to you? Humanity certainly has contributed much to the rebellion, but it did so because the Empire had done all it could to suppress and subjugate the species it saw as harmful and aberrant. Humans, being those who learned their trade at the hands of our Imperial Masters, were the only people capable of taking a leadership role in the actual rebellion. The rest of us contributed as we could, and made great contributions, contributions that led to the successful conclusion of the major campaigns in the rebellion. I do not accuse you of being wholly unfeeling, but I think your perspective in this matter is compromised. Thalia smoothed the fur on the top of his head. I believe the matter of Bacta distribution is one that should be decided by those of us whose people are prey to the virus. Akbar rose from his chair and slapped a hand against the tabletop. In that case, Counselor Failure, you will also be required to recuse yourself from any decisions in this matter. What? There is no known case of any Bothan being afflicted with the disease. I have no doubt Iceheart wanted you Bothans to survive so you could help split the Alliance. 
So all his fans and Shistavanans have been infected, leaving open the very real possibility that Wookiees could find themselves susceptible to the virus. Quarren have died from it, leaving the Mon Calamari population vulnerable. I have heard of no Elam who have become ill, but Twi'lek, Gamorian, and Trandoshan populations have, so the possibility of the disease jumping to the Elam is not out of the question. The Bothan's fur rose on head and shoulders, but Akbar ignored the signs of Failure's anger. Moreover, from a public health standpoint, your plan of therapy centers is more of a risk than it is a help. The facilities you suggest would call for vast numbers of people congregating in an environment where contact with infectious fluids is not difficult to imagine. And, even if there were studies to show Bacta mist did kill the virus, using it carelessly promotes the chance of a Bacta-resistant strain of the virus being passed among people who believe they are being protected from it. If such a strain does appear, we will be powerless to stop the plague from destroying the galaxy. The Bothan kept his voice low. What, pray do tell, would you suggest, then? First and foremost, we secure the water supply. We have evidence to suggest the virus was introduced into the planetary water supply. And for all we know, there are pockets of virus frozen in the glaciers, just waiting to be melted before they become virulent again. Second, we continue the intensive therapy to control and cure those populations we know are infected. It is important to note here, I think, that human medtechs have been tireless in caring for victims of the virus. Their immunity to the disease certainly means they have less to fear than others, but that immunity in no way makes it incumbent upon them to help out the way they have. Akbar held a hand up. Third and final, we need to deal with the black market. The rumors of a supply of Bacta arriving on Coruscant have depressed the prices, but estimates of how much we got from Zinj are grossly high. When the truth comes out, prices will begin to rise, and selling off portions of the supply will become very attractive. If we don't have our supply depleted through profiteering, we stand a good chance of buying enough time to obtain more Bacta from Thyphera and solving our problem once and for all. If not, we will find ourselves bankrupt and dying of the virus. The Bothan opened his hands. So you think we should just continue to proceed in the manner in which we have gone about things so far? No, by no means. Akbar looked around the room and then up at the misting system. We argue here whether back to mist therapy has any value, yet we have a system installed here to protect us. All of us, including the humans, no affluent members of our populations have purchased Bacta on the black market to use in their own preventative therapy. And, I have no doubt, people have come to you since the news of our victory has leaked out, asking you to procure Bacta for them. While I know none of us would agree to such a thing, the perception that we might, and that there is special treatment for some selected folks going on, is one that will heighten the panic our people are feeling. Cian Teb sniffed. This virus is more than panic, Akbar. It is real and deadly. Agreed. But our actions make it deadlier still. If one person believes there is no hope for himself, that there will be no cure when he needs it, he might not seek treatment. A day's delay not only can cost him his life, but can infect his family and friends. The fact is that if we project the image that says the virus can and will be defeated, everyone will do what they can to defeat it. Leia smiled. It's the same morale-building technique that kept us going during the dark days after Dara Four and Hoth. The black-furred Wookiee counselor's bark flowed into a murmur and Leia's gold protocol droid translated. Ambassador Carathrar suggests treating the virus as an enemy against which everyone is enlisted. 
With discipline and direction, the spread can be minimalized. Akbar nodded at the Wookiee. An apt analogy. Borsk Failure's eyes narrowed. A military model might well be sufficient to deal with the virus. But do you suggest we use it to curtail black market trading? Having stormtroopers breaking into private homes to deprive people of Bacta supplies will hardly endear us to our people. Mon Mothma shook her head. No such thing is advocated. General Kraken is devoting a certain amount of his energy to this problem and is working to put the new Republic security force together. The NRSF will replace the old Imperial Sector Ranger Force and is meant to be a law enforcement and counterinsurgency force. It will be some time before the force will be ready to administer all that needs to be dealt with here. But we have an offer for dealing with our law enforcement needs in the interim. Mon Mothma used her comlink. Please send Voru in. Akbar saw the hackles go up on failure and felt his own flesh crawl. The doors to the chamber opened, and through them walked a small human with a thick head of white hair. From his size, which was not that big, even for a human, he could have easily been dismissed as benign. Yet a warrior's instinct told Akbar that was just an image Voru sought to project. He'd met the man once before, when Fleury Voru, then an imperial moth, had been a guest of Tarkin. The two men were physical opposites, but so alike in temperament and spirit that Akbar had wished they would turn on each other and destroy one another. That didn't happen, though circumstances soon conspired to get Voru sentenced to Kessel, where he had remained until he had been freed and returned to Coruscant as part of the rebel operation to take the planet. Voru looked up, and Akbar read pure cunning in his dark eyes. I thank you for seeing me, esteemed counselors. I thank you for my freedom. I find myself in a position to repay the debt I owe you. Leia's head came up. You don't consider your part in the liberation of Coruscant to have cancelled that debt? If the truth be told, Princess Leia, I do not. Voru stiffened formally, then bowed his head. The liberation of the planet would have been accomplished more smoothly and efficiently if not for the treacherous behavior of one of my lieutenants. While I did not know Zekathine was working for Imperial Intelligence Agents, I must accept responsibility for his actions. In effect, the liberation proceeded without my help so my debt to you remains. A pained expression passed over his face. You brought me here in the hope that I could revive Black Sun and turn it into a force that would aid the effort to take Coruscant from the Empire. I did what I could, but the fact is that the Imperial effort to expunge the remnants of Shizor's organization were as ruthlessly efficient as only Darth Vader's vengeance could be. What little of the leadership remained was destroyed in internecine battling. When I arrived here, there was a paucity of leadership and an insufficient amount of time to once again establish control over the various factions present on Coruscant. Durga the Hutt and others resist unification. So Black Sun is effectively dead. Akbar sat back in his chair. I would have expected more regret in your voice at that pronouncement. Boru shrugged. Black Sun was Shizor's dream, not mine. Thalia folded his arms across his chest and remained standing. And your dream is? Freedom. The same as your dream. Boru smiled. The Empire treated criminals the same way it treated you rebels. With the Empire's grip broken, you rebels have become the New Republic, 
and have gained legitimacy. The criminals who have long been repressed by the empire are not all evil, but many have been trapped in a cycle of lawlessness precisely because they knew they could expect no mercy from the empire. While they were not rebels, they were no less victims of imperial repression. To bring things to the point quickly, we no longer wish to be treated as criminals. We want a chance to gain legitimacy and lead normal lives. For this, we realize we need to offer you something of value, and so we shall. We know the ways of the black market. We know how to disrupt it and break it. We know the ways of criminals and how to disrupt their activities. We know the underworld of Coruscant, and we know how to bring to justice those you want to punish. Doman Barris stared at Voru. You want us to make you the commissioner of the Coruscant Constabulary? I do not think you that foolish, Doman Barris. I knew your father and mother, and I know you cannot be easily deceived. A smile came readily to Voru's face. A smile Akbar did not trust. What I want is for my people to be allowed to administer the law in the underworld here. Your security force will have more than enough to do with the areas of Coruscant where you can project power. We already have various off-world populations forming their own militias and civil defense corps, so why not tolerate a similar force created out of my people? Mon Mothma arched an eyebrow at Voru. Very few others have as colorful a history as you do, Fleury Voru. But some of those who have equally notorious backgrounds are continuing in service to the government, though the leadership and philosophy have changed. Akbar slowly nodded. The realities of governing a vast panoply of worlds necessitated using the imperial governmental apparatus to maintain communication and order. While a wholesale replacement of the bureaucracy would have been ideal, the fact was that just as the rebel military had relied on people with imperial training, so the government was being forced to rely on clerks and administrators who had faithfully served the empire until it fell. While most of these people had an allegiance to their jobs and not to the government, the tacit clemency granted to them in return for continuing to work did not sit well with many of the rebels. Fleury Voru presented an interesting case. He had directly contributed to the winning of Coruscant. While he underplayed his contribution, Voru could easily have turned Rogue Squadron over to the Imperials, preventing the rebel conquest of the planet. His support, despite the betrayal of subordinates, had facilitated the rebel victory, making him a valuable ally. And his request of us is an ally's request for trust. Akbar half closed his eyes. Voru's request also made sense from a purely pragmatic position. While Kraken's law enforcement organization would soon be functioning fully, it would never have been as effective in the underworld as Voru would be. The Palpatine counterinsurgency front, black marketeering, and a dozen other problems needed attention on Coruscant, and yet Kraken still needed to attend to intelligence matters involving Warlord Zinj and Isan Isard, wherever she was. Voru opened his hands. The question I place before you is this. Will you grant me and my people the trust we have earned? Leia's eyes hardened. The Empire was a common enemy we had between us. Hence, our alliance. In acting against them, you have earned trust. But I suspect you see the account more fully than we do. This is true, Leia, but Voru's point is well taken. Mon Mothma pressed her hands gently against the tabletop. The fight against the Empire is truly 
what bound the alliance together. We must build on that basic level of trust if we expect the Republic to thrive. As long as Fleury Voru's people are willing to abide by the conduct standards we set for our law enforcement and militia forces, they will remain within the bounds of our trust. If they step outside those guidelines, they will be outside their lawful duty and will be dealt with in a suitable manner. You will find me a most able and loyal servant in this matter, Mon Mothma. So I trust, Fleury Voru. So we must all trust, Akbar murmured. Something dark flashed through Voru's eyes as he turned toward the Mon Calamari. I would have thought you above veiled threats, Admiral Akbar. I am above them. Akbar's mouth dropped open in a Mon Calamari grin. I merely meant that we must take your word concerning your loyalty because your previous masters are all dead, and the greatest of them through our efforts. If you choose to read a threat in that set of facts, I cannot stop you from doing so. But if I get out of hand, you will destroy me? You have earned trust. Akbar leaned forward and gave Boru a wall-eyed stare. Spend it unwisely, and I will do what I must to settle your account. Twelve. All the while in the back of the grav cab, Wedge tried to puzzle out what Mirax had found in the Pulsar skate that could threaten the Alliance. With anyone else, Wedge would have made an allowance for hyperbole, but Mirax had never been prone to melodrama. In fact, she tends to see issues and emergencies rather clearly. Wedge shivered. Once before, the Ashern rebels of Thyfera had inserted a virus into Bacta shipments that induced an allergy to Bacta in those who were treated with it. This, in effect, left them without treatment for a whole host of ills. If Mirax possessed evidence that the batch of Bacta stolen from Zinj had been similarly contaminated, not only would it doom millions of people to die from the Krytos virus, but the withdrawal of the Bacta from the health services system on Coruscant would spark riots that would kill many more people. That would surely rip the Alliance apart. Non-humans would say that the Bacta was being hoarded for use by humans in case the Krytos virus jumped species and began to kill them. Humans would also be blamed if non-humans were hurt or killed by the contaminated Bacta, and any attempt to blame the contamination on the Ashern rebels would be decried as false and part of a human conspiracy, since it was well known that the Zoltan and Zukfra combines were run by humans. Let it be anything else but bad Bacta. Wedge had the droid flying the cab, led him off three blocks and two levels from the hangar where Mirax kept the pulsar skate. While he wanted to get there as quickly as possible, the urgency in her voice kindled a desire for caution in him. He'd learned a lot from Mirax's father, Booster Tarek, about the need for caution, especially at those times when events seemed to be moving too fast to allow any delay. Wedge regretted the lack of a sidearm, but he did have a comlink and took a moment to preset it to the squadron's emergency frequency. He forced himself to slow down as he wandered toward the hangar. He stopped to look at the holographic displays set in shop windows, or to read the latest news as it sped past on the omnipresent news scrolls. With each stop, he looked around and tried to spot anyone paying over much attention to his presence. He saw no signs he was being followed, but took the added precaution of wandering into a tap calf, going out through the lower level, then coming back up and heading to the hangar. At the door, Wedge announced himself. The computer got a good voice print match, then opened the door. Wedge stepped through into the security lock area. 
After the door closed behind him, another door in front of him opened up and allowed him into the hangar itself. A smile slowly spread across his face as he looked at the Pulsar skate. The modified Baudo class yacht had the overall shape of a broad bladed dagger. The twin engines at the aft formed an abbreviated hilt. The broadest parts of the blade curved down to form gentle wings that swept up to a rounded prow. The ship very much did resemble the Corellian deep sea skate for which it was named. It had sailed through a lot of parsecs between the time its hull was first welded and its current presence on Coruscant. He quickly crossed the darkened hangar floor and made his way up the loading ramp. At the top of the gangway, he nodded to Liet Saev. The Sullistan returned the nod without comment and raised the muzzle of his blaster carbine enough so Wedge could pass unmenaced. The normally voluble Sullistan's grim silence gave Wedge a measure of how serious Mirax thought the situation was and filled him with a sense of dread. He made his way past the galley and crew lounge to the hold. The hatch stood open, and through it, he could see Mirax sitting on a duraplast crate. She looked well, though she still wore her brown hair in a long braid that she doubled up and fastened at the back of her head. She'd started wearing her hair that way since Corrin's death, and Wedge remembered her having done the same thing when her father had first been sent away to Kessel. That's Mirax being serious and remote, walling her feelings off so she doesn't have to deal with the pain. A single red light provided all the illumination for the hold, yet it did little more than illuminate a two-meter-wide globe within which Mirax sat. Everything else remained in shadow, yet from the way Mirax looked out into the darkness, Wedge could tell something alive lurked there. A cold chill shot down his spine, and all manner of irrational thoughts exploded in his brain. He paused in the hatchway and stared out into the blackness, trying to see what captivated Mirax's attention. He thought he saw red light glint off a rounded black dome, which he translated into Darth Vader's helmet. No, he's dead. It can't be him again. Wedge smiled at Mirax. I'm here. How are you doing? I'm holding it together, Wedge, really. Her tone matched the hopeful nature of her words, giving Wedge reason to feel slightly relieved. Thanks for getting here so fast. I don't know who else could help me with this, but it turns out you were their choice anyway. Mirax gestured off into the darkest part of the hold. Wedge Antilles, this is Clarn Herf, a Vradex native of Thyfera and a proud member of the Ashen Circle. The honor is ours, Commander Antilles. The voice from the shadows came deep and deliberate. Wedge heard his name pronounced with respectful precision. The hard sounds, the C in Wedge's title, and the T in his name, were slightly abbreviated, as if snapped instead of spoken. Ural Krig, the squadron's gand, produced similar sounds when he spoke though even bringing to mind the image of the exoskeleton pilot did not fully prepare Wedge for his first sight of the Vratix. Clarn moved from the shadows and into the circle of light, slowly and benignly. The insectoid creature's head featured two bulging compound eyes, and Wedge realized it was light reflected from one of these that his imagination had transformed into Vader's headgear. The Vratix's bent antennae dangled over its triangular face, and its curved mandibles remained pressed one against the other. The Vratix's stalk-like neck broadened into a cylindrical thorax and abdomen. The first of three pairs of limbs which hung from the point where the neck joined the thorax, consisted of two trifold arms that ended in three 
long, delicate fingers and a thicker thumb, and sprouted stout hook claws from the middle arm segment. The second and third sets of limbs were legs, yet they were mismatched. The middle legs connected with the body below what would have been the ribs on a human. Longer and far more powerfully built than the other pair of legs, their configuration led Wedge to imagine the Vratix capable of great leaps and savage kicks in combat. The last pair of limbs were certainly more than vestigial, serving as they did to keep the Vratix's abdomen from dragging on the ground. But they reminded Wedge of little more than the landing gear on an X-Wing. Useful to have when you need them, but built to be tucked away when work had to be done. The Vratik's body appeared to have a uniformly gray color to it, but Wedge put that down to the lack of light in the hold. The claws on its forearms were black, but with lighter flecks, which led Wedge to believe the black color was cosmetically applied, not something native to the creature itself. I'm pleased to meet you, Claren Herf. Wedge smiled and extended a hand toward the Vratix. Claren's hand came in toward Wedge's, then moved past it and came up. The Vratix brushed its fingers over Wedge's face. The creature's flesh, which Wedge expected to be cold and hard like armor, was dry and warm, while he could feel the solidity of the exoskeleton beneath it. The scaly texture of the skin covering the Vratix somehow made the creature seem less alien to Wedge. Mirax reached out and brushed a hand over the flesh of Claren's right foreknee. The Vratix find both sound and vision to be deceptive senses. As Claren reports it, both sight and sound are things that are of the past the moment you perceive them. Only touch reports information that is concurrent with the gathering. Interesting perspective. Wedge shifted his hand around to grip the Vratix's arm above the curved spikes. Clarn, you are the Ashern agent who tipped us to the presence of the Bacta that Zinge had captured? We are responsible for that occurrence. Clarn tilted his head to the right and then the left. We would have preferred to transfer the Bacta directly to you, but this was not possible. Our affluence is not such that we could present our gift in the manner we wished. Wedge frowned. I am not certain I understand what you are saying. Mirax scooted over on the crate. Sit down, Wedge. This gets complicated. Wedge sat beside her. Am I going to like this? Parts of it, sure. Mirax smiled weakly at him. At least, I think you will. Clarn spread his forelegs slightly to bring his face down to their level. You know of our world. Some. Thyfair is a world in the Polith system. Quite temperate in nature and an excellent world for agriculture. Thyfair is where Bacta is produced and distributed by Zoltan and Zakfra, the two corporations that have a monopoly on the Bacta trade. The corporations are decidedly feudal in nature, with humans de facto governing a world where the Vratics are the majority. The Vratix's head bobbed on the end of its neck. Good. Not as much as she who is Mirax knows, but good. Please, tell me what I do not know. We have insufficient time for that, we think. Claren's head craned back as a sibilant hiss issued from its mouth. Wedge looked at Mirax. Sarcasm? A laugh? I think so. Forgive us. But so many times we find humans say things they do not mean. Ah, then tell me what you believe I need to know. Much better. The Vratix settled a hand on Wedge's knee. The healing properties of Bacta were discovered during the days of the Old Republic. 
It was apparent to all that Bacta was a miracle cure for many ailments and infirmities. The corporations, which now control Thyphera and Bacta, made narrow profits, but made them on a wider range of sales. They set up many satellite manufacturing centers, all under license, all with Ratix Verichin overseeing the final processes, no matter where they took place. The thought then was to beat competition by producing better Bacta for less than anyone else could. You mean there was once competition for the Bacta market? For more time than there has not been, but all of it before you were born. The Clone Wars made one thing abundantly clear. A supply of Bacta could heal even the most grievously wounded soldiers and render them receptive to mechanical replacement limbs. This meant they could return to combat, saving the military the cost of training new warriors. As a pilot, you know how much expense goes into training, so the saving is clear. And I know many a pilot, myself included, who owes his life to back to therapy. So it is. Claren nodded solemnly. The Emperor decided that the only group that should have a guaranteed supply of Bacta was his military. He systematically suppressed small manufacturers of Bacta in favor of Zoltan and Zukfra. They realized greater profits by letting the marketplace set the price and utilized Imperial soldiers to wipe out independent growers and to round up all the Verichin to return them to Thyphera. Wedge frowned. Twice now you have used the word Verichin. We are Verichin. Claren tapped his free hand against his thorax. Bacta is an organic product made through the blending of a laji with cavum. Cavum is itself a compound made of other ingredients. Alaji, because it is grown, comes in various potencies depending upon location, soil content, rainfall, and even spontaneous mutation. Verichin oversee the proper combination of these components into the Bacta. Each lot has a minimum potency but sometimes the Bacta will be most potent and work extremely well. Such is the batch we have presented to you as our gift. Gift? Wedge placed his hand atop Clarence's hand. Please do not think me dense, but there are some things you say as if you expect me to already understand them. Forgive us. We have been foolish. That's partially my fault, Wedge. Mirax added her hand to the pile on Wedge's knee. The Vratics are not exactly a hive mind, but there does appear to be surface thought exchange among Vratics who spend a lot of time in close proximity to one another. The reason Verichin is plural is that while Clarn here might be the supervisor in charge of a batch process, Clarn will have subordinates who act almost as remotes reporting back and receiving orders on a subsensory level of some sort. Claren may have been under the impression you and I similarly shared thoughts. So you know what he's talking about? I think so. And actually, Claren is not a he, per se. The Vratics can both father and bear young, depending upon stages in their life cycle, which I guess is rather long. She inclined her head toward the Vratics. When it speaks of the Clone Wars, it's speaking from life experience. Huh? Wedge smiled. So, will you clear up this gift thing for me? Sure, if you don't mind, Claren. We are grateful for your aid. Mirax drew in a deep breath. The Vratics have made you a gift of the Bacta and all that entails. Why me? Claren's antennae twitched. 
Your fame has made you known to us. You are known as a fair and wise man who values loyalty. This we value as well. Wedge's eyes narrowed. I appreciate that, but I still don't understand. What's in this for the Ratix? The Ratix inclined its head toward Mirax. This you must explain, for you will do it better than we will. Mirax nodded, then took another deep breath. The Vratix are giving this Bacta to you because they want you, Wedge Antilles, to represent them before the Provisional Council. They want to join the New Republic. What? Wedge's surprise at being asked to represent the Vratix immediately faded beneath a sense of disaster. Thyphera was the sole supplier of Bacta, but the world had steadfastly remained neutral in the Civil War. Everyone believed that this was so they could gouge both the Empire and the Alliance, thus enriching themselves while the war raged. To keep Thyphera happy, the Alliance had even inducted two of its human residents, one from a Zoltan family and the other from a Zakfra family into Rogue Squadron. Broer Jace, the pilot representing the Zoltan Corporation, had been killed fighting against the Empire. Arisi Dlaret, the other Thyferan, still flew with the squadron and viewed the Ashern as murdering terrorist monsters. And there's the problem. If the New Republic granted the Ashern any sort of status, the Thyferan government would react harshly and swiftly. Any hope of getting Bacta from the cartel, no matter how successful Arisi's backdoor efforts in that regard might be, would die quickly and horribly. If the Bacta supply dried up, the Krytos virus would ravage Coruscant and, quite likely, spread to other worlds and kill billions of individuals. If I refuse the request, then what? Wedge looked up at Clarn. The Bacta you made available to us. There's nothing wrong with it, is there? We're not in a situation where you have to mix something else in for it to be effective, such that if I refuse your request, the Bacta will be useless or harmful, are we? Clarence's mandibles clicked open and shut again. There was once a case where Verichin fouled a batch of Bacta. The reasons for that action were sound. The results of that action were unacceptable. The Vratix ask for your help, but cannot do so at the expense of your people. The Bacta, it is a gift to you. So is this Verichin. What? We have come here to Coruscant because we know you cannot jeopardize your people by taking up our cause. As Verichin, we have ways and means to mix up more than just Bacta, or to make Bacta more effective. We are here to learn of this Krytos virus and to stop it. But this virus could kill you. Clarence shrugged. Great risk is necessary to defeat great evil. You know this. Wedge slowly smiled. That I do. Your offer impresses me, but I cannot act alone in this. I have people to whom I must speak. Mirax raised an eyebrow. Not the council, right? No, not the council. Not right off. I only really have one choice. General Kraken. If word of Clarence's presence gets out, or Arissi catches wind of the Vratex working with us, Thyphera will hear about it quickly and will be stuck. Kraken can provide security and whatever resources Claren will need to do the job. Mirax smiled. And it might distract him from persecuting Tycho? It might do that indeed. The Vratex hissed sharply. It is a beneficent balm that soothes more than one wound. Agreed. Wedge stood and clapped the Vratex on both shoulders. I'm glad you're here, Clarin Herf, because there's plenty of wounds to be found. 
and decidedly little soothing going on. If you can do anything, anything more than you've already done to stop the Krytos virus, I'll gladly represent you before the council and, if need be, even take your case to Thyphera itself. 13. A jolt ran through Nawara Ben and traveled out to the tips of his leku, making them twitch. He immediately blushed, blowing the shadows on his gray cheeks and beneath his eyes. If I do not have more control than this, Tycho is lost. He pulled his brain tails back, so they dangled beneath the level of the defense table. No reason to let the opposition read involuntary motion as a sign of my nervousness. His nervousness would not be denied, however. The trial was being held, staged, was the term he preferred to use, in the old Imperial Justice Court. High vaulted ceilings had been covered with polished black marble panels, streaked with white, giving the whole room the feeling of actually being on a high promontory and open to the night sky. The black marble had also been used to build up the high bench at which the tribunal would sit, rather ominously. It reminded Nawara of the Imperial Palace's towering edifice. Below the ceiling level, stainless steel, molded ferrocrete, and duraplast castings completed the court's design. While the forms meshed perfectly with the stone shapes, the rest of the room seemed artificial and not a little sterile. This room does not seem conducive to compassion. Nuara looked around at the upper gallery and the seats in the court which were packed with individuals slavering for justice. Justice, in this case, means they want my client shot into the sun. Admiral Akbar had acquiesced to Nawara's request that the trial not be sent out in real-time holo. While it could have been argued that news of the trial had already done as much damage to Tycho's reputation as it would be possible to do, Broadcasting the trial could easily serve to further inflame public sentiment and cause trouble. Nawara had already been questioned about defending a human, and that sort of thing would only get worse if everyone in the galaxy was able to watch the trial unfold. The discussion about broadcasting the trial had been the subject of an executive session of the Provisional Council. Borsk failure had tried to argue that justice conducted in the shadows was just a continuation of imperial policy. Nawara had countered that a publicly broadcast trial abandoned any pretense of justice and became a sporting event where a man's life hung in the balance. He argued that how the Republic conducted the trial was as important as the outcome because any perception of injustice, no matter how slight, would get magnified and form the core for discontent and dissent. And they agreed with Akbar to keep things limited to news summaries. It's not much, but it's something. He shook his head. Now, if I blow it, at least folks won't know it until later. Across from him, Commander Hala Etik rose from her place at the prosecution table. Athletically trim and tall, Etik cut a very commanding figure with just a hint of lean menace to her. She wore her black hair gathered back into a thick braid, somewhat reminiscent of Princess Leia's current hairstyle, providing Nawara an unobstructed view of her strong-jawed profile. Fire filled her brown eyes as she glanced at him, then turned her attention toward the tribunal. If it please the court, we will call our first witness. Akbar nodded. Please, Commander. The prosecution calls Lieutenant Pash Kraken to the stand. Nuara hit a couple of keys on his data pad, calling up the deposition Pash had given him earlier. He let his eyes track over the Rylothian script, but did so only to cover his surprise at Etik's choice of lead witness. He had fully expected her to start with Ayala Wasiri or General Kraken to establish a connection between Tycho and Imperial intelligence. Instead, 
By calling Pash first, she appeared to want to firmly set up Tycho's having the motive, means, and opportunity for killing Corin. Then work backward into the larger treason picture. I should have seen that coming. Since the great public hue and cry about the case had pushed the treason angle, that was the vector he'd expected Etic to take in presenting her case. He'd thought she'd establish the treason, then show that Corrin's murder was necessitated to cover the treason. By coming at it the other way around and establishing the murder, she got treason by implication and all the evidence she presented after that just went to bolster a fact she had previously proved. This pitches our defense into the bright lands, muttered Nawara. Tycho leaned over toward him as Pash stepped into the witness box and was sworn in. What do you mean? There is ample circumstantial evidence to show you killed Corrin. Mtray could convince a jury of droid haters that you certainly could have killed Corin. I could baffle a jury by pointing out how many others could have done the job, but the tribunal is going to be tough. Nuara narrowed his pink eyes. I had hoped we'd have to fight over treason first, since it's a weaker charge. But we'll have to deal with this first. Tycho gave Nuara a confident smile. You'll get me out of this. I will. Edic moved out from behind the prosecution table with the supple ease of a Taupari stalking prey. Lieutenant Kraken, your service record has already been appended to the transcripts of this trial, so I will not ask for a recitation of your numerous citations and awards won in service to the Alliance. I would, however, like you to think back to the events that led up to the night when Coruscant fell to our forces. Can you do that? Yes. Pash nodded and a lock of red hair curled down over his forehead. Good. Edic gave him a polite smile. Where were you at that time? Here on Coruscant. And you were present on Coruscant as part of an assignment given to Rogue Squadron? Yes. Did that assignment include orders that posted Captain Selchu to Coruscant? Pash shook his head. I only know my orders for the assignment, Commander. My orders contained nothing that referred to Captain Selchu. So, at the time you left your base to travel to Coruscant, you expected Captain Selchu to be where? Objection. Nawara stood. The question is irrelevant, and the prosecution has provided no foundation to show the witness could answer it. Admiral Akbar nodded slowly, sustained on the relevance grounds. Lieutenant Kraken's expectations are immaterial, Commander Eddick. Yes, Admiral. And you, Counselor Venn, need not stack objections. We'll take them as they come in, shall we? Nawara nodded. I appreciate the court's admonition, and I shall remember it. He returned to his seat and forced himself to breathe slowly. You aren't going to win this case with the first witness. Be careful, but not so eager. Lieutenant Kraken, there came a point during the operation here on Coruscant in which the squadron's personnel were drawn together, correct? Yes. And Captain Selchu was not among those people, correct? He was not there, no. But there was news of him, was there not? Pash leaned back in the witness chair. Yes. One report was that an attack by Warlord Zinj on the base at Noquivzor had hit Rogue Squadron staff hard and that Tycho Selchu was among the missing. Yes. Who delivered that report? Commander Antilles. After hearing that report, you believed what about Captain Selchu? Pash glanced down at his hands. I thought he was dead. He was listed as missing in action. But you learn that really means dead. And we don't have enough pieces left to fill a thimble, so we can't prove it. I expected we'd get confirmation of his death fairly quickly. Etic gathered her hands at the small of her back. 
There was another story told about Captain Selchu, yes? Yes. Who told that story? Lieutenant Horn. What did Lieutenant Horn say about Captain Selchu? Objection, hearsay. Exception, Admiral. The statement Lieutenant Kraken will relate was told against Lieutenant Horn's best interest. What? Nuara Venn's jaw dropped open. How is what Corin said about the defendant going to be against Corin's best interest? Eddick smiled. Lieutenant Horn prided himself on his observational skills, and when he related the story of what he had seen, he made it into a self-depreciating tale. Given his position of authority in the squadron, this was against his best interest. Admiral, this is a gross misuse of the hearsay exception. You won't be able to keep the story out. Commander Antilles filed it as part of a report concerning the operation here on Coruscant. Noir's lip curled back in a snarl and gave Eddick a view of his sharpened teeth. If you want to bring that story in, by all means, lay the proper foundation and call your witnesses in order. You may indeed succeed in bringing this stuff in, but I'm going to make you work for it. Admiral Akbar leaned over and consulted with General Maydean for a moment, then straightened up and nodded. The objection is overruled. Nuara felt his leku twitch. Admiral, this leaves me grounds for an appeal. It may indeed, Counselor Venn, but the ruling stands. Akbar pointed toward the witness. Lieutenant Kraken, you will tell the court what Corn Horn said, as best you can remember. Pash nodded as a frown gathered on his face. Corn said he'd seen Tycho on Coruscant on the same day Warlord Zinge hit no Quivzor. And what did he say Captain Selchu had been doing when he saw him? Talking with someone in a cantina. Who was he speaking with? Objection. The question calls for a conclusion based on facts not in evidence. Please, Commander, rephrase your question. Yes, Admiral. Eddick glanced back at Nawara for a moment, then looked over at Pash. Whom did Lieutenant Horn say he saw in conversation with Captain Selchu? He said it was Curtin Lure, but that's quite enough, Lieutenant. Thank you. But Admiral Akbar looked down from the bench at Pash. I'm certain Counselor Venn will allow you to finish your answer under cross-examination. Yes, sir. Now, Lieutenant, I want you to recall when it was that you saw Captain Selchu after the report of his death. Three weeks ago. He showed up and saved us from Stormies trying to kill us. Did his presence cause you to reevaluate Lieutenant Horn's story? No, I don't think so. No? Eddick's expression sharpened. You had been told Captain Selchu was dead. Then you saw him again. You learned he had, in fact, been on Coruscant at the time Horn said he'd seen him. Did that not give you cause to wonder about what Horn had seen? Things were very busy at the time. Desperate. I was given orders. I didn't think about things I didn't have to think about. Not even a bit? Not even when your orders included taking precautions to keep a traitor in your midst from getting information out to Imperial sources? That was normal for a covert op. But you had to wonder if there wasn't really a traitor in your midst, correct? No. No? Eddick's head came up. You're a friend of Captain Selchu's, aren't you? Pash hesitated. I'm in his squadron. I know him. I know what he's done. He's saved my life. And you think you owe him something? I said he saved my life. And you don't want to be testifying here against him, do you? No. The response came emphatic and strong. And, in fact, I had to compel your testimony with a subpoena, didn't I? Yes. The prosecutor looked up at the tribunal. I'd like permission to treat this witness as hostile. Nuara winced. Not good. 
Why not? Tycho asked in a whisper. In direct testimony, the questions are supposed to be open and non-leading. On cross-examination, you get to lead the witness toward the answers you want. Nawara scratched at his throat. A witness who is forced to answer questions always leaves the impression he's covering something up, so it makes even innocent things seem condemning. Pash is trying to do my job for me, but he's just making it tougher. Akbar waved a hand toward Eddick. Permission is granted to treat Lieutenant Kraken as hostile. Thank you, Admiral. Eddick smiled. Now, you're a smart man, Lieutenant Kraken. You attended the Imperial Military Academy under a false identity your father created for you, correct? Yes. And the operation that took you to Coruscant involved your arriving under a false identity, correct? Yes. So you have some understanding of what it takes to operate covertly in a hostile environment, just as any spy would, correct? Yes. It would be natural for a smart man like you to use what you had learned to try to check and see if you could detect any signs of a spy in your midst, correct? It would seem that way. It really was that way, wasn't it, Lieutenant? Hala Eddick opened her hands. You certainly found yourself evaluating people and trying to decide how much you could trust them, yes? Pasha's frown deepened. Yes. And Captain Selchu figured high on your list of suspect individuals, didn't he? On a scale of one to infinity, he ranked about a five. But that was higher than anyone else there correct? You're making it sound wrong. I move for the answer to be stricken as non-responsive. So ordered. Akbar again looked down at Pash. Just answer the questions, Lieutenant. The ranking you gave Captain Selchu was higher than anyone else's ranking, wasn't it, Lieutenant? Pash nodded reluctantly. Yes. Thank you. Now, on the night... Two weeks ago, you were preparing to fly a mission that would aid in our conquest of Coruscant. Yes. What was that mission? Five of us were going to fly cover for the rest of the squadron as they tried to bring the planetary shields down. To do that, you needed fighters, correct? Yes. And you had them? Yes. Where did they come from? Pash took in a deep breath and exhaled slowly. Captain Selchu had purchased them during his time here on Coruscant. And he had even flown a mission here, correct? Yes, the mission where he saved us. Eddick turned back to the prosecution table and studied the data pad. Ayala with Siri came around to face her. That night you witnessed a conversation between Captain Selchu and Corin Horn, did you not? I did. I wasn't a party to the conversation, though. But you did overhear it? Eddick turned and spitted the witness with a forthright stare. The pilot hung his head. Yes. Did you hear Captain Selchu tell Lieutenant Horn that he had checked over the fighter Horn would be using? Yes. And did you hear Lieutenant Horn threaten to work to expose Captain Selchu's treason once he returned from the mission? Yes. Fatigue dragged at the red-haired man's reply. The prosecutor smiled. And what was Captain Selchu's response to that threat? He said he had nothing to fear from Korn's investigation. As if he knew there would be no investigation? Noara stood quickly. Objection. It calls for speculation and is inflammatory. Sustained. Eddick turned and nodded to Nawara. Your witness. Nawara hesitated for a second. The evidence Hala Eddick had laid out so far came as no surprise and was circumstantial. All she had gotten from Pash was that he had seen Tycho and Korn exchange some harsh words. That would go to motive. 
and some of the comments did cover opportunity to fix Corrin's fighter. But without the headhunter, there was no evidence of tampering. All he could accomplish on cross-examination would be to ask Pash to recount Tycho's explanation for the meeting where Corrin saw him talking to Curtin Lure. Tycho had explained he'd been speaking to a Duros traitor, Lai Nutka, not Curtin Lure. Nawara knew Edic would object to Pash's repetition of Tycho's explanation on hearsay grounds. Without being able to call Lai Nutka or putting Tycho on the stand, there was no way to get at that whole subject. Unless I called Curtin Lure and he denied ever meeting Tycho, he put the chances of that happening at something just under the chances of the Emperor showing up and granting the rebels one and all an imperial pardon. Counselor Ben? Nuwara looked up at Admiral Akbar. Sorry, sir. I have no questions of this witness at this time. The Twi'lek resumed his seat. Very well. Next witness, Commander Eddick. Eddick stood once again. The state calls... Arisi Dlerit to the stand. 14. Corin Horn felt as clumsy as the Trandoshan dragging him through the interrogation center's corridor. The injection an MD droid had given him back in his isolation cell had already begun to take hold. He had it in his mind that at least part of the concoction used was skirtopinol, and that was not good. The one time he'd been under its influence, back during an exercise at the Corellian Security Force Academy, he confessed to all sorts of minor transgressions from his childhood. That would have been merely comical. But one of his father's cronies was overseeing the interrogation seminar and supplied his father with the text of his confession. I don't think Iceheart will. When he started... He'd had a full thought there, but the very image of Isan Isard that sprang into his mind killed things. Corin knew enough to know the drugs were working the way they were supposed to. He started to moan from fear and frustration, which earned him a backhanded cuff from his guard. The blow and the dry rot scent of the Trandoshan combined with his fear to bring memories rushing full-blown and terrible back into his mind. He saw little holographic images hovering in the air before him. Three figures, two men and a female Quarren, sat at a table in the darkened corner of a tap calf. The two men, one of them his father, were deep in conversation. His father showed his agitation in the way he poked a finger at the smaller man and the color rising in his face. Into the picture walked a Trandoshan bounty hunter wearing a bulky dust cloak thrown over his shoulders. The lizard man strode past the table and on up toward Corin until his green, scaly face eclipsed sight of Corin's father. The Trandoshan, Bosk, stepped back slapping a power pack into the blaster carbine he'd produced from beneath the cloak. He spun slowly and sprayed red blaster bolts back and forth over the trio at the table. The Quarren all but exploded into a black mist. Corin's father caught two shots high in the chest, slamming him against the back of the booth. As he slid from sight, the little man to whom he had been speaking tried to dive for cover. Unfortunately for him, the Trandoshan's fire blasted the table into flaming splinters and half-melted metal and still hit him. The little man took three bolts in the torso and a fourth that blew the back of his head off. Corin saw himself in the scene. He saw no transition, no arrival. He was just there, kneeling in the blood, surrounded by burning bits of table. He held his father's body in his arms. He wiped the core and ichor from his father's face with a borrowed rag, all the while willing his father to open his eyes and announce he would be fine. 
the two blackened holes in his father's chest stared up at him. At first, they reminded him of a viper's fang marks. Then they blinked. One became an icy blue, and the other a volcanic red. The world blurred for a moment. Then all the colors flowed together and became solid white, as they did when he was in hyperspace. Then he reverted and found himself standing before Isan Isard in a predominantly white room. She frowned. It fascinates me how all of our interrogation sessions with you end up coming back to your father's death. There are countless psychiatric advocates who would find your preoccupation with your father's death to be grand justification for adherence to disciplines as useless as Jedi training. I do not. Corin blinked his eyes. He couldn't recall going from the corridor to the interrogation chamber, nor being bound to the man form that held him upright. The straps at his shoulders and across his chest, waist, wrists, and ankles all pinched and chafed in such a way that he knew he'd been in restraints for quite some time. He couldn't remember anything but seeing his father die again. Yet his throat felt raw enough that he knew he had to have been speaking or shouting or screaming. Isard turned, presenting him her profile, and nodded to unseen minions beyond a mirrored wall. What I have learned so far is a great deal of gossip that might be suitable for embarrassing the Corellian diktat, but that sort of information is hardly in short supply. You have not ensconced yourself highly enough in the councils of the rebellion to be of use to me. At least, I do not believe you have. It is entirely possible you have managed to resist interrogation in certain areas. Corin shook his head. You got the wrong guy. Then I will just have to make you into the right guy, won't I? Her eyes narrowed with irritation as she faced him again. Had Gilbastra not sent you to the outlier worlds, you would have become part and parcel of the rebellion. You would have found yourself in General Kraken's confidence, and I would have found you very useful in that regard. Then again, it is possible that he set you in Rogue Squadron so you could watch Tycho Selchu and uncover his ties to me. No. No? Kraken must have done that. You were his agent, yes? Corin shook his head adamantly. No, I wasn't a spy for Kraken. Were I inclined to believe anything, I might be inclined to believe you in this case. Unfortunately, I need proof. She stepped aside as the Trandoshan wheeled in a device that bristled with probes and danced with the colorful illumination of an ever-changing light array. The probes had been fitted on a concave surface that could easily close over him and the rack to which he was bound. Corin caught the stink of ozone as the Trandoshan brought the device closer. He didn't like the fact that he heard a click down at his feet when the lizard man finally nudged the device into place. Isard smiled in a manner that made Korn want to shrivel up and die. This is a variant on a design Darth Vader created to torture, among others, Han Solo at Bespin. As you know, humans have a number of different types of neural receptors. This device is designed to stimulate three of them. The original only worked on the pain receptors. I have found that adding stimulation for the heat and cold receptors is most effective in getting what I want out of those I interrogate. Corin wanted to snap off some quip, but fatigue and anxiety prevented him from mustering the required concentration. So now we begin, Lieutenant Horn. Just tell me what I want to know and I won't have to ask the court to let me treat you like a hostile witness. 
Ayala Wasiri almost felt sorry for Arisi Dlarit as Hala Etik tried to coax cooperation out of her. In going over the depositions before the trial opened, Ayala and Hala had agreed that members of Rogue Squadron would be hostile and resistant to anything that made them speak against Tycho Selchu. Hala had decided, therefore, to bring them up first and get them out of the way before she brought in the investigators and other witnesses who could attest to Tycho's involvement with the Empire. Hala had pointed out that Nawara Ven would probably end up calling all the rogues back to the stand, but by the time he did that, their positive affirmations about Tycho would sound hollow and unsupported to the tribunal. Flight Officer Dlarit, how did you come to be on Coruscant two weeks ago? Arisi brought her chin up, and her blue eyes flashed defiantly. Cornhorn and I were inserted into Coruscant under the guise of being a Kwati Telbun and his mistress. For the entire journey to Coruscant and the subsequent week, we were together almost constantly. We were good friends and talked a great deal. Hala Eric nodded. So you were confidants? We shared confidences, yes. The black-haired woman smiled politely. It is difficult to keep secrets when you are living in such close proximity with someone. And Corin Horn felt free to discuss things with you? Objection. Relevance. Ayala glanced over at Nawara Ven. The twitching of his brain tails betrayed some nervousness. But the Twi'lek was objecting at all the places Hala had predicted he would. She said he had talent. She didn't think he could win the case, and his decision not to cross-examine Kraken wasn't what Hala had anticipated. Hala looked up at Admiral Akbar. This is foundational, Admiral. She was living with Corn Horn for a considerable portion of the last part of his life. I would suggest this would qualify her to give opinions on his demeanor. Overruled. Arisi frowned briefly. We discussed many things rather openly and frankly. How would you characterize the conditions under which you spent time with Lieutenant Horn? The Thyferan pilot shrugged. I saw him in combat, during which he was calm and a leader, a hero. I saw him in regular circumstances as well. He could be funny and compassionate and, well, attractive. I saw him in all different ways and situations. On the night Coruscant fell, how would you characterize him? Anxious and agitated. And what was the source of his irritation? Arisi chewed her lower lip for a moment. Corin said, Objection. Nawara then stood. This is hearsay. Hala Etik took a step forward. I would ask for an excited outburst exception, Your Honor. She has already testified that Horn was anxious and agitated. The Twi'lek stepped up beside Hala. My learned colleague certainly understands that being agitated and saying something in no way makes it subject to the excited outburst exception. Sustained. Nawara smiled slightly as he returned to his bench. But Hala's expression just darkened. Very well. Flight Officer Dlarit, did you speak with Lieutenant Horn before you took off on the mission that evening? Yes. You stated he seemed anxious and agitated. Did you find his state of mind unusual? Objection. Counsel is leading the witness. Rephrase the question, Commander. Flight Officer Dlarit, how did Lieutenant Horn's state of mind strike you at the time? Arisi tugged at a wisp of hair behind her left ear. Anxiety, I could understand. We were all anxious to get going and to see if the mission would succeed or not. And his agitation? That wasn't like Corin. Had you seen or heard anything that, in your mind, explained his agitation? The witness hesitated. I saw Corin speaking with Captain Selchu. I couldn't hear what they were saying, but I saw them speaking together. Then Corin came over and spoke with me. And you concluded? Something in their conversation had to set Corin off. 
Ayala glanced down at the data pad on the prosecution table. Hala had gotten out of Arisi all she expected the witness to admit. Testimony showing Corin to be out of sorts as a result of his conversation with Captain Selchu. When they had deposed Arisi, they had learned the nature of her conversation with Corin. While Hala would have loved to get that testimony in, hearsay prevented it. The excited outburst exception wasn't something she had expected to succeed. Hala smiled at Noara. Your witness, the Twi'lek stood. Light Officer Dlaret, how long was it between the time you reported speaking to Corin and the previous time you had spoken to him? An hour. Now, you just testified that you saw Corin speak with Captain Selchu. Did you see Lieutenant Horn speak with anyone else before speaking with Captain Selchu? No. Noir's head came up as if her answer surprised him. You didn't see Lieutenant Horn speak with Mirax Tarek? Erisi shrugged her shoulders. I suppose I did. I saw them standing near each other and saw her run off. But I don't recall any conversation. But you do concede that they may have spoken to each other? Yes. So, as nearly as you know, Lieutenant Horn might have had multiple conversations that could have set him off. I suppose so. Erisi blinked a couple of times. That could be it. The Twi'lek bowed his head. Thank you, flight officer. That's all I have for you. Corin felt like a block of burning ice caught in a lightning storm. His flesh felt on fire, while his bones seemed chilled to absolute zero. Every pain receptor in his body strobed on and off on a near constant basis. The pain would start at his feet and move up in a wave, or descend on him like a rain shower, or pummel him with randomly delivered jolts. He would have welcomed death, but for the horror of spending eternity with the memory of such pain so fresh. He heard a hiss, and the rack retracted from what he had taken to calling the inducer. Corin hung limp from the restraining straps and welcomed the constant, unrelenting, unshifting pain the straps caused as they sank into his flesh. Sweat poured down over his face and stung fiercely where he managed to bite through his lower lip. But even that sensation was a relief from what he had just been through. Isan Isard entered the interrogation chamber and waved the Trandoshan out. I would find you fascinating if you knew more, Horn. She glanced at the mirrored panel on the wall. Your tolerance for pain is remarkable. Corin would have shrugged, but every ounce of energy in his body had been exhausted in screaming answers to the questions fired at him during the session. He couldn't remember what he had said. He recalled that in those few moments of lucidity, which he could touch between pulses of agony, he had tried to focus on the cold or heat. Locking into those sensations had seemed to dull the pain somehow. Now, in the absence of pain, he doubted that observation was correct. But it had been a sanctuary into which he had retreated, and that was a very small victory. She posted her fists on her hips. You present a problem for me. You don't know enough to be useful, and your position within the rebellion is so low that you are hardly vital. If I return you to them, they will likely treat you much as they are treating Selchu now. You won't have even the freedom he had before his arrest. This does not incline me to send you back. On the other hand, you would be perfect to mold into my own avenger. Your resistance to pain will make your rehabilitation into a right-thinking imperial time-consuming, but not impossible. Your core discomfort with the unlawful nature of the rebellion is a foundation on which I can build you anew into the tool I need. 
I can form an Avenger squadron around you that will go after and destroy Rogue Squadron. Using a rogue to destroy rogues? That would be delicious. Corrin summoned strength from reserves he didn't know he had, and smiled. You won't live long enough to see me turn on my friends. Good. Anger directed at me. Excellent. She politely applauded him. Hate me all you want. I'll turn your hatred for me into hatred for those who haven't saved you from me. You won't be the first broken that way, and you'll not be the last. I won't break. Ah, but you will. They all do. She nodded solemnly as the rack hissed and slowly lowered him toward the inducer. And when you break, I will put you back together again. And in gratitude, you will do all I ask. Without question, or regard for loyalties you once held dear. 15. It was probably in a place like this that Rogue Squadron plotted the conquest of Imperial Center. Curtin Lure ducked his head beneath a series of moist, moldy pipes and followed his guide deeper into the rusted-out bowels of Imperial Center. Lure had been driven deeper into the planet-wide city than he thought possible, then had gone several kilometers farther through a hot, wet labyrinth that had him imagining he'd passed through the core of the world and was now working his way up and out the other side. The special intelligence operative, leading him through the maze, cut to the left and through an oval opening, hacked through the wall of the access tunnel. The opening seemed, at first glance, as if it was chopped through the wall, but when Lure grabbed its edges as he climbed through the hole, the striations he felt made him wonder if it hadn't been nibbled out of ferrocrete. Unless I can find a way to use it, I don't want to know what chewed this hole. The low, wide area into which Lure stepped stank of rust, stagnant water, and mildew. The few standing puddles had an oily slick on them that phosphoresced slightly. The weak light supplemented the temporary floodlights the operatives had arranged to display their motley collection of airspeeders. All in all, the tableau was unremarkable and unlikely to attract attention from anyone save a truly desperate airspeeder thief. And wouldn't he be surprised at what he got? The dented and dinged airspeeders, which were of a variety of years and makes, had been carefully worked over by the operatives and transformed into a half dozen flying bombs. The hollow spaces in the chassis had been filled with explosives. Designed to be flown by remote from a companion airspeeder, they would be driven like proton torpedoes into the various Bacta storage facilities around the world. An operative came walking over to Lure, unable to keep a smirk from his square face. As you can see, we are prepared to go at any time. We have completed our initial electronic sweep of the target sites, and have found them negative for counter-remote tactics or equipment. Very good. The Empire had long ago perfected precautionary measures to take against bombs that might be set to detonate by remote. The easiest of these was to broadcast strong signals on a variety of comlink frequencies of the sort used by rebel terrorists to detonate such bombs causing a premature detonation while the bombs were still in the attacker's keeping. Broadcasting from patrolling airspeeders in hostile areas had even detonated explosives in bomb factories that intelligence had suspected existed, but had not been able to pinpoint for a more surgical strike. The harm done to innocents in the area when the bombs went off had been seen as just punishment for the failure of the people to report the rebels working in their area. Although they had been unable to detect similar counter-remote tactics in the Bacta storage areas, 
Lure's people had decided against detonating the bombs by remote. Getting an airspeeder into position and leaving it there long enough for the setup team to get away provided a window for discovery and deactivation. Even though that window would be small, it was felt to be too risky. They intended to hit a number of sites in rapid succession, and if the rebel forces discovered one bomb and sent out a warning, it would make hitting the others far more difficult. Moreover, the fact that they could not detect anti-remote equipment in their reconnaissance sweeps could have been explained by nothing more sinister than someone forgetting to turn the devices on that day. The plan they had hit on was actually fairly simple. Commercial speeder ferry vehicles were not an uncommon sight on Imperial Center, hauling broken air and land speeders to repair shops. Using a tractor beam and a simple remote slave hookup, repair techs regularly flew speeders throughout the city. Using a speeder ferry to haul a vehicle to the right area, then having someone fly it by remote into the building was seen as a clean way to deliver the bombs. Since the remote slave hookup was in common use by these sorts of vehicles, it couldn't be jammed without causing dozens of legitimate disasters. So Lure knew their delivery method was safe from interference. Contact detonators had been rigged in the various panels and bumpers on each vehicle. The explosives would be triggered when the detonators were compressed with the force of an airspeeder slamming into a building. While a head-on collision with another airspeeder at significant velocity could cause the bomb to go off, the chances of that happening were relatively small. Regardless, the amount of explosives packed into the vehicles meant that any explosion in the general vicinity of the target would do substantial damage and, if not destroy the store of Bacta, at least make its distribution difficult. The operative looked up at Lure expectantly. When will we be given the signal to go? Lure looked at his wrist chronometer. Rumor has it that Mon Mothma is going to announce the particulars of the Bacta distribution plan approved by the Provisional Council in 14 hours or so. I'm debating whether we should use these vehicles to punctuate her speech or let public anticipation build for a day or so before striking. Lure kept his tone light, as if the decision to be made was of little consequence. He preferred going off sooner rather than waiting but he was fairly certain that Isan Isard would want him to wait. So far, he had gotten no word back from her on this plan, or on any of my plans. This meant the decision was truly up to him, but he knew it didn't have to be made until an hour or two before the assault would take place. The intelligence agent frowned. Contact me on a secure frequency, three hours before the scheduled start of Mon Mothma's speech. Assume the operation will go off during her speech. When you call me, I will either cancel the assault and reschedule, or let you go. If you do not reach me, you are on. Very good, sir. The operative waved a hand toward the airspeeders. If you care to inspect our handiwork, Lure shook his head. You have ever been efficient before, Captain. I see no reason to doubt your preparedness now. Thank you. Of course. Lure smiled slowly. And, speaking of efficiency, your people dealt with Nartlo, yes? As you ordered, sir. Excellent. Yes, sir. I'll have someone conduct you back now, sir. The operative waved another of his plainly clothed men over, and Lure followed that operative out through another exit from the underground bunker. Lure found this route less odious, and the use of a series of turbo lifts meant it took less time to get back into more hospitable regions of the city. After taking leave of the operative, Lure worked his way up and through the city. He constantly checked his surroundings and back trail for sign of pursuit, but found none. 
The prospect of destroying the rebels' back to supply pleased him, but not for the reasons most rebels would ascribe to him. He took no delight in the fact that destruction of the Bacta would cause the deaths of millions, even billions. As odd as it seemed, even to him, their lives meant nothing. Since he did not know them, they were numbers, and Curtin Lohr had never been one to be terribly emotional about numbers. Destroying the Bacta would be a victory in the war he was waging against the rebellion. He and his people were outnumbered, outgunned, and under-resourced. But they were winning. So far they had struck when and where they wished. Just the fact that they were able to assemble an armada of bombs on Imperial Center without detection was a triumph in their battle against General Kraken and his forces. Oddly enough, Lure realized that he was playing a game to sudden death and it was more likely to be his death than that of his foes. Still, he now understood the secret thrill that kept the rebels going. They had been the insects, repeatedly stinging the bumbling giant that was the Empire. Yes, the giant had swatted them and, in some cases, had hurt them badly, but it could never kill all of them. The defiance they showed the Empire now burned in his veins. And while it did not make him think he was immortal or unstoppable, it did drive him with a desire to do more and more to torment his enemy. He also knew that his efforts would not reestablish the Empire. That was not the goal Isan Isard had in mind, when she set him up on Imperial Center as the leader of a pro-Palpatine movement. What he was doing would weaken the rebellion and allow other forces to tear it apart. Whether those other forces included a warlord like Zinj blasting his way into Imperial Center and taking it over, or the product of some other scheme Iceheart was undoubtedly planning, did not matter. Isard wanted to destroy the rebellion, and that was the goal he intended to help her reach. He smiled. He had been given a great responsibility, and his success would create a power vacuum at the heart of the Empire. Isard maintained her goal was not the resurrection of the Empire, but the destruction of the rebellion. Still, it seemed obvious to him that the recreation of the Empire was a natural consequence of eliminating the Rebellion. When the Rebellion collapsed, if he did things well, he would be in position to help restore the Empire. While he knew better than to make himself a direct rival to Iceheart, he also knew she wouldn't live forever. Nor will I. But if I live longer than she does, the Emperor's throne might well be open to me. Lure smiled and sniffed proudly, but the scent of the city's lower reaches tarnished his fantasy. He glanced down at his feet and saw a glistening fungoid residue that seemed to shift colors as he watched it. Immediately desirous of returning to his eerie and washing away the stink of Imperial Center's darker reaches, he fished a comlink out of his pocket and called for one of his guards to meet him with his airspeeder. Lure did his best to scrape the goo off his shoes against the side of a building, but it clung tenaciously. He chuckled to himself, thinking of it as true rebel scum. He made no headway in his battle with it, and wondered if a lightsaber would be able to damage it. He concluded it would not, by the time his airspeeder slid up to the curb and the rear gull's wing door swung up. Lure started into the passenger compartment, then caught himself. Inside, nestled in the corner, a smallish, white-haired man pointed a blaster pistol at him. Sorry, wrong speeder, my mistake. 
No mistake. Get in, the man sighed. Get in or my other people will shove you in. Given no choice, Lure entered the vehicle and folded himself into one of the jump seats. The door closed behind him, leaving the two of them alone in the speeder's darkened interior. Lure raised his hands and clutched the safety straps. Is there any purpose in my putting these on, Moff Voru? Fleury Voru nodded his head graciously. Very good, Agent Lure. Yes, by all means, strap yourself in. I do not anticipate this being a rough ride, but things can get turbulent here on Imperial Center. So I have noticed. I'm certain you have. Voru set the blaster pistol on the seat beside him, then tugged at the gray cuffs on his midnight blue jacket. And I'm no longer a moth, merely a colonel in the Imperial Center People's Militia. Not a uniform. I'm sure it will show you off at your best when you hold a news conference and announce my capture. Lure tried to force a smile on his face, but it hardly seemed worth the effort. Quite the coup for you. Indeed, it could be. Voru yawned in an exaggerated fashion. The question remains as to whether or not that is necessary. Excuse me? You present me with a problem, Agent Lure. Your Palpatine counterinsurgency front is one of the reasons my militia was created. As long as you are a threat, the Provisional Council needs me. Without you... All we can do is go after petty black marketeers and other criminals. All of whom you currently control anyway. You overestimate my abilities. Lure raised an eyebrow. Do I? You found me quickly enough. Voru shrugged. More by happenstance than anything else. I was in the process of consolidating my hold on the black market in Bacta and had Nartlow under observation since he had a source I could not isolate. My people had your people under observation when they visited him last night. We continued watching and were led to this vehicle. Your people are good at disguising themselves. By the way, the blonde hair and goatee really do distance your appearance from that of Tarkin. Changing the appearance of a vehicle is not as simple. The little man smiled. I had no idea who we had found until we checked the records on this vehicle. The registration is utterly benign and ordinary, with no sign of slicing on the data file at all. That indicated to me that the registration had made it into the computers through legitimate means, and that meant imperial intelligence. Since you had turned Zekka Thine against me, I had made it my business to learn about you. Then, surprise, surprise, here you are. I hope I don't disappoint you. It's possible, but we'll see. Boru frowned. Normally, I'd not have picked you up so early, but Nartlow indicated that he'd given you the locations of the Republic's Bacta repositories. I immediately became suspicious. He maintained you were just a Bacta dealer but those containment centers just ache to be hit by the PCF. I tried to determine if Nartlow was lying to me, but you had anticipated I'd do that. Lur smiled. You used skirtopinol on him. Yes, and the convulsions were rather hideous. Convulsions? Hmm... We gave him a supply of lotyramine and told him it would prevent him from getting the Krytos virus. I included strict dosing instructions. If he went into convulsions, he must have taken four times the recommended amount. Some people assume that if one pill is good, more is better. He died. Cerebral hemorrhage. He was useful, which is why we didn't just kill him outright. The lotyramine would have made interrogation difficult for the rebels, and some of the information he had about my operation would have had them herring off in all sorts of wrong directions. Voru nodded. 
though he claimed no knowledge of a planned assault on the Bacta stores. That is what you are planning, yes? Lur looked around the passenger compartment. I would have thought General Kraken would resort to more professional methods of interrogation. He would, and will, if you do not choose to cooperate with me. Voru crossed his legs and plucked at the crease in his slacks. If I don't get answers from you, I will tell Kraken I have uncovered a plot to assault the current centers. He'll put precautions into place that will prevent your success while moving the Bacta to new locations. You will lose, and I will win. And you have a plan that will result in some other outcome? Voru smiled. You will now be working for me. You will hit targets I give you, and you will hit them when I want them hit. I am not unsympathetic to your war against the Rebellion. I just wish to kill yet one more Minoc with a single laser blast. Of course. It should have been obvious. Lure nodded. You would do what Prince Shizor could not. Shizor relied too much on his personal abilities and not enough on the ability to read others. Having made Black Sun over into the people's militia, you'll be in position to assume power if the rebellion falters. But I have no desire to see the rebellion fail. I just want to see the rebellion's leadership fail. Manipulate the Bothans and appease them, Frustrate the Alderanians until they alienate the other humans with their constant reminders of how their world was martyred for the rebellion. Let the black market bankrupt the Republic so someone who has monetary reserves can come in and bail things out, that being you. Of course. Boru nodded. Isan Isard may have injected the Krytos virus into Imperial Center but the rebels injected a more deadly virus into Imperial Center before that. Me. They saw me as someone who could be a break on the predations of the underworld here, but they forgot the Emperor himself had seen me as a rival for power once upon a time. What they forgot, I never have. Now the Emperor is dead, and I am here on his world. The question for you, Agent Lure, is this. How do you want to destroy the Rebellion? Do you want to blast it apart, or distract it until it, too, sickens and dies? What you will find growing up in its place, I can assure you, will be to your liking. The intelligence agent pressed his lips together in a thin line. My refusal to go along will mean my death, so my choice is obvious. And, as with Isan Isard, Fleary Voru will not live forever. Lur nodded slowly. What do you want? I want you to hit only one of the six repositories at this time, the one just south of the Senate District. My people have already managed to steal most of that supply anyway, so your attack will cover our tracks and leave us to profit from the spike in black market pricing. I will give you other targets as we go along to further my aims. Consider it done. Tonight, during Mon Mothma's speech, Voru's face blossomed in a broad smile. Ah, you have a taste for irony. Splendid. I think our alliance will be most profitable for the both of us. I anticipate doing business with you, Agent Lure, will be an ongoing pleasure. 16. Ayala Wasiri smiled at Dirik as she settled into the witness chair. Dirik was in the court for the first time and actually looked excited by the crush of people. The bailiffs had let him sit right behind the prosecution table because that put him in close proximity to where she sat when she wasn't on the stand. The ashen hue of Dirick's flesh betrayed his fatigue, but the trial had piqued his interest. 
if not for the fire that put into his brown eyes. She would have remained adamantly against his attending the trial. She felt the trial had to be on the Palpatine counterinsurgency front's list of targets, and she didn't want Dirich exposed to their violence. The sheer savagery of their strike at a Bacta containment facility the previous night had left her shaken and, secretly, pleased to have Dirich where she could see him. Hala Eddick stood. Ayala Wasiri, could you please tell the court about your personal employment history over the last eight years? I joined the Karelian Security Force just about a standard year before the Emperor dissolved the Senate. I worked there for six years, moving up into the Smuggling Interdiction Division, where I partnered for two years with Corin Horn. Approximately two years ago, Corin, Gilbastra, my husband, Dirich, and I all fled Corellia before our division's Imperial Liaison Officer, Curtin Lure, could trump up charges and arrest us. From Corellia, Dirich and I came to Coruscant and remained in hiding for a year. We had enough money that we didn't need jobs, so I did nothing during that first year here. Subsequent to my husband's disappearance, about a year ago, I joined the Alliance organization here on Coruscant and aided Rogue Squadron in bringing the shields down. Since then, for the past two weeks, I've been assigned to your office as chief investigator on this case. The prosecutor nodded. So, you worked with Corin Horn for two years. I partnered with him for two years. Describe what you mean by partnering. Ayala shrugged slightly. It's akin to being married to someone in that you have to trust them completely. Your life is in your partner's hands in dangerous situations. The only way you can build up that level of trust is by getting to know one another. The job means you're together a great deal. In any given week, you could easily see more of your partner than you do your own family. Some partners get to know each other so well that they almost get this gotal sense of being able to read each other's moods and react in situations without a word being spoken. Describe for us, please, your relationship with Corin Horn. We were close, very close. About six months after I started working with him, Corin's father was murdered. That event crushed Corin, and I helped him through it. He'd been an only child, and his mother had died previously, so he felt alone. The fact that Curtin Lure freed his father's murderer had Corn burning for vengeance, but Lure's imperial ties meant Corn couldn't do anything, and that frustrated him. Gil and I worked at calming him down, and he came around. The point is that when you help someone through such a difficult time, you get to see his heart and get to know him very well. Hala Eddick glanced at her data pad. How well did you know Curtin Lure? He became our Imperial Liaison about a year before I was partnered up with Korn. I found him to be aloof and distant. We didn't socialize. He made no effort to get to know the rest of us after work and didn't socialize during office celebrations. He seemed to delight in frustrating investigations. In the three years I worked in the same office with him, I got to know him well enough to avoid him as much as possible. Did you become good at avoiding him? Yes. He's fairly easy to spot, especially because of his height. And if he became too obnoxious, I could always retreat to the female officer's refresher station and he'd not follow me. You mentioned his height. How would you characterize his appearance overall? Rather distinctive. Ayala brushed her light brown hair away from the side of her neck. He prided himself on looking like a younger, taller Grand Moff Tarkin. And he wasn't far wrong in that. He definitely stood out in the crowd. Would you say Corin Horn knew Curtin Lure as well as you did? Objection. Counsel is leading the witness. Sustained. Rephrase the question, Commander. Yes, Admiral. How well could you say Corin Horn knew Curtin Lure? Objection. That calls for speculation. I'll allow it. Overruled. 
Admiral Akbar nodded toward Ayala. You may answer the question. I'd say Korn knew Lure as well as I did. Korn seemed to know where Lure would be before Lure did. And he programmed Whistler to give him a sign if Lure was around and he'd not noticed yet. Thank you. Again, Etic checked her data pad. Please describe for us the kinds of materials you have reviewed during your investigation. Ayala started ticking things off on her fingers. I have interviewed witnesses. I have listened to comlink recordings and read transcripts of same. I have looked at physical evidence and reviewed reports prepared by forensics concerning same. And I've reviewed the file evidence available. What sorts of things are in that file evidence? Reports by Commander Antilles, Lieutenant Horn, and Captain Selchu about their time here on Coruscant. Holla hit two buttons on her data pad. I've now downloaded into the court's evidentiary computer a report by Lieutenant Corn Horn that I would like entered into evidence as People's Exhibit 34. You have reviewed this report? I have. What does it say concerning Curtin Lure? Ayala looked straight at Holla Etic. In it, Lieutenant Horn reports that he saw Captain Selchu in conversation with Curtin Lure at a cantina called the Headquarters. Based on your experience as Corn's partner, how would you characterize the nature of this report? Typical Corn, concise, to the point, and unequivocal in his statement of facts. And based on your experience, how would you characterize Corn's identification of Curtin Lure? He was absolutely certain he'd seen Captain Selchu talking with Lure. Eddick smiled. So there was nothing in the report, nothing in your experience that would lead you to question Lieutenant Horn's identification of Curtin Lure? Ayala hesitated. Actually, there is one little detail about which I do have a question. Surprise flashed across Holla's face, but she smothered it quickly. Move to strike is non-responsive, Your Honor. The Mon Calamari's barbels twitched beneath an open mouth. No, Commander. You asked one more question than you should have, and now you have to live with the consequences. Do you have anything else for this witness? At this time, no, sir, but I reserve the right to recall her. Understood. Your witness, Counselor Ben. Ayala straightened up in the witness box and tried to calm herself, but she felt her guts begin to knot up as the twilight stood. Her heart started pounding a bit faster. She'd never liked being cross-examined, and she expected no mercy from Nawara then, especially after Hala made her mistake. Agent Wasiri, in your time with the Corellian Security Force, have you ever performed an investigation into a matter of treason? No, but I have worked murder cases before. I know. You've worked many murder cases, haven't you? Yes. And some have been easier to investigate than this one, haven't they? Ayala nodded. Yes. Though Nawara Ven kept his voice low and his demeanor easy, she didn't like the way he started nibbling in around the edges. He was projecting an aura of calm control, running the trial, and she knew that was bad. Once he got into a rhythm and she started moving along with him, he could turn and surprise her and get admissions out of her that would give the wrong impression to the tribunal. How long would you say the average murder investigation you worked lasted? You'd have to be more specific. How long before an arrest? Ayala shrugged. Less than a week. If you don't have a suspect in custody by that time, the trail can get very cold. The investigation itself, though, might go on longer than that, correct? Sure. Because there are details to check. Lab reports to read and analyze, witnesses to depose, more facts to be checked and the like, correct? Yes. The Twi'lek smiled. That takes a long time to do, doesn't it? That depends. Say you want to do it right. 
I always want to do it right. Of course. But haste can make for sloppy work, can't it? Yes. So a hasty investigation is potentially a sloppy one? Yes. Noir then nodded. So would you characterize two weeks from murder to trial as fast in your experience? Ayala nodded reluctantly. It's faster than most trials. Have you ever been involved in a case that went to trial as quickly as this? She shook her head. No. The twilight looked back at the data pad on his table. Ayala saw lights flicker across the front panel on Whistler. Then Nawara nodded and looped a brain tail back over his shoulder. I want to call your attention to People's 34. How long after the incident described was the report made? Ayala glanced at the small data pad monitor in the corner of the witness box. There was a two-week gap between the incident and the filing of the report. Now, in your experience as Corin Horn's partner, would you say he was usually prompt in filing his reports? Yes. Ayala glared at Whistler. But sometimes there were delays, and the two weeks you mentioned were fairly busy. Is that the only reason, being busy, that you believe Lieutenant Horn delayed filing his report? Objection. Calls for speculation. Counselor Venn is asking the witness what she believes, not what she thinks the victim thought. I'll allow it. Overruled. Because we believed Captain Selchu was dead on Noquivzor, there seemed no way the report could be true so there would have been no reason to file it. Ayala leaned forward in her seat. However, the minute Corin learned Captain Selchu was alive, he made that report. I understand that. The twilight flashed her a smile full of pointy teeth. In your time as his partner, had you ever known Corin Horn to make a mistake? He was only human. Ven's expression darkened. Perhaps you can expand on that answer for those of us who are not human. Ayala blushed and glanced down at the floor. What a thing to say, especially here and now. I mean, yes, he did make mistakes. Thank you. Now, you alluded to something in the report that left a question in your mind about the veracity of Lieutenant Horn's identification of Curtin Lure. What was that? Her stomach folded in on itself. Korn describes Lure as wearing a hooded cloak and following Captain Selchu out the back of the cantina as Korin entered it. Korin recognized Lure from his height and his gait, but he never actually saw his face. And as good as Korin was, you think that his making an identification without seeing the individual's face leaves room for him to be mistaken? Yes. The twilight nodded. Thank you for your candor. Nothing further. Akbar looked at the prosecutor. Redirect? No, Admiral. The Mon Calamari nodded down at Ayala. You are excused, Agent Wasiri. I am going to recess this court at this time. The Provisional Council is meeting to discuss a number of problems, and I must be there. I may, in fact, recess the trial for a week. I assume... From the question you asked earlier, Counselor Venn, you would not mind having the extra time for investigation of the case? Ayala, returning to her place at the prosecution bench, watched Nawara's gray profile as he nodded. I welcome the time to continue to prepare my defense. Commander Eddick, you have no objections to a delay? No, sir. Very good. Court stands adjourned for one week. Ayala entered Hala Eddick's office. Derek's in the outer office, lying down. I hope you don't mind. The crush of people leaving the court was a bit much, but the bailiffs didn't seem to want to let him catch his breath. In fact, they weren't too interested in letting me bring him along with me here to the office. The black-haired prosecutor shook her head. Not a problem, but get him a special visitor's identification badge. Ayala frowned as she slipped into a nerf hide chair in front of Hala's transparasteel desk. What's going on? Hala set a comlink down on her desk. 
I just heard from Admiral Akbar's aide, Commander Sirlul. The reason for the abrupt adjournment was more than a routine meeting of the Provisional Council. It appears in the wake of the PCF assault on that Bacta storage site, we've had a bomb threat here. They aren't sure who made the threat or how real it is, but they want a week to reinforce the courthouse complex. I see. Holland nodded solemnly. Just as well. It gives me a week to shore up my case. Ayala winced. I'm sorry for what I said in there. I don't want to have Corrin's killer get off, but not your fault. Admiral Akbar was right. I asked one more question than I should have. I tried to make sure there was no question that Corrin had been right, and I was too smart for my own good. She shrugged. At least nothing got said about the Duros that Captain Selchu says he was meeting with that night. Right now the tribunal just knows that Korn might have been mistaken about his identification. If the Duros is brought in, they'll be free to wonder how much curtain lure in a cloak looks like a Duros in a cloak. Ayala's eyes narrowed. We all knew Selchu claimed he met a Duros that night. So it seems... But all those stories get traced back to Selchu himself, so anyone else bringing it up gets it stricken because of the hearsay rule. The only way that comes in is if Tycho takes the stand. What if the Duros testifies? What's the likelihood of that happening? There's no evidence Lai Nutka ever was on Coruscant, as nearly as we can tell. Moreover, there was some history between Corin and Nutka. Korn got him out of an imperial prison on Garki, wherever that is. Why would Nutka run from the man who saved his life? Ayala opened her hands. Maybe he was just following Tycho. Fine, let's assume that meeting was as innocent as Tycho has tried to make it out to be. It doesn't make the least little bit of difference. The bribe data alone is enough to show he was working for the Empire. Korn believed. Tycho had met with Curtin Lure. His threat to dig into Tycho's background because of that belief is our motive for the murder. But why kill Corin when you can show he's wrong about the meeting just by producing Lainutka? Ayala frowned. Tycho always seemed confident of his innocence, which meant he either had Nutka where he could deliver him, blowing apart the foundation of Corin's threatened investigation, or, or he could be innocent. Hala shook her head. Don't plot a course into that black hole. But that black hole might be the truth. Sure, but we're not the triers of fact in this case. The tribunal members are. We just have to present to them the best case we can muster, and the defense has to knock it apart. Hala's brown eyes narrowed. You're not going to start in on me about wanting to make sure your partner's killer really is caught, because I'll tell you, we've got him beyond reasonable doubt. Ayala shrugged. And if I don't want to be reasonable? Hala winced, then sat back in her white, high-backed chair. Idealists should not be in this business, you know. And your point is? The Duros thing has bothered me, too. I can grant that Tycho might have pulled that name from Korn's file just to annoy him. But that would be very risky for him to do. The trail Tycho has left has shown him to be very careful, so I don't see him throwing out that sort of taunt. Therefore, I can imagine that he really did meet with Lai Nutka. And if that's true, I have to wonder about our inability to find Nutka or any record of his presence here on Coruscant. So, even though you believe Tycho was working for the Empire, you think Nutka's disappearance may be evidence of someone making sure Tycho's perfidy is obvious? Ayala frowned. Who? Why? Good. Obstruction of justice questions to answer. Hala sighed. You want to find Nutka, right? If you don't mind. Hala sat forward and fingered a small black wafer of silicon. Do it. And take this. It's a code chip that will let you bring your airspeeder into the upper level security garage. You can take the turbo lift down to the court from there. It'll save Derek from having to go in and out with the courtroom crowds from now on. Ayala accepted it from her and smiled. 
Things are just going to continue getting crazier, aren't they? I'm afraid so. Hala visibly shivered. I'm very much afraid so. 17. Aided by the Trandoshan's healthy shove, Corin flew through the darkened doorway. Unable to see anything, he curled himself into a ball and hoped he didn't land on his head. He smashed his shins into something hard, then bounced down onto his right shoulder before continuing his roll. He hit more things, most of which cried out, and all of which gave way, then came to an abrupt stop against something very solid. Korn opened his eyes and, in the dim light, made out the smiling, bearded face of a positively huge man. He'd come to rest against the man's shin and thigh. Clearly the man had dropped to one knee to stop Korn's tumble through the room. Back along his flight path, Korn heard the muttered curses of people he'd knocked down. The bearded man stood and dragged Korn to his feet. Quite the entrance. I had help in making it. Korn plucked at the shoulders of his tan canvas tunic and tried to settle it in place. The bulky garment extended all the way to his knees. The sleeves ran to mid-forearm, but that was because the shoulder seam started well below the curve of his deltoids. Naked beneath it, Korn felt a little uncomfortable. He knew that was part of the psychological war waged by Isard on him and the other prisoners. Deny them human clothing, and you deny them a little piece of their humanity. The big man nodded. The Trandoshan doesn't like anyone. I'm Earl or Set. He offered Korn his hand. Set was missing the last two fingers of his right hand, but didn't seem bashful or embarrassed about it. Korn met the man's firm grip with a solid one of his own. Korn Horn. Glad to make your acquaintance. Set pointed off to the left. Come on, I'll take you to the old man. The big man's voice carried with it equal measures of respect and affection, reminding Korn of how he'd often called Gil Bastra, the old man. Must be the nominal leader among the prisoners here. Korn realized that his being thrust into the general Lusankia population could have been another ploy by Isard to get him to reveal information he'd not given up during interrogation. Because he did not have a clear memory of what he had actually said while being chemically debriefed, he didn't know what she might be looking to confirm or uncover. For all I know, this is an elaborate charade. I will have to be on my guard. Erlor led Corin out of the area near the doorway and deeper into the cell complex. It appeared to have been ground and drilled out of solid rock. Thick dust coated the floor and hung in Erlor's wake like ground-covering fog. The irregular rock walls and ceiling had pockets of luminous lichen clinging to them. Their lime-green light gave the dust an eerie glow and grayed out the flesh of those standing about. Korn followed Erlor into a side chamber with an entrance low enough that even he had to duck his head. Beyond the threshold, the big man straightened up and moved aside. On the opposite side of the circular room, barely six meters from the entrance, an older, white-haired and bearded man sat up and hung his legs over the edge of a hammock braided together from darkened strips of tunic canvas. Korn immediately had a vague sense that he'd seen the man before, or a holograph of him, but if so, it was a long time ago and he couldn't place him. Sir, this is Corn Horn. They just delivered him to us. The older man stood and straightened his tunic, then peered closely at Corn. He felt as if under the scrutiny of his first drill instructor at the Corellian Security Force Academy. The effect was not wholly unpleasant in that it reinforced the leadership role into which the old man had been cast. Come here, son. Let me see you close up. Korn closed the gap between them and felt Erlor drop in behind him, ready to prevent him from doing any harm to the old man. I'm with Rogue Squadron, a lieutenant. You have the look of a pilot about you. Size, anyway. You've got a good leader in Antilles. 
Assuming Skywalker's not back in charge there. No, sir, he isn't. Wedge Antilles is still in charge and is a commander now. The older man nodded, then squinted at Corrin's face. You're from Corellia? Yes, sir. Did I know your grandfather? Corrin shrugged. His name is Rostek Horn. He was with Corsac. The old man shook his head and straightened up again. No, I was thinking of someone else. From the Clone Wars. I don't recall Rostek Horn. Though I might have met him once or twice. It's possible. Though the man qualified his statement, Corrin felt he was being polite instead of indecisive. Although his age had given him white hair and wrinkled skin, clearly the man's mental faculties were not suffering from the ravages of age. The old man knew exactly who it was he thought Corrin looked like, and he also knew that he'd never met Corrin's grandfather. That clarity of mind impressed Corrin, as did the mannerly qualification of his firmly voiced denial. The old man extended his hand to Corrin. My name's Jan. His dark eyes flicked up toward Erlor. Despite what he will tell you, there's no rank here. That was for when we were people. Now we're just here. Pleased to meet you, sir. Corrin shook the man's hand and found his grip firm, even though his hands were a bit bony. Jan sat back in the hammock. You say Antilles has finally accepted a promotion? Yes, sir. He always seemed level-headed. Good officer material. And who's commanding the fleet? Corn hesitated. I'm not sure how much of that you want me to discuss, sir. A smile spread across Jan's face. Very good, my boy. If you're in here, it's because Isard has sucked you dry like the spider she is. But caution is good. He glanced down. It's just that some of us have been in here since Yavin, and, well, we wonder about how the war is going. We've had others through here who have told us a lot. We know, for example, that the Emperor is dead, and with him, another Death Star. But we know about the Siruk. But news has been pretty spare in the last year and a half. You're the first military man who's not an imp, who has ended up here for about that long. The few civilians who've been here have been interesting, but their knowledge of how the rebellion is going has been filtered through imp news sources. Erlor landed a heavy hand on Corrin's right shoulder. Imps would have us believe Rogue Squadron is dead and gone, died at a place called Borlaeus. Sure, in some imp's lum dream, Corrin turned, slipping from beneath Urlor's grip, so he could see both men at the same time. Rogue Squadron did get hit hard at Borlaeus, but that was more the product of bad intel going in than it was anything the imps actually did to us. The fact is, though, that inside a month after we got bloodied, we were back and took Borlaeus away from the imps. And from there, we staged for the invasion of Coruscant. His smile grew broad as Pride swelled inside him. Rogue Squadron went into Coruscant and managed to bring the shields down. I don't remember much, but I know our fleet arrived and I was evacuated by Isard as she fled the planet. So I have to figure the New Republic now rules Coruscant. It's ours. It is yours because we gave it to you. Corn looked to his right toward the doorway and saw an obese man squeezing his way through it. The tunic, which was black like the man's thinning hair, could barely contain the man's bulk. Anger filled the man's brown eyes for a second, then melted away as he straightened up and tugged at the hem of his sleeves. You inherited a sick world, a dying world. Jan bowed his head in the heavy man's direction. This is General Ever Derricote, late of Imperial service. He is the ranking Imperial here among us. Korn immediately realized that a secondary reason for the lack of titles among the rebel prisoners was to allow them to further differentiate themselves from the imps in Lusankia. I'm Korin, and I was at Borlaeus. 
Then you saw me smash the little invasion fleet you sent against me. Yeah, I did. And I lost friends at that battle. Corrin balled a fist and arced it toward Derricote's bullet head, but it never landed. Erlor lunged forward, grabbed the collar of Corrin's tunic, and hauled him backward. Corrin's feet left the floor, and the canvas rasped against the flesh of his armpits as the big man held him up. Hey, that hurts. Erlor kept his voice even. There's a rule. If we beat up on imps, the staff here beats up on the old man. What I almost did. Corrin's mouth hung open, as if to let the twisting sensation in his stomach a chance to escape. He nodded once, and Erlor put him back down. Corrin turned to Jan and bowed his head. I won't let it happen again. Spirit is good, Corrin. Very good. Jan coughed lightly into his hand. The general here was the one who told us of rogue squadrons defeated Borlaeus. He left out your apparent return and victory. Derricote sniffed. Had I still been on Borlaeus, there would have been more rebel bloodshed. Not likely. We pinpointed the power generator at the Alderaan Biotics Facility, and severed the conduit that sent the auxiliary power to your shield generators and ion cannons. A handful of ties survived our second raid, and those pilots surrendered when they flew home and found their base in our hands. Corin shrugged. And as for Coruscant, the fact that you used the word inherit to describe what we did, well, it means that the world is ours now. It might be sick, but it's better off in our hands than it ever was in yours. I doubt the dying think that. I doubt the dying blame the rebels for their problems. Derricote shrugged, and a shiver ran through the layer of fat around his middle. It does not matter to me who they blame. When the histories are written, this shall be but a momentary disturbance in the Empire's epic. Jan rocked to his feet. That will be up to the historians to determine, won't it, General? When I get out and put together my memoirs, you will fare well, Jan. Derrico ducked his head and slid his body back out through the doorway. He paused halfway through, and Corin thought for a moment he might have been stuck, but the fat man returned to look at Jan again. Before I forget what I came here for, a batch is ready. Thank you. I'll have Erlor organize a party to help you decant it. Jan nodded at Erlor, and the large man stooped to force Derricote from the doorway, then followed him out. The older man smiled. The general is a recent addition to our population, but he has proved himself useful in that he's good with biotics. He's managed to ferment a relatively mild ale here, providing us with a forbidden pleasure that many of us had forgotten. You trust him and drink it? Jan shrugged. He drinks enough of it that if it were lethal, he'd have long since been dead. Despite being proud of his imperial service, he seems somewhat perplexed by his imprisonment here. He thought he had fulfilled the parameters of a project for Iceheart, but she disagreed, and he's here. Corin nodded. I can understand his confusion. I don't know why I'm here either. It may be temporary. We get a lot of transients who are transferred out in bulk. Traffic into and out of Lusankia seems to be relatively rare. That's not good news. If this place is truly a backwater planet, the chances of our being found by the Alliance are tiny. Jan fingered the knots in the braided canvas cord that gathered his hair into a ponytail. I've been here for, as nearly as I can determine, seven years, and no one has found me yet. His laugh came warm and natural, not tinged with the sort of madness Corn had heard in Derricote's laugh. There's always tomorrow. Right. Corn sighed and looked around at the small chamber. Erlor's acquainted me with one rule. Are there others? We do what we're told when we're told to do it.